The story begins as this kid was killing this Shikigami as told by his elders as he has an unpleasant feeling that he realized that his own family has betrayed him and they lure him out here to kill him. They all uses their spiritual power on him as he thinks they have prepared to such extent to kill him. He asks them their reason for killing him. He tells him it's because he is too strong for them as his ability is a hindrance for the Tsuchimi Kato family. He tells them so you are afraid of him. They all attack him together. His strongest Shikigami was sealed away and his spiritual power is restraints as he is now he can't beat them but he will keep fighting until the very end as he was on the verge of dying. Then he uses his last paper doll and does the forbidden art circle of transmigration which is an art for reincarnation and thinks he will do better in his next life. Then he wakes up on a bed as he sees his blonde hair and gets excited as the reincarnation was a success. The memories of this person in which his body he was reincarnated flows into his head. As in this world there are no spiritual techniques instead there is magic, and his situation in this world doesn't seem to be good for him. His name is Wayne Granato, he is the third son of Granato's family. The admission exams for a magic academy named Arcella Academy are coming up. But his reputation in the family is not great as nobody expects him to pass the exam because Wayne Granato doesn't have any talent in magic, as he understands the situation he is currently in, as Wayne doesn't have any mana, but now he possessed tremendous amount of spiritual power. But in this world no one knows about the spiritual powers, he thinks maybe that's why he got reincarnated as Wayne as he doesn't mana, but now he has so much power, which seems to be too extreme. He was happy being reincarnated with his powers, but also remembers he was betrayed by his family because he was too strong. After that he goes to library to read some books to understand the world he got reincarnated in. After reading few books he realized this is not the world he knew before. The culture, ecosystem are different. There are demons and beats which are dangerous just Ayakashis from his world. Also a lot of people gets attacked by these demons every year. There is not any description for spiritual power and instead there is only magic which is used to fight against the demons. As he expected no one know about his powers in this world, as in his previous life he always protected people by working in dark, cause he didn't want any attention and because of that he was eliminated. But in this life he will show his power to everyone, as he doesn't have any regrets from his previous life, but he will never let that happen again. Then these two guy comes in and started badmouthing him as he will never be able to pass the entry exam for the Magic Academy. Their names are Harold and Dean, these two are Wayne's older brothers who always bully him as their late father left his family estate to Wayne his third son. As his father last words to Wayne was that he wants him to inherit the family as their territory is weak what they need isn't power but wisdom, as Wayne is very smart, but he tells his father even if he succeed in the family nobody will agree to accept him. His father tells him that he need to build his position to convince everyone as his brother are both selfish and doesn't fit to be the lord of this territory. Wayne says he will do everything he can to become the lord. That day his father passed away. In other words to convince his brothers and his family that he is fit to be the head. He has to enter the magic academy of Arcella. Wayne tells him if he able to enter the academy he will have control over the territory. His brothers are surprised to hear this as he tells them again and they started lotting and think this must be a joke. Wayne tells them he is not joking and says let's bet on whether I will pass or fail the admission exam. His brother asks him what he will do if he doesn't pass the exam. Wayne says he will give everything that father left him to them, but if he does pass the exam his brothers will be expelled from the Granada family. His brothers love this idea as Wayne don't have any mana and he will never get accepted by the academy. Wayne tells him everything will be revealed on the day of exam. They tell him they are looking forward to it as they leave the room. Wayne thinks they must be planning something to place that kind of bet. But if anything does happens he will take care of everything using his Onmojutsu. Then he says he should revive his Shinigamis using Onmojutsu. This Jutsu is activated by reciting Mantra which consume its own spiritual power using Paper's Doll as a catalyst. Which is familiar to the magic that today's world. Wayne doesn't have any mana but his body is filled with spiritual power. As he was about to use his Anyo Jutsu on a paper a doll, a voice comes in saying why are you hesitating Master Wayne as he gets surprised and thinks it must Kijin. The voice tells him he is indeed Kijin as has have for Wayne to wake up. Wayne gets excited thinking all of his Shikigamis are also here, which are none other than the Shikigami of the 12 heavenly generals and they are all in great condition. Wayne gets happy as he got reincarnate but still they will serve him. Wayne stand up and uses his jutsu to summon all the of 12 heavenly generals and all 12 of them get summoned safely to his room. 
but most of them vanish as Wayne doesn't have much spiritual power to maintain all twelve of their bodies. Only three of them who remain as they bow to Wayne. First is a girl named Kijin, second is named Suzaku, and lastly third girl named Dayan. As Dayan tells Wayne that he has become a pretty boy, Kijin tells her that it is rude to say that to Master Wayne. Wayne is happy to see them as none of them has changed, then they realize why there is only three of them. They gets excited thinking three must be the chosen ones from the twelve heavenly generals. Then Wayne tells them that he didn't have spiritual power that's why he could only summons them. They ask Wayne about the upcoming admission exams and also Wayne brothers they want to get back at them quickly. Wayne says to them he will soon get them back as he is enrolling in our cell academy to get top score. Everyone gets excited, as Kijin asks Wayne will those two brothers of your will quietly be expelled when you pass the exam, as they don't believe he will pass and sure they will retaliate, but it won't be a problem for Wayne. As soon Wayne enters the academy he wants to get rid of his image being a dropout who can't use magic. Kijin asks Wayne does the opinion of those people matter to him, Wayne tells them that's where things went in his previous life. Back then he didn't the spotlight and did everything from the dark due to which the respect from his family fell to the ground as he moved freely without belonging to anyone despite being the strongest. As a result they betrayed him and killed him. But in this life Wayne wants to be recognized as the strongest by everyone and will have comrades that will not betray or rebel against him. They all thinks it's a great idea, Wayne asks Kijin to take the admission exam too. Wayne thinks having her beside him will help him to get the top spot in school. Diane gets upset as she wants to go to, Wayne tells her as Kijin is wisest on the twelve generals as he give her a pat on her head, Kijin get really happy hearing Wayne praise her. Suzaku tells Kijin that the magic subjects are different than spiritual arts, will she will be able to learn them. As she thinks about it Wayne tells them no problem as Shikagani doesn't sleep, he has prepared books for her to read. They tell Kijin to hang in there as Wayne tells them to go back as he need to keep Kijin summoned here they said ok and Kijin says she will do her best too. The next day Wayne and Kijin starts to travel to Arcella, as Kijin is studying her books in the carriage. Wayne senses a large mana about three kilometer from their carriage, and thinks that it must be demon. Kijin says should she go and take care of the demon, Wayne says no it's fine just keep studying, he will take care of it. Wayne uses his spatial transfer to go where the beast is, he finds him, it's a class A demon beast named Chimera, Wayne says that he will be his warm-up before his entrance exams. Beast attacks Wayne he dodges the attack and uses spiral raging flames and burns the monster in an instant. After defeating the beast, he thinks he is still good as he was in his previous life. Wayne comes back to the carriage and Kijin tells him he is still impressive as ever. Then the guard sees the burned body of the beast and thinks what kind of great mage would have defeated the beast as Wayne says who know who could it be. After that they arrive at the Arcella Royal Capital as the exams for the academy are merit-based so no one's status matter here. People from all over the continents comes and only strong people can pass the entrance exam. As they both comes forward and was walking towards the academy, a noble sees Wayne what is this dunce doing here who can't even use magic. Kijin gets mad but Wayne stops her. Wayne says isn't you Simon who was famous for riding his parents' coattails as Simon won't need help from his parents on this entrance exam. Simon gets mad and tells Wayne not to get ahead of himself. Simon was going to attack Wayne using his magic then suddenly a girl stops him and tells him she won't tolerate this if he continue any longer. Simon backs down as she is the sword princess and tells Wayne he will deal with him later and leaves. Wayne says thank you to her for saving him, as Wayne remembers her name is Sophie and she is the Count's eldest daughter of Norbert family one of the seven nobles. She tells Wayne that he shouldn't have gotten provoked by him as he doesn't know how bad he can be. Wayne starts lotting and tells her thanks for her concern, but he will be fine. Sophie tells Wayne that his character has changed. Wayne is surprised to hear this, but she tells him to forget about it and leaves. Wayne thinks she is very observant as she notices the change in his personality. Kijin gets upset as she thinks there are a lot of rude people here so she should get rid of them. As Wayne calms her down and tells her they will more of these type of people so she doesn't need to react every time. Then they enter the hall and comes into their classroom for the written exam. Kijin finds her seat as she sit. Wayne speaks to her using his telepathy and tells her that he will tell her the answer just before the exam ends. Kijin tells him she shouldn't had to study then. Wayne says he will tell her but she must first solve it by herself as she understand now the exam begins. As Wayne finds some questions difficult but was able to do them in the end and also fix Kijin wrong answers as well. 
She says she will do her best to live up to Wayne's expectations for the remaining exams. Wayne tells her of course she will. As they move to the chanting exams, a student uses a flame arrow and fire to the target. Wayne sees it and thinks they are not as good as he thought they will be, which means he has to limit his spiritual power even more than before. Now it's Wayne's turns he limits his on jutsu, but still, destroyed the target into pieces. Everyone is surprised to see this. Simon says he must be cheating as he doesn't have any mana how can he use such magic. All the other students also thinks he must be cheating. Then their instructor tells them if he is cheating or it will be decided after the exams. Then he called Kijin as she was next. Wayne is relieved as he got through the first half of the exam. Simon tells Wayne that he will not be able to cheat in practical exams, as they both were talking Kijin also uses the same attack Wayne uses and destroyed the target. Everyone is shocked as Wayne shakes his head cause he forgot to tell her to keep her powers in check. After that they move to the stadium where the practical exams are held. Students fights with each to demonstrate their skills. Simon tells Wayne does he know who is his opponent, Wayne tells him he doesn't care. Instructor call the students for their duel who is Simon and Wayne. Simon requested the academy to have his duel with Wayne. Wayne says, isn't that cheating? Simon says he will expose him in front of everyone. Wayne tells him, do you think you can take me down? Simon gets mad and tells him he will beat him. They face each other and the match begins. Simon uses a red crystal and makes a big fireball and fires it towards Wayne. Wayne says using a fire crystal isn't it cheating, then he won't hold back either. Wayne uses his jutsu named Mega Freeze and which takes out the fireball in an instant. Simon is shocked to see this as he falls to the ground. Wayne comes towards him and puts him to sleep. Match is over and the winner is of course Wayne, as the instructor finds out that Simon was cheating and he will be disqualified from the exams. Sophie is shocked to see Wayne and thinks what happened to him, as Wayne comes back to Kijin and she congratulates him for taking care of that rude guy. Wayne is also relieved then he tells her to hold her power back a little more than before. She says she will, but Wayne thinks she might go overboard as during the match of course she does. Wayne knew this would happen and the exams comes to an end. After that we go to the principal office where he is looking at the Wayne profile, then he wants to interview him. Three days after the entrance exams Wayne is called to the academy, as they didn't call Kijin, Wayne is a little disappointed. Principal asks him are you Wayne, he says yes, then principal introduced himself his name is Rolo. Wayne knows him as his full name is Rolo Vistav and also he is the strongest magician in the entire kingdom of Alstera. He has invented more than 100 of new spells and known as the father of modern magic studies. Holo apologized Wayne for making him come all the way here as he would like to ask him few questions. Wayne thinks is what he should say to answer his questions. Then Paula tells him that his in theory is that what Wayne is using is not magic. Wayne is surprised to hear this as this is to be expected from the strongest magician as Wayne thinks he was not planning to keep his powers hidden, this will be a good chance for him. Wayne tells him yes, it is correct he didn't use magic as he doesn't have any mana, and what he used was on Jutsu. Paulo is surprised to hear this as he has never heard of this before. Wayne tells him that's because he invented this by himself. Paulo is impressed to hear this and tells to let's go and cast a spell which teleported them outside. Wayne is surprised as he used magic without enchanting. Paulo tells him to show his magic that he used during the exams. Wayne says okay. Paulo tells him whether he will fail or pass the exams will depend on what he will show him. Wayne fells like he is giving the fourth exam, which only he had to take. As he was about to use his jutsu, Paulo throw a few furballs at him as Wayne is protected by a barrier. Wayne asks him why he is attacking him all of a sudden. Paulo tells him to do not think of him some old man as he want to see Wayne's full power. Wayne gets mad and asks him are you the greatest magician Paula says he is. Wayne tells him let me show you all he has got his strongest Anyu Jutsu named Ultimate Spirit Flame and he fires a huge blue flames fireball at Paulo and he barely was able to dodge his attack. Paula thinks he is way much stronger than other exorcists as Wayne thinks this life will be much fun than his previous one. Paulo tells Wayne he thinks he knows his power now so Wayne asks him did he pass the exam. Paulo tells him his passing was never in the question. Wayne is confused and Paulo tells him he has already passed the exam three days ago. He wanted to know Wayne's power in person and he is looking forward to see what exactly he would achieve in this academy. Wayne starts smiling and thinks he is a cunning old man. After a few days in the palace, Kijin is excited as they have passed the exams and Kijin tells Wayne that his brothers are foolish to have bet with him. Wayne hope they follow their words. They arrive at the gate of their room Wayne releases the summoning jutsu of Kijin as she leaves. Wayne enters the room, and his brothers were sitting there eating. 
His brother tells him as he know they don't want to eat with him, so he should leave. Wayne says I have something to show you both and show them the letter of acceptance from the academy and tells them he did it. They are shocked to see this as they think the letter must be a fake one as Wayne has no mana and there is no way he can get accepted in the academy. Wayne tells them he will prove that the letter is real deal and thinks smiling they will know their power difference netwing them when they see him. One brother takes out a dagger and tries to cut Wayne but he stops it with his fingers and tells the other brother to come at him with all they have got. He gets mad uses a fireball to burn Wayne as they thinks they killed him. Wayne vanishes the fire with no scratches at all. They both are shocked to see this. He throws the dagger towards his brother he almost got cut and falls to the ground. And Wayne tells them this will be the as Wayne has passed the exam now he will claim his inheritance. And tells them they are officially banished from the Granado family and they have till tomorrow to pack their things. He asks his brother what are they going to do as they were finally able to kill their father by swapping his medicine every day. His brother tells him now he will have to use his trump card. Then they go to a restaurant and gives 10 platinum coins to an assassin named Zodia to kill Wayne. At night when Wayne was sleeping they use a dark magic barrier to shut him in his room and also assassination magic to kill him in his rooms. Wayne says they thinks they would kill him with such weak magic. They are mistaken Wayne starts smiling and says let me show them how a real assassination is done. His brothers are laughing, thinking they have almost killed him, as the assassin had used solvent magic to make him go crazy from pain. They says let's go take a look at him as they need payback from the morning when he humiliated them. As they go upstairs towards his room, comes into the room and are shocked to see that Wayne is not in his room. They can't believe that he escaped as the assassin used double magic circle for him. He asks Zodia where is he then. Wayne comes from behind and tells them he is here and tells them he escaped the barrier long before they could complete it. They don't understand what he is implying. Wayne tells them they shouldn't have comes into the room before confirming that their target is dead or no, and he also was hearing when they were talking about him and tells them that father was right you two are not suited to become lords. They tells the assassin to kill him as he charges but Wayne takes him down and tells his brother that he will show them hell so you two will learn your lesson. They get scared and tells him that they are sorry and they will never bother him again. Wayne says no thank you, and summons his Shikagami named Tenku, who is one odd the twelve heavenly generals specialized in illusions, and if his brothers ever comes back to Granado territory, they will suffer from illusion monsters attacking them, and they will never be able to come back to the Granado territory ever again. Now Wayne has become the lord of the Granado territory, and picks the picture of his father and says he will protect the land he loves so much so he can rest in peace. The next day at the academy Wayne is called on the stage for speech as he has scored the highest in the exams. He comes to the podium and thanks everyone and tells them as everyone know he doesn't have any mana and he can't use magic, but he has something else named Anyujutsu. Using this he tells everyone that he is better than each and every one of the magicians here. Students gets upset hearing this, Wayne tells them he will show everyone why he is above everyone during the upcoming activities as he thanks them at the end for listening to him speak. Kijin thinks Wayne looks really cool. Paulo says now he has done it. As a student comes to him and asks him how can he allow such greeting, Paulo tells him it's fine, as all matters in this academy is ability and Wayne has not ability to back his statement. Student tells him they will see. After that we go in class as all the students are avoiding Wayne like he is a criminal. But it doesn't matter for Wayne. Sophie comes and tells him that was a pretty provocative speech. Wayne tells her it was pretty good right. She tells him as he sure is now the whole academy is hating you because of the speech. Wayne tells her she is right but this is what he wants. He tells her that he will become the top student in the academy using his Anyu Jutsu. She asks him when did he develop a new form of magic. He tells her it's Anyu Jutsu don't mix them together. And he learned it by betting his life on it. She is shocked to her this. Kijin comes back and tells Wayne about the campus and how each one has its own cafeteria and northern one is famous for its baked apple pie. Wayne tells her let's go there then. He shakes Sophie's hand and tells her he hoped to get along with her, she says likewise. Steve thinks is that really Wayne as he is acting different than before. After that we see in teacher who looks definitely the villain for this chapter and has his eyes on Sophie as she has the awakened gene. He thinks if he has her awakened gene he will be unstoppable, even Rolo can't beat him and he will rule all Sarah. A week later after the ceremony, students goes outside for mock battles in the Surds class they have to pair up with another student. A student asks Sophie to pair up with her. She says, of course, Wayne pair up with Kitchen. But before that, Wayne wants to see the battle of Sophie. As the battle starts, Suffer quickly charges and defeats the girl. 
Wayne is impressed by her skills as she is known as the Sword Princess. Kijin tells Wayne let get their mock battle started, Sophie is surprised to see Wayne and Kijin fighting and thinks they are really amazing fighters. They kept fighting and Kijin charges forward and misses Wayne and he defeats her easily. Wayne tells her, as her acting skills have improved, he tells her that she doesn't have to hold back to make look good and tells her to come at him seriously next time. Then Sophie asks Wayne to have a mock battle with her. He says of course and they aware about to start. Students are excited as the first place and second place from the exams are going for a battle who is going to win. Sophie charges forward and Wayne block her attack, and she thinks he is definitely different from the Wayne she knew, as Wayne is using sword style that doesn't match the sword style from Alstera, and also that technique he calls Anyu Jutsu is also a mystery. But by crossing swords she wants to know more about him. Wayne notices that Sophie Mana is unstable, and if she stays like this she won't be able to improve her skills, then Wayne decides to use his jutsu and creates a pillar under her which distracts her and he swiftly comes behind her and was about her hit her she quickly raises her sword and deflect his attack. Wayne loses his sword then he admits his loss. Sophie is surprised to hear this, she tells him can't you just pick your sword up? He tells her he used Anyu jutsu which is against the rules Soki lost. Then Sophie realizes that mana in her body is stabilizing and figures that Wayne trying to stabilize her, she thanks him. Wayne tells her no problem, Sophie understood after having a match with him, even though he is stronger than before, but his kind and awkward side is still the same as ever. After the class everyone is talking about Wayne how he talked big during his speech, but lost against Sophie, Kijin get irritated but Wayne tells her to calm down. Sophie comes to the rescue and tells everyone that it's a misunderstanding as Wayne helped her get her mana stabilized as his swordsmanship is better than her so he could have win easily without using the Anyu Jutsu, and she asks him isn't that right, Wayne says who knows, and he wants to have a rematch, and will not lose this time. Sophie says she will be looking forward for it. All the students surround Wayne and tells him they changed their opinion about him after hearing Sophie, Wayne is surprised to see them. He comes to Sophie and tells her his classmates are not avoiding him cause of you, she is glad she could help him. Wayne tells her he has something to ask her why not she come to his mansion after school today, she says of course she will come. After that they go to his mansion for some tea, as Kijin served them tea, Sophie didn't know that Kijin was Wayne's servant. Wayne tells her it's not rare to have servant to attend academy at all Sarah. Then Wayne asks her what did she meant when she tells him about being easy to misunderstand. She tells him to put it simply you are a little too confident. As Wayne has never thought about it, he thinks it might be realted to why his family betrayed him in his previous life. He thinks being confident was normal but now he needs to act a little humbly to avoid repeating the same mistakes. Sophie tells her she could help him to get closer with the class, Wayne asks her will you, she tells him of course as she would like to get know him better too. Wayne thanks her and after the tea she leaves as they say goodbye to each other, Wayne makes her first friend in school. As Sophie was leaving thinking about their meeting, suddenly a woman comes in front of her and sprained her ankle. She asks Sophie to give her a shoulder as her house isn't too far from here. Sophie says in that case let me carry you on her back, she sits down in front of her, then she uses dark magic and puts Sophie to sleep and carry her to the house. Sophie's servant comes to Wayne mansion and asks him if she is here, he tells her that she left quite a while ago, she tells Wayne that the princess hasn't returned home yet. Wayne thinks this is not good and she tells him if he sees her he should let them know and goes back in the carriage. Then Wayne uses his jutsu and summons Tamo and tells him to find Sophie, he disappears to find him. But Wayne has a bad feeling about this, and we see Suffy tied up to a chair. She wakes up and sees these two one gloomy looking guy, and one really beautiful girl in front of her. She asks them who are they, girl tells her that she forget who brought her here. Suddenly Sophie gets a shock and she starts screaming. Girl tells her that they are trying to extract her magic gene. Gloomy guy tells her he already said too much and tells her to keep her mouth shut if she wants to live. Sophie recognizes then and tells him that they are the Lunatoria. They both are shocked to hear and thinks how does she know that name. Sophie tells them that here organization name us Luntioria, and they see nobles as their enemies, gloomy guy says that they have grown e that now the seven great nobles know about them. He tells her that their goal is to shake this world where birth determines your status, which is created by you nobles, and to grant everyone the same power regardless of their bloodline. Based on her magic gene, they will create a drug that will drastically improve their mana. As long they have this drug everyone will find happiness regardless of how much low mana they have, but they have to become part of their organization to get this drug, and they will kill everyone last noble then a new world shall be born. 
Sophie tells him nobody would like that. He gets irritated and pulls the lever down, which gives shocks to Sophie. He tells her in a few moments the extraction process will be done. Then she will be free to go, but she will be a cripple though. Then Tama finally found Sophie, but he alone can't fight them as the women is strong, so quickly goes back to Wayne to inform him about what he saw. Back at the mansion, Tamo tells Wayne Spout Sophie Locationa as she is held hostage in an abandoned castle in the west. Wayne asks him why is she in a place like that. Tamo tells Wayne there is a group named Lunatioria who has her and she is being used for some kind of experiment. Wayne asks him is Sophie okay? He says she is but she is on the edge. Wayne tells him to take him to her immediately. He also tells Kijin to come with them. As they come to the palace and see that the palace is surrounded by around 100 guards, Tamo shows them where the lab is located and show them a shortcut. But Wayne tells them he will not take it, as he is really mad and they will pay for messing up in his domain. He summons four more Shikagami named Suzaku, Kaujin, Jemba, and Dain, and orders them to crush them and beat them beyond their recognition. They all gets excited and goes forward to the Manzio head-on. As Wayne is really mad a guard comes in front of him, he plunges his head into the ground and tells him to get out of his way. All the guards gets alerted as they are under attack. Wayne tells Kochin to go forward and take care of them, as Kuchin uses his strength and take on all of them. Others move forward Wayne asks them where are the stairs leading down. As they were about to go down the stairs more guys comes back. Wayne tells Dane and Suzaku to take care of these guys. They both comes forward happily as it's finally their turn and takes care of these guys. Lady comes upstairs and then tells them are they here to save Sophie. Kijin senses that this wind is quite powerful and tells Wayne leave her. Wayne pass the women. She uses her spell on him but Kijin blocks her. She is surprised and doesn't understand what happened to her. Then women uses the drug and injects herself and turns into a monster but Kijin tells her she is she will exercise her. Wayne reaches underground and Tamo tells him the room which Sophie is held. He tells Tamo to take care of the guards here and tells Jembu to bring the confused people outside and heal their wounds. As they both get ready as the guards attack them, Tamo easily takes most of them in one hit as Jembu starts healing all the people held hostage. A girl tells Jembu that she is a goddess, but she doesn't know what is it. Then Wayne comes to the room where Sophie is. Gloomy guy says that he is here to rescue Sophie. Wayne tells her that she will be Aka she did a good job holding out for this long gloomy guy tells Wayne he won't be able to rescue her. Wayne get more mad and tells him don't think that he stand a chance against him as this will be in one-sided extermination. Dane Suzaku has already taken down all the guys and this was a piece of cake for them. And they see Kijin her opponent is really strong, but Kijin is stronger as her unique skill is really a special one. Women tells Kijin didn't she tell her that she will exterminate her? Kijin thinks her opponent's physical abilities are far better than hers. Women takes out her claws and charges onto Kijin. Her blows are getting heavier for Kijin, but she blocks it eventually. But as Kijin was standing, women charges and hit her with her claws, and Kijin got hit and was on the edge. Women tells Dei and Suzaku why are they playing around instead of helping her. Suzaku tells her because they have finished their job. Women thinks of them as idiots and tells them she will kill Kijin and will come for them. They both starts laughing and tells her that she will never beat Kijin, her power is in different level than hers. Winnen tells them let me show you what can do and charges towards Kijin. Then Kijin uses her unique skill and cuts through her attacks instantly, and women can't believe she lost even after using the injection. Dane and Suzaku both are surprised to see Kijin powers in action. Kijin tells Dane her powers are amazing too. She tells her to trade powers with her, she tells her they can't as she will be more weaker without her powers. Kijin's unique skill name is Moment's Return, which allows her to send her opponent 0.1 seconds back in time. These unique skills are the reason they are called the 12 Heavy Generals the strongest Shikigami. However, Kijin never thought she would had to use her unique skill to defeat her. Dane thinks it must be because of the injections she took which make her really strong. On the other hand, Wayne cuts her ropes and picks up Suffy in her arms as she tells him to be careful and got passes out. Wayne calls Tamo and hands Sophie to her to care of her and moves towards the culprit. The gloomy guy has added Sophie's mana gene in their grug and can produce the artificial awakened ones. He tells Wayne now finally they can create a world where whether you are strong or weak everyone will be equal. Wayne tells him it's useless dad doesn't care about his ideals. He takes the injection and really becomes a monster which he called awakened one. Wayne tells him monstrous is a good way to put him as he really have become a monster. He tells Wayne that he is looking the king of the new world. Wayne tells him he doesn't care as in his previous life. 
He has defeated a lot of evil monsters, and he will be no different from them. It's time for Wayne to perform an exorcism. He starts laughing as Wayne still thinks he can beat him. Monster quickly comes behind Wayne to attack him, but Wayne uses his spirit blade to block his attack. But he has hardened his skin so Wayne won't cut through it. Wayne tells him let's do it serious, then Wayne uses flash step which hurts the monster. Monster says it doesn't matter as Wayne can't stop me. He uses cursed chains on Wayne and chains restrained Wayne from moving. Wayne needs to do something quickly, as he doesn't any mana he will get killed. He uses his spiritual power and hits the spell in its weak point and breaks the chains easily. Monster is surprised to see this, Wayne quickly cuts him as his sword hurt him before and he starts to bleed. Monster doesn't understand what's going on. He tells Wayne he is impressed by him as no one has ever compete with him in the Awakened One form and ask Wayne to join his organization. Wayne tells him no as he would never work under someone and also he wouldn't like to be his boss either. After all his anger won't subside until he takes him down. He says then he will have to kill him right now and show him the true power of Awakened One. He blasts the whole building and the whole building goes down to ashes. Wayne thinks it's some serious power, but it's useless if he can't hit him. Wayne uses his spirit shockwaves and plunges him down, but then he sees the people, comes up, uses his full power, and create a huge purple ball of power, and thinks as Wayne won't be able to fight him protecting his friends, Wayne says he really is a monster as he doesn't care killing his own people. Wayne contacts Kijin using his telepathy and tells her to protect the people, as he is going to get serious now. Wayne uses his strongest technique named Ultimate Spirit Flame and also infuse his Black Flame with it, creating a more powerful spell, and they both fire their spells to each other, which creates a huge explosion but Wayne attack cuts through his spell and burn him to falls on the ground. Wayne comes down and says he will exorcise him now. As he uses his purification spell he sees his memory, how his parents were killed by a burglar when he was young. So he decided to learn magic to protect himself, luckily sponsored by someone he becomes a scholar, and also met the love of his life. But this happiness goes away in an instant. His love was stolen by a noble being a low status he couldn't do anything to protect her. His talent helped him when he wrote revolutionary thesis on magic, which was also stolen by the noble all his achievements, which changed him he says he will create a world where equality is justified. After seeing everything about his past life, he tells him that his memory shows that he is not a bad person and asks him if he wants to join him. Gloomy guy is surprised to hear this. Wayne tells him he will make his dream come true as he has amazing knowledge of magic. Why not use that knowledge for his sake? Gloomy guy starts crying as they both shake hands and he tells him he swears his everything to him. Wayne tells him he will be looking forward to work with him. Kijin gets happy seeing them. No everyone was rescued they destroyed the castle. All their members were arrested and was sent to the Alstera prison. They also burned all the amplifying drug that they made and also heal Sophie by Jembu who is an exceptional healer. Sophie will be alright soon. All the rescue people were sent back to their repective homes. Everyone thanks Wayne for helping them. Wayne feels shy and thinks this was a new experience for him as he used to only save people in secret. The new was published on the national newspaper and Kijin tells Wayne that his reputation finally seems to be rising now. Wayne is happy to hear this. Kijin asks him about the letter he tells her it's a letter sent by Sophie's father. He is inviting him to his mansion. Kijin gets happy hearing this as says if it wasn't for Wayne Sophie would have died. Wayne tells her he didn't do much he just helped out a single friend. Kijin tells him he is really a great man. Wayne thinks things turns out to be great having one of the seven nobles indebted to him and it can also help his weak territory as well. The next day he goes to their mansion and was escorted to his room but their maid. Wayne thanks him for the invitation, he is very grateful, Sophie father tells him he is the who should be grateful as he saved his daughter. They sits down and maid gives Wayne tea, Sophie father says let's get to the point and ask Wayne to marry his daughter Sophie. Wayne gets shocked hearing this and spits his tea on him. He wipes it off Wayne is so embarrassed and apologized to him, as it was just such a huge shock for him. He tells him no problem as you saved my daughter from the kidnappers. Otherwise it wouldn't have ended well his daughter would have died and the kingdom would have had to suffer. Then he asks Wayne again with a smiling face do you want to marry my daughter? Wayne asks him does Sophie know about this? He tells him of course not. Wayne tell him it would be great not make such a decision without asking her opinion first. Therefore he politely declined his offer. After all Sophie is very important to Wayne. Sophie father says important and friend huh now he said he is more reluctant to marry her off with Wayne. Wayne didn't like that Sophie father tells him she would be a great wife. She is very pretty and young. She is very brave, 
and also has an admirable side to her as well. She is very kind, respect all kinds of people regardless of their status. He asks Wayne has he changed his mind. Wayne tells him his answer is still no. He says let's put this topic on hold for the next time. Wayne thinks there will be a next time too. Sophie's father tells him if he can't join their families, is there anything else he can do to pay for his kindness? Sophie father say that he will hand over a part of their territory over to the Granado family. Wayne definitely likes that idea. Wayne thinks this would be a great help, and he will take full advantage of this. Wayne tells him then there is a specific part of a territory he would like. He says I'm all ears tell me. Wayne says that he would like to have the land of Colbert Village, which is close to Granado's territory. Sophie father tells him but that area is barely developed, so Wayne is after the mineral deposits of that land, Wayne says no, while it's true that it's a region rich in minerals, but what draw actually his attention was the land itself. That land has everything in resources that his land lacks. Sophie father tells him that the land is very hard to develop you know that don't you, Wayne says of course, he says okay he will trangle the Colbert village and also his surrounding to the Granado family. Wayne thanks him, Sophie father says he should be the one thanking him for saving his daughter. Wayne asks him can he Sophie right now, her father says he don't mind. He tells his maid to show him the way to Sophie's room. Sophie father says he is just like his father, he might be someone who is going to lead our nation someday. Sophie is lying on her bed, can't stop to think about the time Wayne when he saved her, has Wayne made his way through such dangers to save her after all? Sophie thinks he thought of her as a friend or he thinks of her as something more. She just can't stop thinking about him and jumping to conclusions. She gets out of her bed to do some exercise and focus on swinging her sword, then she might be able to forget about it. She opens her room door, Wayne is outside her room. She is shocked to see him. He says hi and tells her sorry for coming unannounced to see her. She gets happy thinking Wayne came to see her. Wayne says she wasn't looking good when he saved her so he was worried about her. She starts blushing hearing this, suddenly remembers she is in her nightie and quickly closed her door on Wayne. She says sorry but she is not feeling well. Wayne tells her it's okay take your time and hope she recovers quickly. Sophie in her room thinking she messed up, how could she treat him like that after all he saved her life. Wayne thinks she avoided her as he thinks it was right choice to refuse the marriage proposal. It would have hurt Sophie if he had accepted the offer. Now Wayne thinks about the land he got from Lord Norbert and will put into great use. He goes back to the capital in his villa where Kijin welcomes him. Wayne tells her he would like to return to the Granado territory immediately. They into a room. Wayne uses his teleport jutsu and returns back to their territory instantly. Wayne made ask him when did he return from the capital. He tells her he just arrived a short while ago. He asks her if Rikugo is in the office. She tells him he is Wayne goes in the office Rikugo is in there and asks Wayne what he can do for him. Wayne tells him that he have obtained a new territory. So he thought he should come back to tell him. Riku thinks it's great. Now Wayne's spiritual power is back to how it was before and now he can use all the 12 heavenly generals at once to do some rapid developments in their territory. Rikugo thinks it's a great idea. Now Wayne summons all 12 of the heavenly generals and give them instructions. Now Wayne has enough spiritual power to maintain all of them and tells them they will expect to be summoned all the time now. One of them attacks Wayne from behind another general's comes and stops his attack and tells him to not disrespect Wayne Sama. His name is Toda, and he is a problem child among the twelve generals. Wayne tells him he would fight him next time, and for now just go along with the work he gives him. If he doesn't listen to him, Wayne can always cancel this summon, they gets happy as it feels like old times to them. Wayne gave them orders and tells them they are going to make some big improvements in the territory. Everyone gets excited and says they will follow Wayne orders. Wayne tells them the reason why Granite of Territory is called the weak and small territory in all of Alstera, because their population, military, and economics are all below the norm. Wayne wants to improve in these areas first. Kijin will be supporting Wayne at the academy, Rikugo will manage the territory, Tama will be in charge of housework and management of the villa, Tanku will gather information on these subjects Wayne listed, Kouchin will become an instructor and improve their soldier skills, Siryu and Tenku will establish and manage a new merchant company. Jembu will open a temporary hospital and treat the injured people at the church. Which left these four, Suzaku, Dane, Tuda, Bayako will be in charge of developing the new territory. Dane asks Wayne what should they do to develop the new territory they have no idea how to do it. Wayne tells her they just need to get along with the locals it's simple as that. The people Kilbot village doesn't like the fact that Wayne is their lord, so these four should get along with these locals to gain their trust. This is Wayne's idea. Dane loves the idea and gets excited. 
Siryu says if the plan goes well her company will come in handy, Wayne says that's right, this is the reason he asked her to start one. Toda tells Wayne then he can wild then naturally Wayne will have to fight with him, Wayne tells him that's why Baako and Suzaku with him to prevent this from happening. Dane asks Wayne why did he team her together with them, Wayne pats head and tells her she is cute and innocent, and people easily take a liking to her, she gets happy and tells Wayne he knows her very well. All the Shikigami starts laughing which means that she is like a child. Wayne says to everyone he will be counting on them, as they all bow to him and tell him as he wish. The next day at the school everyone seems to know about Wayne as he is the one who saves Sophie. But Wayne finds it uncomfortable students staring at him. Kijin says should she go and knock everyone out, Wayne tells her as there is no need to do that. He comes in the classroom and sees Sophie and asks her if she is feeling alright. She tells him she is feeling better now. Sophie apologized to Wayne for closing her door on him when he came to check up on her. Wayne tells her it's okay as she was not feeling well. Sophie thinks he is a really kind person as they are friends so it's natural. And she starts blushing and teachers comes in the class and ask everyone to settle down. His name is Corin and he will be magic teacher for their class. Before starting the class he says those students who can't use magic and they use whatever jutsu should not get in his way of educating other talented students. Wayne says he is practically calling them out, Kijin gets mad, Sophie tells the teacher that it is rude to ask a student question like this, he tell her he just speak the truth as this academy is made for those who have a lot of mana, if they don't have it they don't belong here. Teacher tells them he will begin the lesson as they are just wasting time now, Wayne thinks this is going to be a troublesome class. Teacher tells the students that magic spells are ranked in order from 1st to 7th rank. Right now students can only use low ranking magic from 4th to 7th. But from now on he will teach the students high ranking magic from 3rd to 1st ranks. The only capable person who is capable of using most of the 1st rank spells is their principal role of Vista. Teachers tell them learning 1st rank spells might be difficult, but he would like everyone to be able to use at least 3rd rank spells, which are considered high rank although there are some students who can't even use low-ranking magic, which is none other than Wayne and Kijin. He tells the students to put their hand on these crystal balls to get their mana evaluation which spells best suit their mana. A student comes in who has an attribute of water, which is suited for assistance spells due to its lacking amount of mana. Another student comes in same thing goes for her, but she has the light attribute. Teacher tells them this year quality of students is not great. Sophie comes forward, Teacher says that's why a chump with no mana was able to take the first place. Sophie gets mad and tell Corin Sensi that Wayne is way more powerful than both him and her. He gets irritated hearing this, then Sophie touches the crystals and they started glowing brightly. Everyone is surprised to see this as she is the best one so far, Wayne says as he expected from Sophie. Teacher is shocked to see Sophie mana and tells her she has incredible talent in magic. Sophie says thanks and tell him she was able to output this much mana is thanks to Wayne because he identified what was wrong with it and fixed it instantly. Teacher didn't like that at all, and says how can he fix it, he doesn't have any mana at all, and calls the next student, which is Kijin, she comes forward, she telepathically asks Wayne how much mana should she pour into the crystal, Wayne asks her does she have mana, she tells him yes a fair amount of it, he tells her to pour as much she can without surpassing Sophie, teacher tells her what's wrong you can't do it, then Kijin pour her mana into the crystal, and it starts glowing as the same color as Sophie. Everyone thinks she is on the same level as Sophie maybe even better. Sophie is happy to see it as this is to be expected from Kijin. Teacher is surprised to see this and calls the next student which is Wayne. Teacher thinks it's final, his turn, the whole reason he is doing this to expose Wayne right here, just how useless he is. On the other hand Wayne is thinking what he should do as he doesn't have any mana, and he is also curious about what would happen if he poured spiritual power into this magic crystal. He pours spiritual power and nothing happens to the crystal then suddenly. The students notices that the color of the crystal is changing to black. Teacher is surprised to see this. Seeing in effect Wayne pours more spiritual power in the crystal. And it turns pure black and get broken into pieces. Wayne, teacher, and all the students are surprised to see this. Teacher asks Wayne what is he doing. Wayne apologize and thinks magic crystals are quite fragile. The teacher gets more irritated the crystals have been used in the academy for decade, no one ever has been able to break it using their mana. Teacher tells them to quiet down as he is going to get another crystal. All the students surround him and tells Wayne that Anyu Jutsu is quite amazing. They are happy seeing their rude teacher get surprised. Seeing this Sophie gets happy as he has started to blend in with them. This student is next and thinks Wayne has put Korin Sensei in mad mood, which will be troublesome for her. 
Corrin brings the new crystal and asks Henry to test her mana she puts his hand on the crystal and it doesn't glow. Teacher asks her is this all she can do? In his all years of teaching here, this is the first time he has seen such hopeless He tell her not to bring down other students and goes back to her seat. Wayne seeing all this thinks then she must have other talents which helped her pass the entrance exams, which means she is really great in other areas except magic. Teacher tells the students their next lesson will be practical training and tells them to split up into groups of two and they will have to find the goal in the middle of the forest next week and they can start looking for their partners now. Everyone huddles around Sophie to ask her be their partner. She thinks now she can't ask Wayne to be her partner with everyone surrounding her. Kijin asks Wayne what are they going to about pairing up. Wayne tells her someone has caught his eye and tells Kijin it's Henry. She quietly leaves the classroom and Wayne thinks now it will be a good chance for him to talk to her. She goes to the cafeteria and was thinking about how nobody wants to pair up with her. Wayne comes from behind and asks her if he can sit with her. She tells him she doesn't mind and sits next to her. She asks him what does he want Wayne tells her he just need to talk with her as they both are under the same circumstances. She tells him they are nothing alike as he have on Jutsu. He tells her this is he wanted to talk about with her. She doesn't have much mana yet were able to pass the entrance exam, which she was admitted here because she of her talent. She tells Wayne she knows a lot about magic which helped her get in the academy. Wayne asks her as she know a lot is there anything in which you are especially good at. She tells him she like making magic tools she is crazy about them. She applied to this academy to polish her skills into making the magic tools but it's a lot tougher than she thought. She tells Wayne if she was a little stronger she wouldn't have such a hard time. In that case Wayne asks her if she is free after school to come to his mansion and they can have a special training for the next week. Wayne tell her if she doesn't have much mana then she should just invent her own personal magic. She asked is that even possible Wayne tell her of course as she have a lot of knowledge about magic. She thanks Wayne and tell him she will try her best. After school she comes to the mansion and shows Wayne what she can do. Wayne asks her that she can use magic without chanting. She tells him yes since she did it all the while making magic tools. Wayne thinks chant emission is really difficult as it requires a certain amount of magic and mana concentration. Even in Alsura, there are not many magicians who can use magic without chanting. Wayne asks her to fire a spell in a way he asked her to. She asked him what way would that be. He tell her to fire the spell using less mana into it than usual. She asked him wouldn't it will make the spell weaker. Wayne tells her they are testing let's give it a try. C tries putting less mana into the spell and creates a huge ball of water which destroyed the target. Henry is shocked to see this and ask Wayne what just happened. He tells him using less mana made you use the spell effectively. Henry asks Wayne to tell her in more detail. Wayne tells her everyone in this world only thinks about casting the same spell in the same way, while they sometimes shorten or omit their chance, but they always use the same process that goes for Henry as well, but once she switched the method she was able to fire powerful spells despite having small mana pool. Henry is surprised to hear about this, as Henry has developed excellent mana control from making magic tools, so that's why Wayne thought she would be able to do it. Henry tells Wayne this is really amazing as she would have never guessed it on her own. Also this idea will shake the whole world's concept of magic. Wayne tells her it's maybe because he doesn't have mana and he is an exorcist. Wayne asks her now she think people will treat her more kindly. Sophie gets really happy and now will be able to manage in the academy thanks to Wayne. And also what's her first time someone praised her at the academy she is overjoyed. Wayne asks her would she like to pair up with him. She won't mind but she will slow him down. Wayne tells her not to worry let's ace the exams and leave Sensei Corin speechless. Henry starts laughing and says Wayne is real amazing and tells him she would love to pair up with him if he doesn't mind. Wayne says of course and they shake hands on it. After one week later training week arrives and everyone is gathered outside with their partners. Teacher tells them their exam will start from here and they have to collect these crystals from the forest and bring them back with them and those who are not back until sunset will fail the exam. They can expect both monsters and traps on the way there so students should advance with utmost caution. Then teacher sees an interesting pair which is Henry's and Wayne. He tells them they will go first and should climb the mountains without getting in their way. Wayne says they will try their best and moves forward Wayne tells Henry to go at her own pace as he will match it. As soon the teacher says start Henry channels her mana and uses acceleration magic and goes forward quickly with blue flames covering her. Everyone is shocked to see this especially Sensei Corin. Kijin thinks this is to be expected from Wayne. Sophie is also surprised to see this as Henry couldn't even use magic last time 
and thinks Wayne really is amazing at helping other people grow. Sensei Corin get irritated and doesn't understand what did they do. Teacher tells the students to not go into the barrier that's on the path of the mountain. There is a monster there that you can't defeat as they are now and they might even lose your life. Sophie couldn't believe what she just heard, gets mad at the teacher and asks him why he didn't say that earlier when Wayne and Henry was still here. Teacher tells her that he forgot. Sophie tells him you can't forget something important like that. He tells her that is true and will let them know next time in advance. Well, if there even is a next time. He says not to worry since they are two failures and he is sure they will drop out before reaching the barrier. Sophie couldn't believe that such a rotten person can be teacher in all Sarah. She hopes Wayne and Henry will be safe. Kijin didn't say anything at all. The scene shifts to both of them running in the forest. Wayne tell Henry he is doing great. Henry gets happy as it was worth inscribing magic into their shoes. Henry inscribed magic circles into their school shoes and turned them into magic tools and also by using physical enhancement on themselves they can reach their high speeds easily and also made sure to get permission to alter their shoes from the principal so they couldn't accuse them for cheating. Wayne tells Henry to be careful as the real test has just begun. Suddenly Henry tells Wayne to stop. Wayne asks him what happened. He picks up a rock and throws it on the ground and there was a magic trap there for them. They are happy as they didn't fall into this pitfall. Wayne thanks Henry for saving him. Wayne gets to thinking as these are the traps mentioned by their teacher. It was hard for Wayne to notice them. Henry is happy that he could help Wayne. Henry tells Wayne that he hasn't told him you would have probably found a way to deal with it. Wayne tells him that's not true. They say as all the traps are hidden so they should move a little slower and moves forward, and thus they overcame the traps and also fought the monsters. After all that were able to come to the top of the mountain and seize the magic barrier, according to Wayne as Kijin told him there is barrier with powerful monster inside it. The pretended to forgot and warn the other students about it after they left. Henry says they should take a detour. Wayne tells him no as this is the shortest route. Henry is stunned and tells him that it might prove troublesome even for him, as this is supposed to be one of another of those traps that they need to avoid. Wayne tells him it will be fine so trust him. Wayne goes inside the magic barrier Henry comes running behind him. They both come inside the barrier. Henry tells Wayne that the entrance is gone they can't go back Wayne tells him the entrance and exit are different here. Tree opened his eyes. Henry couldn't believe what he is seeing. The tree turned into a really big aggressive monster. Wayne says this seems to be a trait, which is weaker than the chimera he fought before the entrance exam. Henry is really scared thinking that they have to defeat this monster to reach the exit. Wayne tells Henry he has already helped a lot so leave it to him as he takes out his sword. The tree attacks Wayne, he uses shadow fire to burn his roots, and jumps into the air says there is no way a mere tree can stand a chance in front of him, and slashes the tree into two. After that he goes to Henry and tells him let's get out of here. Henry Coulson believe what he just saw, and finally they comes across the crystal. They both gets happy as they are the first who came. Wayne picks the crystal, and they both couldn't stop smiling. Wayne and Henry comes out of the forest. Teacher is surprised to see that it's these two. They tell Korin Sensei they have brought back the crystal which means they have passed the practical training. Teachers tell them they must have cheated, as they may have been the first one to start but still it's too fast. Korin gets irritated as they manage to avoid the barrier after he kept it hidden from them. Wayne tells him they did take the shortest route and defeated the Trent. Teacher couldn't believe what he just heard teacher says there is no way that they can defeat the Trent. Henry says it will be impossible for him, but not for Wayne, as he took down the Trent in a single blow. Teacher finds this ridiculous as a failure like him can't do that. Wayne tells him when they come back with the crystal so quickly enough proof for him. Teacher says he is sure that they have cheated somehow. Wayne doesn't like that at all as he is always get accused of cheating by magicians. Wayne tells Corin if he doubt them so much why not confirm it by himself. Corin didn't like that at all, and Wayne tells him he can come at him at any time he wants. If he wins then Corin will have to correct his arrogant attitude as a teacher. Henry tells Wayne he can't do that. Corin gets mad and tells Wayne he will correct that rebellious attitude of teacher. He will show Wayne what real magic looks like and cast a spell and fires it towards them. Henry doesn't get how is Wayne going to dodge the attack. Henry tells Corin this is going to far. Corin tells him it's Wayne fault of opposing him and he held back just enough to not kill him as he can brush off his injuries sustained during the practical training. Wayne says no need to worry as he is not injured after all and uses his spell named Bind of Severance and now Corin can't move at all. Wayne tells him he just used Anyu Jutsu that he looked down upon. Corin didn't like that Wayne tells him to relax as he will also hold back as well Paulo comes here and tells Wayne to stop as this is enough. 
Wayne backs off. Paula says he has been watching this year practical training from the start. Quarren gets scared and asks Headmaster what is he doing here. Paula says some of the students from sword class has reported your bad behavior, so he decided to watch the practical training and tells Curran that he is fired. He tells Paula that it's a misunderstanding. Paula tells him what would that be didn't you just omit information trying to get these two students in trouble, and tells him to drop the excuses he will question him about everything once the training is over. Corrin tells Wayne it's all his fault. Wayne tells him he just reaped what you sowed. Corrin tells him to shut up as he is already fired, and he will be taking Wayne with him, and fires a spell at him. Seems that he still doesn't understand the difference between their powers, and uses a flaming spell which cancels out Corrin magic. He is shocked to see this Wayne tells him does you understand now, this is what Anya Jutsu is, after that scene shifts to Kijin and Sophie coming back after getting the crystal. Sophie thanks Kijin for teaming up with her. Kijin says she should be thanking her too as she had fun thanks to Sophie. She gets happy hearing this Kijin asks Sophie why did she choose her to pair up, as everyone in the class looks up to her so much. Sophie starts laughing and tells Kijin she wanted to get to know her better, and also she thinks after getting close to her, she could consult her about Wayne as well. Kijin gets happy as she thanks her Sophie, say they didn't see the barrier Korn Sensei talked about. Terrifying. Kijin smiling says who knows. They comes out of the forest and Wayne greets both of them. Sophie says you guys really did make it back before them, and ask Wayne where is Korn Sensei. Wayne tells her he is over there. She goes to him to report him that they have returned. She calls him but he is not in his senses. Sophie asks what happened to Korin Sensei. Wayne tells her headmaster showed up and fired him. Sophie gets shocked hearing this, and by the end of the day Korin had left Alsura Magic Academy. Wayne is in his carriage with Kijin. She tells him practical training turned out to be a great opportunity as he became friends with Henry, and also got rid of that eyesore of a teacher. Wayne tells her that he is happy as the students in the class seems to recognize Henry now, and also she and Sophie have gotten closer to one another, and also they are planning to have dinner together. Tamo tells Wayne that they are about to arrive at Colbert Village, the new addition to their territory. Wayne hopes that those guys have gotten along with the villagers. Wayne arrives at the village. The chief of the village named Yan come to welcome him. Wayne says thanks you very much, and ask him if his servants are doing a good job. He tells him yes, of course they are. Wayne judges from chief reaction they are doing better than he expected. Chief tells him that he will show him the way to his servants and they starts walking Wayne is surprised to see that he have such a luxurious mansion here. Chief tells Wayne because Toda and others are their great benefactors and letting them have this in return is only natural. Wayne now gets more curious and they go up the stairs and sees Toda sitting on the sofa like a royal. Wayne asks him why is he looking so mighty today. He says because of his popularity of course, Shazuka tells Wayne it's because since they arrive here he has been constantly hunting the monsters around the village. Since the people here have been suffering from monster attacks for a long time they see Tota as their savior, as they have gotten along with the people as Wayne requested, but it has completely gotten into Tota's head, and he listens to them even less than before. Dane gets mad and asks Wayne to do something about him. Wayne says he will do something. Wayne envisions something a little different than this, but this is pretty good result, and if they worship you which means they will gladly obey our orders when we give them. And if they want Tuta to listen to them, there is a quick and easy way to have him do so. Wayne tells Tota why not they fight. Tuta jumps and attack Wayne saying he will do that. As Wayne block his attack says then it's decided, Tay both go outside for their fight. Everyone is standing on the side watching. Wayne tells Tota it's been a while since they fought. Tuta has been waiting for this moment. The day he will kill Wayne and comes behind him and kicks Wayne he goes flying in the air blocking the attack, but Tuta comes around him started punching him, but couldn't get a clean hit, that is which exactly make Wayne worth killing for Tuta. He backs from Wayne and uses his kick of flames, thinks Wayne can easily defend against this technique, but also uses his eye of the snake king, which stops Wayne from moving and Wayne was about to take a direct hit from the attack. Tuta thinks it's his win now, then Wayne comes behind him and tells Tuta he might have lost to that if he was just reincarnated, and punches him to the ground, Tuta falls into the river. Wayne uses his spiritual light arrow and hits Tuta with a direct hit. Dane starts cheering saying she knew Wayne would win. Bayako says Wayne is regaining more of his former strength by the day and Sane goes for them too. Wayne comes down and tells Tuta it's clear to say that he won. Tuta gets mad and says he lost this time but next time he will definitely kill him in their fight and walks of Wayne thinks this is how he is, at least this should make him listen to him for a while. Dane hugs Wayne saying good job. 
They all came down and tells Wayne as expected from him to unearth a holy spring in the middle of their fight with Toda. Suzoku asks Wayne that's why he chose to fight here. Wayne says yes. Dane finds this really awesome and gets excited. Tamo and Kijin wanted to dig up a hot spring in this village. Suzuka says so that's why you were investigating the surrounding soil with Anyujutsu. If they could find a hot spring then they could create several tourist destinations here. And people from all over the country will visit Kolba. And after that they started the development of the Kolba village with hot spring resorts. And they can expand it little by little corresponding to the amount of people that arrive. All the villagers are working hard because of trust Toda's group has built. Kijin tells Wayne that the baths will be finished today. But Wayne is in deep thought thinking about something. Wayne tells her it's nice that they are coming along nicely. And tells Kijin he has some tribal business. He will be back by tonight and leaves. And scene shifts to the Kolbut mine where a strange man in a cloak is making a dark magic circle. But Wayne comes to save the Kolbut village. And asks the man what is he doing here but he doesn't say anything. Uses a flame explosion spell and fires towards Wayne. He easily evades the fire and comes behind him and knocks out the guy in no time. Wayne thinks he doesn't know the guy and what exactly he was trying to set free here. Wayne says he will ask Tenku to investigate this mine later and hand over this guy to the knights at the capital. Wayne comes back, everyone welcomes him back. They waited for him to come back after finishing the bath since they wanted him to be the first one to go in it. Wayne tells them they didn't need to do that. She tells him of course they will not use it until he does it first. Heejin tells Dane this is rude. Wayne tells them why not you all should come in with him. They all get happy and says of course. The guys goes into the men's bath and the girls go to their bath. But Dane slips on the floor. Kijin tells her she is reckless as ever. Kijin goes into the bath gracefully and Dane jumps into the splashing all water on Kijin as the girls enjoying their bath. On the other hand Tuda is on the roof lying by Akko tells him to come and take a bath with them. He tells them leave him alone. They say he is still brooding over losing to Wayne. Kijin contacts Wayne through telepathy and ask Wayne is the temperature up to his liking he tells her yes. And also he has changed quite a lot. Wayne asks he in what way, she tells him he has become more gentler person than he used to be in his previous life. Wayne tells her that's not true as he was always a gentle person. She starts lotting and says I guess. She says you may not be aware of it yourself, but she thinks that through his interaction with Henry and Sophie, as they are now she is sure they will never betray him, rather they will walk alongside him that what amazing friends she think they are. The next day Kijin comes in the office with the bad news, Wayne asks her what happened. She tells him that the magician he caught yesterday has passed away. Wayne says that's unfortunate let's go check his body. He goes inside the cell to check his body and sends a pretty dense mana which means he was killed by a spell. He sees the magic crest on his chest as the crest has a design which amplifies a magic contract. It's looked like it was to activate after a set period of time specified by the contract. But it's fully activated which means they shut him up as he was just a pawn in their organization. It bothers Wayne as he was never able to find out who he was. He tells Kijin let's investigate Colbert Mine next. Bayako asks Wayne can you come with them Wayne says of course. They goes inside the mine and Wayne takes them to where the magician tried dispelling the seal. Which means there must be something sealed inside the mine but the question is what they were planning on doing with it. Wayne says let's break the seal Bayako stay wouldn't that be dangerous. Wayne says they can't do just thinking about it, as where his powers are now he can deal with pretty much anything. They started trying to dispelling the seal Wayne thinks no magic is perfect. It's bound to have a flaw somewhere so he can probably neutralize it by bombarding it with his spiritual power. He casts his spell and breaks the seal, and wonders what kind of monster he will see. Lava shickles around and Salamander comes out of there. Bayako tells Wayne let him handle this and charges forward. Wayne tells him he wants to investigate it so make sure not to kill it. Salamander blows fire at him. Wayne thinks it's intense heat but it's useless against Bayako. Bayako uses his spell and easily takes down the salamander. Wayne gets happy seeing how fast Bayako is which is to be expected from the 12 heavenly generals. Bayako asks Wayne is this enough. Wayne tells him it's perfect. Wayne comes forward to check out the salamander. Suddenly smoke surrounds the salamander and Wayne can't see anything. And salamander shrinks into a baby. Kijin and others finds him really cute. As Wayne tries to touch it he starts talking and asks Wayne to spare his life. Wayne is surprised to see a talking salamander and doesn't understand the meaning of this. Salamander tells Wayne that he is not a monster but he is a spirit. Wayne picks him up and asks him why did he attack them when they released him. He says he was simply confused by the whole ordeal. Wayne says he believes him spirit thanks him. Kijin asks Wayne is this really Oki Wayne says he don't mind. Somewhat he is responsible since he is the one who set it free. 
Wayne tells the spirit he would like to ask him a lot of questions. Spirit says of course he will answer. Summarizing all the questions Wayne asks the spirit, as he is a fire spirit named Salamander and doesn't remember who sealed him and nor does know the reason why, as he is one of the four spirits each represents the elements of water, fire, earth, and wind, Wayne gets irritated as the spirit doesn't remember all the important bits. Kijin tells the spirit, aren't you lying? Wayne thinks that's not the case. Wayne says, could it be that the other spirits were also sealed somewhere just like him? Spirit says he has no idea about it. Bayako says, what a useless lizard, but he does where the other spirits are. Wei asks him how come does he know that since they all represent their own elements so they rotly grasp about each other's existence. Wayne says to Kijin, then if they go and meet these spirits they might be able to understand why they were sealed and what the magicians are planning. Kijin love the idea and also they have a guide too who will help them. Wayne says to the spirit if he helps them he will take responsibility and will look after him. Wayne tells him that he has been sealed for so long so he wanted to get along with him. Wayne says you are free to refuse if he doesn't like the idea. Salamander gets excited and says he will be at his care then. Spirit tells Wayne that five meals a day and a quiet place to sleep is a must for him as he thanks him. After that Wayne goes to the academy and tells everything that happens to the principal Polo, which is why Wayne will be taking leave from school for a while. Polo get excited says it's an interesting story so interesting that if he wasn't the principal he would join him. Wayne says you don't have to follow him Polo says he was just kidding. Paulo asks Wayne as he has been getting in a lot of trouble lately. Wayne says he was probably born under a star. Paulo starts laughing and says that expression fits him perfectly and would like to hear about his adventure when he comes back. Wayne says he will tell him and excuse himself from there. As he comes out of the principal's office, Sophie greets him and asks him did he has business with the headmaster. Wayne tells her yes as he has taken a leave from school. Sophie asks him what happened is he sick. Wayne says no he just had some business and he need to go on a trip to take care of it. Sophie asks him how long will he be gone for Wayne says it's not exactly clear. Then Sophie asks Wayne can she comes along with Wayne him. Wayne is surprised hearing this and Sophie tells him she wanted to repay him as he has done a lot for her. Wayne tells her I know but he doesn't know how long will he be gone for. If takes a long time then she might have to neglect her studies for quite some time. Sophie says she don't mind as she thinks she would learn more from just being around him than in a classroom. Then he will be counting on her and they shake hands on it. They both comes into Paula's office and Wayne tells him that Sophie would also like to join him on his trip. Paula starts smiling and tells Wayne that quite a catch. Wayne tells him it's not like that. They comes out of his room and Sophie starts blushing. She asks Wayne he hasn't told her yet where are they going. He tells her first they are going to the port town of Nelhida. Wayne thinks that's where the great water spirit would be and wonders how it will go. Kijin is waiting for Wayne outside the academy she sees Sophie. Wayne tells her that he ended up bringing Sophie along as well. Kijin says as Wayne wishes and Sophie tell her she will be in her care. Kijin says likewise. Then the salamander comes out and says he will be in charge of guiding them. Sophie is shocked to see a talking monster. Wayne starts laughing and tells Sophie he hasn't told her yet. Then the scene shifts to Wayne's office where he shows Dayan and Shazuka the salamander. Wayne tells them the reason he gathered them here so to get them in contact with other spirits apart from the fire one. Shazuka says isn't this little the only one who can find them? Wayne tells him there is a way they can find them. Salamander fires a few fireballs and Wayne tells them these furballs that contain some of his power. So they should be able to guide them where the other spirits are. Dane finds these furballs really fascinating. Wayne tells them they will split up and head towards a different spirit each. Kijin and him will head to the port town in Elhida to meet the water spirit. Suzaku and Dain will use the fire spirit to find the earth spirit in Suzona Mountains. Likewise, Taunda and Bako will head to Kuwal Fost to find the wind spirit. Tuda gets irritated. Wayne tells him he will be counting on him. Bayako asks Wayne what will they do if the spirits are also sealed like Salamander. Wayne says then he would like them to undo the seal, protect the spirit, and bring it back here safely. After assigning everyone their work, they all head out. The scene shifts back to the carriage where Sophie finally gets that this little guy is not a monster but is a spirit. Sophie says it's so well behaved and still got sealed and she is curious why he got sealed. Wayne says it seemed well behaved but it must have done something bad to deserve such treatment. Salamander that is not true at all. Wayne tells the spirit did lose his memory and then attacked him right away after getting released. Sophie tells Wayne she can't imagine it wouldn't be scary getting attacked by something so small. Wayne starts laughing as Spirit tells him it would never again him again so forgive him. Wayne tells him he won't abandon him even if he did something bad as he is the one who released his seal after all. 
Spirit finds this really touching and started crying. Sophie starts laughing seeing the spirit happy, and also Wayne is quite good dealing with problem children. Sophie contemplate about what Wayne said about problem children. The scene moves to Biako and Tuta riding the horse in the middle of the desert. As Biako sneezes Tuta ask him did he get a cold he says no someone must be thinking about him hearing this Tuta gets irritated as it was getting late for Wayne's team so stopped by a city to sleep at an inn. It takes four days to get to Nelhuda by carriage and lucky for them there are quite a lot of inns comes on their way so they can travel leisurely. Sophie is really happy as it's her first time eating on a trip with her friends she finds it really refreshing. She gets defensive and tells Wayne it's like she wanted to go on a trip with them as she will try her best to help him out. Wayne tells her she doesn't have to be so straight-laced as he is enjoying the trip as well. Kijin says it's more lively with Sophie with them and also she wanted to eat a meal with her for a long time. Sophie starts smiling as she thanks them both. Suddenly a guy loudly opens the door and sits on the table next to Wayne's and asks the waiter to bring his usual. Either people started talking as he is the guy from the mayor's and he thinks himself some big shot. He sees Sophie and Kijin and calls them and tells them why not ditch that dull guy and come eat with him. Wayne doesn't care about him at all and kept eating his food. But Kijin gives him the dead look and the guy gets scared and thought to himself he can't lose he have to confident here. He comes in front of Kijin and tells her what's up with her attitude does she know who he is. He is the son of the mayor here. Sophie tells him well in that case he should be the one fixing his attitude. He asks he why should he, Sophie shows him the crest and asks him does he recognize this The guy runs out of the inn in a second. Sophie says what was that Wayne tells her this kind of things often happens here. After three days later they arrive the Nalhida and Wayne ask the spirit where does he feel the spirit's presence. He tells them from over there. Wayne tells them let's go check it out. They comes here and sees a statue. Salamander tells them that of the statue of Saloon, the goddess of the sea. Wayne checks it out and says it's pretty weathered though. Well it was quite a long trip just to end up here and think not many would come here all the way just to pray here. Wayne asks the salamander is this is the place where the water spirit is sealed. He tells Wayne he can faintly feel her presence but he thinks it's that way. That way is the sea well it wouldn't be strange for water spirit to be sealed under the sea. But Wayne thinks why spirit presence is still only faint as Wayne can sense that the statue is covered with a thin layer of mana some sort of spell must have been cast on it. Wayne uses his jutsu places hand on the statue and breaks the layer of mana, and the statue starts shining, and a girl which seems to be the spirit of water appears and tells Wayne nice to meet him. Wayne asks her who is she and also where are they. She tells him that she is the goddess of the sea saloon, and this is a special dimension where they can hold their true forms. Wayne gets surprised to see this. Wayne says she does resemble the statue. She asks Wayne does he not believe him when he does. Wayne tells her then he must speak formally with a goddess. She says speaking naturally is fine for her. Wayne asks her why did she appear in front of him as he is not a religious person. She tells him she finds him amusing as it's her first time seeing a youth like him mixed with a soul from another world and using the power that's opposite of magic. Wayne thinks she can see a lot he tells her what she is hoping to achieve by showing herself to him. She tells him nothing much as she just wanted to say hi to him. She tells Wayne he is burdened with a tremendous duty and she is dured they will get a chance to meet again. What tells her what is she talking about? She says that's not something she will tell him as it's only for gods to know. Wayne says guess it can't be helped then. As has no idea what's waiting for him he will just have to try his best. She tells him she has activate the spell cast on the statue which will help him finding what he seeks. Wayne thanks her. She says if didn't have done that then he would have completely erased that spell. She tells him they have runs out of time and says her goodbye to him. Wayne comes in front of the statue. Sophie says what's wrong he says nothing and says let's try it out. He uses the spell and creates a passage under the sea which has mansion under the sea. They all are surprised to see this. Sophie says if the spell will be activated by touch then it would have been famous by now. Wayne tells her he used his Anyu Jutsu to activate the spell Sophie finds Anyu Jutsu really convenient. Wayne tells them that it looks like temple under the bottom of the sea. Salamander says he can feel the water spirit ahead of them. They move forward and Wayne thinks finally he is going to meet the water spirit and he might be able to shed light on some mysteries. Outside back at the statue a guy is there and sees that there really is a spell casted on this statue and says he should hurry up and do his job. Back inside the Ted Wayne finds something. A mermaid chained up inside a crystal. Salamander says she is the water spirit. Now they have found the spirit Wayne says let's start releasing the seal. Salamander say this seal cannot be broken half heartly. Sophie tells Wayne she also agree as they need first order magic to break the seal. 
Wayne says if it's the same as with the salamander then it should be easy for him. Cajun tells Wayne to be careful as they don't know if it will attack them as soon as it is released. Wayne puts his hand on the chains and breaks them easily instantly. And she falls into Wayne's arms. Sophie didn't like that at all and gets jealous. Salamander couldn't believe Warwick he just saw and asked Wayne who is he. Wayne tells him he is just an average exorcist. Kijin says he is the strongest exorcist. Wayne says okay. Spirit wakes up and asks Wayne who is he. Salamander greets her and tells her she is released from her seal and this guy helped him out. She tells Salamander then he is the one who brought these people here. That guy comes from behind and tells them good job as he would have never thought you guys would be so kind to release the seal for him. They all get ready to attack. Wayne tells them to stand back and leave it to him. Spirit asks Salamander did he also bring him here. He says no. He tells Undyne to let him deal with him. She says okay as she just got released and her memories are still a little hazy. Wayne thinks he didn't notice him at all as this guy is much stealthier than the other magician that showed up in Culbert. Wayne asks him who is he. He tells him he can call him a villain and if Wayne hand over the spirit, he will at least spare his life. And he sees the lizard spirit too and tells Wayne that he hands them both of these spirits he will pretend he never met them. Wayne says allow me to offer you a counter proposal. Wayne says tell me about your organization and piss off. He tells Wayne you might not be able to tell the difference between their powers so tells Wayne he might end up dying if he is too cocky and tells Wayne there's no going back and takes out his sword and charges towards Wayne. Spirit thinks Wayne might get hurt as he doesn't seem strong. Salamander tells her Wayne is stronger than him so don't worry. Wayne easily blocks his attacks with his sword. He gets surprised and asks him who is he as he doesn't have any mana and yet can use magic. Wayne tells him this isn't magic it's called Anyu Jutsu. He doesn't understand Wayne. Wayne says okay let him show you the power of Anyu Jutsu. The guy thinks he needs to get a little serious too and create five clones of himself. Sophie is shocked to see this as he did this without a chant and looks really strong magician too. Wayne tells him does he really think such child's play would work on him. He tells Wayne then show him that it doesn't and charges towards Wayne and attacks him, but blocks his attack easily and comes behind the real one and cuts him, but it wasn't the real one. Kijin is shocked to see that Wayne was wrong. Wayne tells him he is quite devious as he wasn't wrong when he was about to cut it and he changed places with a clone, which means he can use his copies as scapegoats. Guy tells him that is correct and says just because you understand his technique it doesn't mean he can deal with him. He comes behind Wayne and was about to cut him. Wayne quickly blocks him attack, then the villain again attacks Wayne but he still easily dodges them. Villain thinks he is really strong, then uses all his clone and fire spell at Wayne. He easily dodges his attacks and says it's about time to finish this. Villain says his bluff won't work on him. Suddenly he feels chills. Wayne comes down and tells him let me show you whether it's a bluff or not. Villain calms himself down his Anyu Jutsu, must be defensive technique as he has not attacked him yet as he must be planning to escape by bluffing to buy some time. Wayne tells him to keep using his clones or otherwise it won't be any fun. Wayne gets ready to attack him and instantly cuts through him. Villain couldn't believe what just happened. Wayne tells him if he is going to change places with his clones, then he will just attack all of his clones at the same time and ask him what does he think about Anyu Jutsu. Sophie thinks Wayne easily overwhelmed that magician just how strong does Wayne really is Kijin thinks Wayne has gotten really strong as he is regaining his powers at a terrifying pace. Water Spirit is shocked to see this and says how can a human be this powerful? Salamander tells her he doesn't know so they shouldn't get on his bad side ever. Villain tells Wayne he wasn't serious till the very end. Wayne tells him this would have easier to him to understand this way the difference in their powers. Wayne asks him to tell him about his organization and what are they after. He tells him he is not going to tell him anything and takes out a blue ball and vanishes in front of them. They get surprised as Wayne let him get away. In the aftermath of Wayne's swift resolution of the intruder's threat, his attention shifted gracefully toward the enigmatic water spirit. With genuine curiosity, Wayne probed into the reasons behind her prolonged confinement. Her response echoed a disconcerting refrain, akin to the salamander's amnesia, leaving Wayne with more questions than answers. Meanwhile, Sophie, the ever-contemplative presence in their group, began to ponder the abundance of mysteries that shrouded their quest. She couldn't help but speculate that the reunion of the four great spirits might hold the elusive key to unlocking the labyrinthine depths of their forgotten memories. Kijin, their trusted and mystical companion, arrived bearing significant news. She revealed that their fellow Shikigamis had triumphantly secured the spirits, a feat that encompassed the successful dismantling of their restraining seals. Eager for any glimmer of hope regarding their lost memories, Wayne inquired if any clues had surfaced. 
Regrettably, the spirits remain trapped in the enigma of their pasts. To further perplex matters, similar peculiar magicians had targeted other Shikigamas, mirroring the encounters of their group. Wayne, with his characteristic empathy and wisdom, emphasized the paramount importance of preserving the spirit's autonomy and well-being. He implored Kijin to convey this message to their fellow Shikigamas. This decision underscored Wayne's unwavering commitment to their safety and a profound respect for their autonomy. Salamander, intuitively seizing the opportune moment, posed a crucial question to Undyne, the water spirit. What were her plans for the future? Wayne couldn't help but appreciate the timeliness of Salamander's inquiry, given the precarious situation. Undyne, regrettably, seemed to be adrift in uncertainty. Without missing a beat, Salamander, brimming with unwavering determination, offered a suggestion. Wayne couldn't help but admire Salamander's proactive approach. The suggestion was clear. Undyne should join their group. Wayne, ever the diplomat, extended a warm invitation, leaving no doubt that she was free to accompany them should she choose to do so. With heartfelt gratitude, Undine accepted, sealing their newfound alliance with a firm handshake. Sophie, witnessing this harmonious resolution, couldn't contain her excitement. She voiced the question that loomed in everyone's mind. Did this turn of events mean that they had already achieved their ultimate goal? Wayne, in his reassuring manner, affirmed that indeed they had, Sophie couldn't help but be overjoyed, as the prospect of an earlier return home than anticipated filled her heart with elation. Kijin, her enthusiasm still ablaze, shared a tantalizing proposition with Wayne. Eagerly she broached the subject of the delectable seafood dishes rumored to be found in Nelhide. Her suggestion was clear, they should indulge in a culinary adventure while in the vicinity. Wayne, with a fond smile, readily accepted the proposal, their group now invigorated with a renewed sense of purpose. In a contrasting scene, a mysterious figure found refuge in the hushed sanctuary of a library. Thoughts raced as they contemplated their miraculous escape. Unbeknownst to them, a fellow individual approached, curiosity burning in their eyes. This interlocutor wasted no time in questioning the return of the cloaked figure and the outcome of their encounter with the spirit. With a heavy heart, the cloaked figure admitted to successfully breaking the seal but failing to apprehend their elusive target. When queried about their confrontation with the spirit, the figure clarified that their defeat did not come at the hands of the spirit itself, but rather the intervention of the formidable feudal Lord Granato. This revelation raised more questions than answers, as Nelhide was a considerable distance from their territory. Furthermore, the cloaked figure had played an instrumental role in unsealing the spirits. It became evident that the fire spirit had guided them to their present location, adding another layer of complexity to their mission. The figure acknowledged the awe-inspiring strength of feudal Lord Granato, deeming him a true monolith among mortals. Intrigued and perhaps wary of Wayne's growing reputation, the figure began to see him as a potential threat to their machinations. A revision of their plans was inevitable, with an unwavering resolve to protect their dreams from any interference. The narrative's focus shifted to Wayne's stately mansion, where all four spirits had convened. Despite their physical presence, the specter of forgotten memories still loomed. Wayne, the embodiment of patience and empathy, reassured them that there was no need for haste in recovering their lost histories. Nonetheless, Wayne couldn't shake the lingering sense of unease. He harbored a legitimate concern that those who sought the spirits might mount another assault on his haven. With unwavering determination, he promised Biako that he would remain their stalwart protector, a vigilant guardian against any potential return of the enigmatic magicians. Kijin arrived bearing an intriguing invitation. Wayne's inquisitiveness naturally led him to inquire about the nature of this summons. Kijin revealed that it was an invitation to a grand ball at the illustrious royal court. The following day saw Wayne diligently fulfilling his obligations as a feudal lord. His commitment extended beyond the confines of his estate, as he embarked on a journey throughout his domain. This first-hand experience allowed him to intimately connect with the lives of his subjects, gaining profound insights into their daily struggles and aspirations. During his rounds, Wayne stumbled upon an unusual sight, a crew of people patiently awaiting something outside a recently renowned establishment. His curiosity naturally got the better of him, prompting him to engage one of the eager patrons. The establishment in question turned out to be Ten Cows, a revelation that didn't escape Wayne's discerning gaze. He couldn't help but marvel at Sirius's unwavering efficiency and dedication to her craft. Wayne was eager to explore the specialty that had drawn such a crowd, Trickler Dango. Upon tasting it, Wayne was captivated by its delectable sweetness, convinced of its potential to find favor in this new world. 
Wayne's subjects, who had witnessed his dedication and transformative impact on the Granado frontier, approached him with heartfelt gratitude. They marveled at the flourishing prosperity brought about by his capable leadership and the invaluable assistance he had enlisted. In a gesture of appreciation, they extended an invitation to a forthcoming harvest festival. Wayne, with characteristic humility, graciously declined the offer due to prior commitments. Nevertheless, he promised to attend the next celebration, a testament to his genuine regard for his people. The scene transitioned to the resplendent confines of the Imperial Palace, where Wayne's name had become a topic of widespread conversation. Wayne surmised that his heroic rescue of Sophie had catapulted him into the limelight. Soon after, Sophie made a grand entrance, adorned in a breathtakingly beautiful dress. Wayne, deeply moved by her gesture, expressed his gratitude for the invitation. As he gazed upon her, an unspoken sentiment stirred within him. Sophie, taken aback by Wayne's unwavering kindness, inquired about the well-being of the spirits. Wayne's reassurance that one of his trusted subordinates was safeguarding them filled her with relief. Sophie was quick to acknowledge the spirit's elevated status, attributing it to Wayne's valiant rescue. As their connection deepened, Sophie felt an inexplicable warmth in her heart. Sophie, eager to share this moment with Wayne, proposed that they pay a visit to Highness Chloe together. Wayne, profoundly grateful for her company, readily accepted the offer. As they approached Highness Chloe, who was seated regally with her bodyguard, they exchanged warm greetings and introduced themselves. Sophie, ever inquisitive, directed her attention to Duke Brehilga, Highness Chloe's vigilant protector for the evening. Duke Brehilga elucidated that only individuals of unwavering trustworthiness were entrusted with the solemn duty of safeguarding the royal personage. As Wayne contemplated the unexpected presence of Matteo Brehilga, the current head of the illustrious Seven Nobles, he marveled at the incongruity of such a powerful mage serving as a bodyguard. The introduction of Wayne Granado, the current head of the Granado family, left an indelible impression on those present. In the midst of this exchange, the vigilant bodyguard couldn't help but ponder Wayne's unassuming appearance, contrasting it with the legendary feats attributed to him. A fleeting surge of apprehension coursed through Wayne, but it dissipated as swiftly as it had arisen. It was evident that the bodyguard's heightened vigilance stemmed from the inherent risks of his role. Highness Clo, seizing the opportunity, extended a gracious invitation to Wayne, an invitation to dance. Wayne, though momentarily taken aback, graciously accepted, setting the stage for a momentous turn in their evening. As they swayed gracefully on the dance floor, Wayne couldn't help but inquire about the reason behind the princess's invitation to dance. Her response filled him with both surprise and honor. She confessed that he had caught her eye from the moment they met. Wayne's heart warmed at her words. Drawing closer, she whispered in his ear, inviting him to the Alsteras Royal Library the following evening. She hinted at having something important to share, and Wayne readily accepted the invitation, promising to be there. Their conversation concluded with her suggestion that they return to enjoying their dance. Matteo, a keen observer, found the princess's uncommon display of interest in Wayne quite intriguing. It was a rarity for the princess to invite someone to dance. Curiosity piqued, Matteo turned to Sophie for insights into Wayne's character. Sophie revealed that Wayne possessed a unique power, distinct from traditional magic, known as Onyujutsu. Matteo, unfamiliar with this concept, expressed a strong desire to witness it. Sophie assured him that Wayne would be willing to demonstrate. With a smirk, Matteo proposed that they have Wayne showcase his abilities right then and there. However, before their plan could unfold, the hall plunged into darkness, shattering the revelry. A monstrous wolf burst through a window, launching a sudden attack. Wayne's protected instincts kicked in as he positioned himself as a shield for the princess. The ferocious creature leaped at Wayne, jaws menacingly agape. In a swift and skillful display, Wayne cast a spell that incapacitated the beast in an instant. Matteo, utilizing his magical abilities, restored light to the room, revealing Wayne's astonishing prowess. The astonished guests watched in disbelief as Wayne dispatched the creature with a single blow. Matteo rushed over to express his gratitude for Wayne's swift actions in protecting the princess. The princess, deeply appreciative, acknowledged Wayne's strength, confirming that he had indeed lived up to her expectations. Wayne couldn't help but wonder whether she had learned about his abilities through rumors. Meanwhile, Matteo found himself taken aback by Wayne's extraordinary skill in dispatching the Shadow Wolf. It was clear that Wayne possessed far more power than Matteo had initially assumed. As Wayne questioned the sudden appearance of the monster within the palace, suspecting foul play due to the perfectly timed extinguishing of the lights, Matteo took charge, 
ensuring the princess's safety and pledging to investigate the matter. With the appearance of the monster, the grand ball came to an abrupt end. The following day, Wayne made his way to the royal palace to meet the princess. She emerged from her room and beckoned Wayne to follow her, leading him to a hidden place within the palace, known to only a select few. She assured him that there was no cause for concern, given her status as the princess. Wayne couldn't help but question the purpose behind her invitation, prompting her to reveal her unique ability to glimpse into the futures of other people. Wayne was genuinely surprised by this revelation and sought further clarification. She explained that her eyes possessed the rare ability to perceive fragments of the near future, and she had indeed glimpsed Wayne in one of these visions. Eager to learn more, Wayne pressed for details, and she described a vision of Alstera's destruction by a colossal dragon, with Wayne standing alone in a heroic battle against it. Wayne inquired about the unfolding of this ominous scene, but she admitted her limited understanding, as her visions offered only fragmented glimpses. Turning to a historical tone, she recounted the tale of a dragon that had nearly decimated the kingdom long ago. The kingdom had been saved by an enigmatic figure known as the Awakened One, who had engaged the dragon in a battle of epic proportions and sealed it deep beneath the capital. This historical account had been carefully guarded and passed down within the royal family for generations. Wayne was intrigued by the secrecy surrounding this knowledge, prompting her to explain that it was intended to deter anyone from attempting to undo the dragon's seal. However, her vision hinted at the possibility that the seal had been broken. As Wayne pieced the puzzle together, he pointed to a depiction in the book that bore a striking resemblance to the four great spirits. She confirmed his observation and inquired about how he knew of them. Wayne recounted recent events involving the spirits and their safeguarding within his home. This revelation relieved her as she explained that all four great spirits were needed to undo the dragon's seal. Wayne's suspicions deepened as he considered the involvement of an organization plotting to overthrow the royal family. He questioned whether the seven nobles were aware of the dragon's existence, to which she replied that only the royal family was privy to this knowledge. This revelation hinted at the possibility of a traitor within the royal family leaking information. She acknowledged that Wayne was the first outsider to be entrusted with her precognition ability. Wayne expressed concern about the gravity of her disclosure, but she reassured him, emphasizing that anyone who faced the dragon could not be considered their enemy. She had prepared herself for this moment. She then made a heartfelt request for Wayne to save Alstera and promised him any reward he desired. Wayne, however, humbly declined any reward, expressing his satisfaction in celebrating her recent birthday and considering the salvation of Alstera a heartfelt gift to her. Her smile radiated gratitude for his romantic sentiment. Playfully, Wayne adopted a charismatic demeanor, highlighting the appeal of having a ruler like her. She found Wayne's intriguing persona captivating. Wayne posed a final question about the malleability of her visions of the future. She revealed that the future could indeed change, but only if she actively attempted to alter it. Wayne assured her that he understood and pledged to do his utmost to change the foreseen tragic future using his Anyu Jutsu. With their conversation concluded, Wayne departed for his carriage, reflecting on the weighty responsibility bestowed upon him. He recognized this as the duty the goddess of the sea had alluded to. Determined to protect his homeland, he vowed never to allow anyone to wreak havoc within its borders. Although he remained uncertain about the identity of the enemy, he now understood their intentions and could begin devising countermeasures. The narrative then shifted to a palace where a group of individuals gathered around a table. They declared that it was time to act, revealing their secret plan to consist of only the most formidable magicians. Fortune had smiled upon them, for the four great spirits were currently housed within the Granado mansion, a fact unbeknownst to Rolo Vistov and Wayne Granato. Doubts arose about Wayne's strength, leading to speculations that CD might be weak. However, Matteo cautioned against underestimating Wayne, drawing from his own first-hand experience of Wayne's overwhelming power. The group contemplated their mission to overthrow Alstera, believing that if everything went according to plan, the nation could crumble without the need to confront any powerful adversaries. All eyes turned to a girl named Eleanor, as they prepared for the attack on Wayne's mansion and the birth of their ideal nation. In the serene Culbut village, nestled amidst rolling fields and lush greenery, a humble farmer embarked on his usual routine. The golden sun cast long shadows as he wandered through his fields, tending to his crops. However, this idyllic scene was soon disrupted by a puzzling and disconcerting sight, a grove of trees that had inexplicably withered and wilted. Their once vibrant leaves now hung limply, a stark contrast to the lively foliage that surrounded them. 
He scratched his head, utterly befuddled by this enigma that defied the laws of nature. Something was undeniably amiss, and the farmer couldn't fathom what had caused this unsettling phenomenon. Worry gnawed at his heart as he recognized the potential gravity of the situation. With a deep sense of responsibility and concern for his fellow villagers, he abruptly abandoned his work, breaking into a worried sprint towards the heart of Kolba village. His mission was clear, he needed to relay this strange and troubling occurrence to his fellow villagers. As he made his way back, he couldn't shake the eerie feeling that dark magic might be at play here. Meanwhile, within the hallowed halls of an academy, a young man named Wayne found himself in deep contemplation. His footsteps echoed through the quiet corridor as he mulled over grave matter. Princess Chloe, a figure of great importance and foresight, had shared her vision with him. It painted a grim picture, the imminent revival of a colossal dragon, a dire threat that Wayne was determined to thwart. His resolve to prevent this cataclysmic event was unwavering, yet he also grappled with the weighty responsibility of minimizing the potential devastation should the dragon rise. Seeking guidance and clarity, Wayne made his way to the office of the Academy's principal. He sensed that the matter at hand was of utmost importance and required their undivided attention. With a polite but firm knock, he entered the office and took a seat, ready to share the weighty burden he carried. Wayne began by recounting the entirety of what he had learned, the tale of the dragon, the enigmatic spirits, and the existence of the awakened ones. His inquiries were earnest, his eyes searching the principal's face for any flicker of recognition or understanding. He wanted to know if the principal possessed any knowledge or insight into these perplexing matters. The principal, a figure of wisdom and authority, listened attentively to Wayne's account. He was well aware of Wayne's exceptional abilities, surpassing even most of the academy's esteemed instructors, yet the principal cautioned Wayne, acknowledging the prodigy's youth. He gently suggested that Wayne might lean on the wisdom of his elders, a subtle nod to the idea that the burden he carried was too great for one so young. Wayne, grateful for the advice and acknowledgement of his strength, responded with a gracious nod. However, he was unwavering in his determination to confront this ominous threat head-on. His eyes met the principal's, conveying his unwavering resolve. The corner of the principal's mouth curled into a knowing smile, an acknowledgement of Wayne's indomitable spirit assuring him that if this was the path he had chosen, then he trusted in Wayne's ability to carry the weight of responsibility. As Wayne made his exit, he could feel the support and confidence of his mentor. Outside the principal's office, Wayne couldn't help but reflect on the mysterious events unfolding around him. The revival of a giant dragon and the existence of the Awakened Ones weighed heavily on his mind. As he continued his solitary journey through the Academy's corridors, in the midst of his contemplation, he was pleasantly interrupted by the sight of a familiar face. Sophie, a friendly and cheerful presence in Wayne's life, greeted him warmly. Their exchange was marked by genuine smiles and a sense of camaraderie. Sophie had news to share, news that would soon intersect with Wayne's path. With a sparkle of excitement in her eyes, Sophie divulged that Duke Brayhilga, a notable figure in their world, had taken a keen interest in Wayne. This interest had manifested in a rather unconventional invitation a request for a sparing match. The Duke had specifically expressed his desire to test his mettle against Wayne. Sophie's question hung in the air, inquiring if Wayne had the time to accept such a rare and prestigious opportunity. Wayne's response was immediate and filled with eagerness. He could hardly contain his enthusiasm at the prospect of facing a formidable opponent like Duke Brayhilga. It was an opportunity that promised not only to test his skills, but also to provide valuable insights. Yet beneath the surface of Wayne's excitement lurked a sense of suspicion. The circumstances surrounding the Duke's invitation seemed unusual, prompting Wayne to wonder if there was more to this match than met the eye. Nevertheless, he accepted the invitation, confident that he would glean valuable information during their encounter. Meanwhile, back in Culbert Village, a different kind of drama was unfolding. Deep within the village, hidden from the eyes of its residents, a group of extraordinary beings lay in slumber. These were the spirits, guardians of an ancient and mystical tradition. Gakko, one of the spiritual sentinels, kept a watchful eye over his resting comrades. However, the peace within the village was shattered when Suzako, another spirit, sought an audience with Biako. The urgency in Suzako's voice was evident as he expressed concern over a distressing development, the sudden withering of trees in the nearby forest. The villagers, too, had begun to feel the disquiet, their unease palpable. Suzaka made it clear that he intended to investigate this anomaly, driven by a sense of duty to protect the land and its people. Additionally, he offered to keep Tuda, a powerful but unpredictable entity, 
in check should the creature run amok during his absence. Viaco granted his permission with a nod, a silent affirmation of trust in his comrade's capabilities. As the two spirits conversed, a sudden outburst from Salamander, another member of their celestial kin, seized their attention. Salamander's revelation sent shockwaves through their collective consciousness as it unveiled a long-forgotten truth. Salamander's memory had been rekindled, and he urgently shared the reason behind their ancient ceiling. In a bygone era, a colossal dragon had descended upon their land, bringing forth untold devastation. The very existence of their world had hung in the balance as the dragon threatened to annihilate everything in its path. In that darkest of hours, a lone spirit user had emerged, wielding powers that transcended the ordinary. They had awakened their true potential, rallying the spirits together for a fierce and protracted battle against the draconic menace. After a grueling struggle, they had succeeded in sealing the mighty beast deep beneath the Earth's surface. However, victory had come at a price. The dragon's malevolent miasma, a noxious force of corruption, had continued to seep from its prison, tainting the land and draining the vitality of all living things. In response, the spirits had chosen to make a profound sacrifice. They had volunteered to contain this insidious miasma, standing as the bulwark between the dragon's malevolence and the people they protected. Viako and Suzako, oblivious to the existence of the giant dragon until now, pressed Salamander for further details. Salamander elaborated on the ancient cataclysm, painting a vivid picture of the heroism displayed by their predecessor, the spirit user who had faced the colossal dragon. Their sacrifice and that of the spirits had safeguarded the land for generations. Viako's conclusion was swift and resolute. The seal that had imprisoned the dragon must have been breached, leading to the wilting trees near Culbut village. Suzako, ever thoughtful, expressed his sympathy for the spirits, acknowledging the tremendous and enduring sacrifice they had made for the people. However, the spirits recognized the need for a collective decision and resolved to seek Wayne's counsel before taking any further action. After all, Wayne's unique perspective and abilities might provide a different perspective on the matter. Yet, as they grappled with the weighty revelation of the dragon's existence and the peril it posed, the tranquility of Culbut village was shattered by a dire threat. An ominous horde of hostile creatures descended upon the village, their malevolent presence unmistakable. Within moments, chaos erupted as the village gatekeeper sounded the alarm, ringing the ominous bell that had long stood sentinel. Panic coursed through the villagers as they beheld the approaching onslaught of monsters. Their homes and lives were under siege, and fear gripped their hearts. Amidst the turmoil, an enigmatic figure stood poised for action. Tauda, a formidable guardian of the village, had observed the unfolding chaos from his vantage point high atop a tree. With a sense of purpose and a warrior's resolve, he descended to confront the encroaching assailants. Tauda's arrival was met with hostile disdain by the silver-haired leader of the intruders. This enigmatic figure, with an air of malevolence, dismissed Tuda as the mere guardian of Culbut village. Tauda? undaunted and seemingly relishing the prospect of battle, taunted the intruders, goading them into confronting him head-on. The silver-haired leader, displeased by Tauda's defiance, issued a chilling command to his subordinates. He ordered them to eliminate the guardian who dared to challenge their invasion. The stage was set for a clash of titanic proportions. Meanwhile, a watchful presence observed the unfolding events from the shadows. Sidi, a perceptive and astute onlooker, noted Wayne's conspicuous absence from the village's defense. His thoughts churned as he contemplated the strength of Wayne's subordinates, who appeared to be rising to the occasion in the face of adversity. In the grandeur of the Duke's mansion, Wayne stood prepared for a most unexpected challenge. The Duke Matteo had extended an invitation for a sparing match, a request that carried a weight of intrigue and potential danger. Wayne's arrival had been met with enthusiasm, and he found himself poised on the precipice of a showdown, as they readied themselves for the impending match, Wayne and Matteo exchanged pleasantries, their camaraderie tinged with a competitive edge. The rules of engagement were established with clarity. They would wield wooden swords, and both magic and Anyu Jutsu were permitted. However, the cardinal rule was that their strikes should not be fatal. It was not a battle to the death, but a test of skill and resolve. The match commenced, marked by the resounding clash of wooden blades. Wayne and Matteo faced each other with unwavering determination, Locked in a fierce dance of combat, Wayne's swift and precise movements allowed him to parry Duke Matteo's strikes with grace, showcasing his formidable skills. As the battle unfolded, Wayne couldn't help but observe the potency of Duke Matteo's magic. The Duke unleashed a formidable spell, conjuring flames imbued with the power of the wind. 
The scorching inferno hurtled toward Wayne, its intensity enough to incinerate anything in its path. With deft precision, Wayne raised a shield to intercept the searing assault. The wooden barrier quivered under the ferocity of the flames, and Wayne recognized the potency of Matteo's magic. While he was confident in his own abilities, he acknowledged the Duke's formidable prowess. Yet beneath the surface of their duel, Wayne sensed an unsettling undercurrent. The palpable bloodlust emanating from Matteo sent shivers down his spine. It was a troubling and unexpected development, and Wayne couldn't help but harbor suspicions about the Duke's true intentions. Duke contemplated the significance of this particular match, recognizing that it held minimal importance for Wayne. Nevertheless, it carried great weight for him due to its role in enabling his subordinates to complete their tasks in Colbert Village. Meanwhile, within the confines of Colbert Village, a young woman unleashed her undead minions upon the unsuspecting villagers. Panic swept through the village as several zombies approached the doorsteps of terrified residents. Amidst the chaos, Diane made a swift and decisive entrance, effortlessly dispatching the zombies in the blink of an eye. The villainous girl took offense at Diane's intervention, branding her a brat. Wayne's subordinates continued to arrive one by one, and as tension escalated, Dane's anger flared. She sternly confronted the girl, asserting her status as a mature woman, much to the villain's chagrin. Clearly irritated, the villain regarded Dane with disdain. Subsequently, Sivi and his partners stepped forward, only to be obstructed by Suzako. Suzako informed them that they could not proceed any further. However, Sidi deftly employed his magic, swiftly eluding Suzako's grasp. Suzako allowed him to pass, aware of Biako's presence within the mansion. Both Suzako and Diane brimmed with anticipation as they prepared to handle the impending situation. Amidst the tense standoff, the villains began to laugh, underestimating their adversary's strength compared to Diane and Suzako. Meanwhile, within the mansion, Biako confronted Sidi. Sidi remarked that he seemed to be the final obstacle, sensing no one stronger. Unfazed, Biako asserted that even though Sidi had come this far, defeating him would prove an insurmountable challenge. Sidi expressed his confidence and determination, believing that they would have the last laugh once their objectives were achieved. With resolve, Baako invited Sidi to engage him with all his might. Sidi drew his sword and charged forward, the scene shifting back to the Duke's mansion. In the midst of their confrontation, a sudden interruption shattered the tension. Kijin, Wayne's loyal companion and guardian, delivered an urgent message. The tranquility of Culbut Village had been ruptured, and a dire situation was unfolding. The village was under attack, and the spirits who resided there had risen to defend their sacred domain. Wayne's heart clenched with concern and a surge of protective instinct. Sophie, who had been observing the match with keen interest, sensed that something was amiss. Her intuition hinted at an unsettling aspect of the situation, although she couldn't quite put her finger on it. As Wayne urgently explained the crisis unfolding in Colbert Village, Sophie's concerns deepened. Yet Duke Matteo's response was far from accommodating. He seemed resolute in continuing their match, brushing off Wayne's concerns with an air of indifference. He knew that these attackers were drawn to the great spirits, entities of immense power and significance. Wayne's immediate instinct was to rush to their aid. He couldn't allow these malevolent forces to lay claim to the spirits. At the heart of this tumultuous battleground, a figure with silver hair steps forth, his intentions obscured in enigma. He approaches Toda, a formidable warrior, with solemn resolve. There will be no quarter given, no restraint held back. He implores Toda to unleash his full might from the very beginning, aware that hesitation could spell swift defeat. Toda, ever the valiant warrior, accepts this challenge with palpable excitement. He responds that his adversary must prepare to do the same, for any lapse in this duel could lead to a swift and dramatic conclusion. An electric tension permeates the air as anticipation builds. With a flourish that could befit a magician, the silver-haired warrior conjures an aura of golden lightning, a shimmering prologue to the impending clash, and he utters a chilling proclamation. This day shall witness the culmination of Toda's existence, his words heavy with eerie gravitas. Bolts of yellow lightning crackle and dance around the silver-haired figure as he charges toward Toda with the deadly precision of a poised dagger. Caught off guard by this sudden and audacious assault, Toda finds himself momentarily stunned, the shock of the moment rendering him temporarily paralyzed. In a twist of fate, it seems the silver-haired warrior passes right through Toda, a malevolent grin gracing his lips as he ominously declares, it's over. Toda's survival instincts surge to the forefront, compelling him to react with lightning-quick reflexes. Narrowly evading what could have been a fatal strike, 
his senses snap into focus with adrenaline-fueled precision. Confounded by the cryptic declaration of his assailant, Toda regains his footing and swiftly dodges subsequent attacks with remarkable agility and finesse. The battle takes on an increasingly surreal quality as Toda's uncanny ability to match the blinding speed of his enigmatic adversary becomes evident. The silver-haired figure, as well as those who bear witness to the spectacle, are left in awe as Toda's prowess defies the bounds of the conceivable. In a moment of audacity, Toda reveals a startling truth. He is but marginally faster than the ferocious monsters that populate their world. Irony drips from his words as he emphasizes that his adversary gravely underestimates his true potential. In the wake of this revelation, the silver-haired warrior channels a surge of raw fury, unlocking untapped reservoirs of power. Nevertheless, Toda remains unimpressed, his steadfast conviction unshaken. He reminds his opponent of his earlier counsel, to go all out from the very beginning. With resolute determination, the silver-haired warrior launches a headlong charge, dedicating the full might of his being to a slashing attack. Yet Toda's movements transcend the boundaries of ordinary mortals. His litheness allows him to sidestep the onslaught with the grace of a seasoned dancer. With a flourish that defies imagination, Toda counters with a swift and calculated kick to the assailant's back, sending him sprawling to the ground. The conflict, it seems, has left today earning for a challenge worthy of his skills, for this one-sided affair pales in comparison to the exhilarating duel he had envisioned. Meanwhile, in another corner of this strife-ridden world, a malevolent villainess weaves her own tale of chaos and discord. Her malevolence knows no bounds as she empowers her legion of zombies, infusing them with newfound strength. Suzaku, in particular, grapples with the grim realization that her undead minions have become more formidable than ever. The villainess taunts her adversaries, casting doubt upon the longevity of their tough facades. In a sudden and electrifying twist, a yellow-haired villain enters the fray, launching a blistering assault on both Suzaku and Dane. He berates them, claiming that it is impossible for them to contend with him while simultaneously confronting the relentless onslaught of zombies. His words drip with contempt as he vows to make them rue the day they look down upon him and his malevolent forces. Faced with this dual threat, Suzaku and Dane, wise in the ways of combat, swiftly devise a strategic division of roles. Suzaku takes to the skies, unfurling majestic wings that astonish both allies and adversaries alike. With a graceful ascent, Suzaku surveys the horde of zombies below, their sheer numbers posing a formidable challenge. Suzaku invokes a spell known as the Wing Sling, a mesmerizing spectacle that culminates in a devastating whirlwind. In a breathtaking display of aerial mastery, he obliterates the zombies in a single cataclysmic sweep. The villainess can only watch in shock and disbelief as her once formidable minions crumble into dust before her very eyes. Meanwhile, on the battleground, Dane embarks on her own journey of transformation and empowerment. Her adversary, the yellow-haired villain, wields twin blades with an ominous reputation. The yellow-haired assailant nearly lands a deadly strike with his blades. However, Dane's agility and unwavering resolve empower her to deftly evade the attacks. Fed up with being underestimated, Dane issues a challenge, demanding that her opponent cease treating her like a child. In a dazzling and radiant metamorphosis, Dane emerges as a more alluring, mature, and empowered version of herself. Both villains find themselves taken aback by the sheer majesty of her transformation. The yellow-haired assailant, seemingly undeterred by her newfound appearance, charges forward, convinced that Dane's altered visage is inconsequential to their battle. However, Dane's movements defy the expectations of all who behold her. With grace and precision, she effortlessly sidesteps the yellow-haired assailant's lethal strikes. Her retaliation is swift and unforgiving as she delivers a resounding punch that resonates like thunder, dragging home the message that her newfound strength is every bit as formidable as her beauty. The villainess, having witnessed the tide of battle turning against her, surrenders to Suzaku and Dane. She implores them for forgiveness, her demeanor veering from menace to vulnerability. Suzaku and Dane, their hearts momentarily softened by the unexpected turn of events, deliberate her fate. However, the villainess's persistent mockery and disdainful remarks ultimately sway their decision. With a conviction that borders on the unconventional, they opt for a most unusual form of punishment, a tickling torment. The once menacing villainess descends into tearful pleas for mercy, her stoicism shattered by this unorthodox and unexpected ordeal. Meanwhile, in yet another corner of this convoluted narrative tapestry, Sidi faces a dire predicament. 
In a fateful encounter, he crosses paths with Biaku, a foe whose strength far surpasses his own. Biaku, exuding an aura of indomitable power, delivers a chilling ultimatum to Sidi, warning him that surrender is his only path to salvation. Yet Sidi, driven by an unyielding resolve and a belief in a higher purpose, remains steadfast. Ignoring Biaku's ominous counsel, he launches an audacious assault, propelled by a fervent determination to buy time for a mysterious ally whose arrival hangs in the balance. Biaku's supremacy in combat is unassailable, his mastery of his craft absolute. With dispassionate precision, he discerns the nature of Sidi's shadowy clone technique, a secret divulged by none other than Wayne. Biaku easily intercepts Sidi's attacks, thwarting his every maneuver with casual ease. He dismisses Sidi's efforts as futile, a mere distraction in the grand scheme of their unfolding conflict. Panic takes root in Sidi's heart as he grapples with the stark reality that victory may elude him, as the spirits, ethereal witnesses to the unfolding events, look on with bated breath. The narrative takes a dramatic turn. Eleanor, the mysterious ally upon whom Sidi had pinned his hopes, materializes within the hallowed halls of the mansion. Her arrival shatters the arcane barrier guarding the spirit's chamber, and with a radiant display of magic, she ensnares the spirits within a luminous sphere of mana. Biaku, ever vigilant, senses the intrusion within the mansion and swiftly materializes within its confines. Sidi, too, acts with haste, teleported by the conviction that Eleanor has fulfilled her crucial role in their audacious plan. Within the chamber, Sidi witnesses the spirit's capture, his heart quickening with a fervor of hope. Before Biaku can reach Eleanor, she vanishes, her ethereal form eluding his grasp. The spirits, now shielded from harm, watch in ethereal silence as the confrontation between these enigmatic forces unfolds. Simultaneously, within the shadowy recesses of the Duke's mansion, and she harbors a growing sense of unease, Matteo regards Sophie with a cryptic smile, echoing her curiosity regarding Wayne's motives. Unbeknownst to Sophie, she stands on the precipice of a revelation that will cast an even darker shadow over her understanding of the world. In a stunning turn of events, Sidi materializes within the mansion's dimly lit corridors, bearing with him the ethereal presence of the spirits. Sophie's astonishment knows no bounds as she beholds Sidi's unexpected presence and the accompanying spirits. In that moment, connecting the dots that lead her to Matteo, recognizing him as the puppeteer orchestrating the grand tapestry of deception and treachery, she advances toward him with a determination fueled by the promise of revelation. Before Sophie can act upon her newfound revelations or expose the intricate web of deceit, she is confronted by a chilling and ruthless betrayal. Matteo, with a cold and remorseless demeanor, moves to confront Sophie, a gleaming blade poised with deadly intent. Sophie's world crumbles around her as the stark reality of her situation takes root, ensnaring her in a web of disbelief and despair. Matteo offered Sophie a heartfelt thanks for her invaluable assistance in distracting Wayne. However, he couldn't deny the somber reality that now, Sophie lay wounded on the ground, unable to be of further use to their cause. In a solemn tone, Matteo says now they will be able to make their ideal nation soon. In parallel within the very heart of the narrative, Wayne, the enigmatic and resourceful figure, employs the arcane pages of his tome to invoke a teleportation spell. In the blink of an eye, he finds himself transported to the village, where those who had assaulted them earlier are now captured. In the midst of turmoil and uncertainty, Wayne's inquiry pierced the air, his voice laden with concern as he sought information about the spirit's safety. Biaku, his voice tinged with regret, revealed the unsettling truth. The spirits had fallen victim to abduction. In a heart-wrenching revelation, he disclosed that two malevolent assailants had managed to escape with the spirits in their possession. Nevertheless, a glimmer of hope emerged as the rest of the spirits had been apprehended, providing a crucial lead in their ongoing quest. Amidst a whirlwind of emotions, Wayne pressed for the identity of the orchestrator behind these sinister events. With solemnity, Biaku uttered a name that sent shockwaves through the gathering, Matteo Bray Hilga. It seemed the elusive puppeteer, the enigmatic figure who had lurked in the shadows, was none other than the Duke himself. Wayne's sharp intellect connected the dots, tracing the intricate web of deceit and treachery that had ensnared him, culminating in the supposed spar match that had cleverly diverted his attention away from the village. Yet this revelation was but the tip of a colossal iceberg. Biaku, with a grave sense of purpose, imparted newfound knowledge regarding a looming and catastrophic threat, the legendary giant dragon. The spirits, it appeared, had been sealed away to suppress the malevolent miasma emanating from this monstrous entity. 
However, the maleficent tendrils of the dragon's miasma had now begun to seep into Kulba, leaving desolation in its wake. Wayne's mind raced as he absorbed the gravity of this revelation. The spirits in their selfless sacrifice had willingly endured their captivity to shield the world from the cataclysmic resurgence of the giant dragon. They had chosen to endure their captivity, yearning for a return to slumber, in order to avert the dragon's resurrection and the ensuing devastation it would bring. The complexity of their predicament weighed heavily on Wayne's heart, inspiring his resolve to act. With unwavering determination, Wayne proposed a daring and unconventional course of action to allow the giant dragon's revival to proceed. His audacious plan aimed not only to confront the colossal menace, but also to minimize the collateral damage to the capital and its inhabitants. This strategy would ensure that the four great spirits would remain unbound, preserving the delicate balance of their world. The prospect of this audacious mission ignited a spark of hope and excitement among those who had gathered. The notion of confronting the very root of evil, embodied by the giant dragon, resonated deeply with them. However, there was one dissenting voice in the assembly, the villainous figure who had precipitated chaos and strife. She vehemently protested Wayne's plan, deeming it preposterous and impossible. According to her, even a long-forgotten hero, praised and revered as the Awakened One, had only managed to seal the dragon at the cost of immense sacrifice and exertion. Her skepticism reverberated through the gathering, casting a shadow of doubt. Undeterred by her vehement objections, Wayne offered a bold retort, they simply needed to surpass the Awakened One's achievements. The air seemed to crackle with tension as he declared that nothing was beyond his reach, bolstered by the presence of the Twelve Heavenly General Shikigami. The villainous figure, unable to contain her fury, erupted in an indignant outburst, challenging Wayne's confidence. She declared it impossible to overcome the colossal might of the giant dragon, doubting their ability to prevail against such an ancient and formidable adversary. Dane, her patience tested, bristled with frustration at the villain's obstinacy. She declared that further punishment was in order, a stark reprisal for her stubborn resistance. The villain, now gripped by genuine fear, offered a desperate plea for mercy, her defiance crumbling before the prospect of further torment. Wayne couldn't help but wonder as the girl was gripped by an overwhelming fear. He couldn't fathom what had transpired between her and Dane, leaving her in such a state. Within the shadowed confines of the Duke's mansion, Sophie lay wounded and vulnerable, her consciousness fading. The treacherous dagger that had found its mark threatened to claim her life. In her darkest hour, a radiant savior emerged. Princess Chloe, cloaked in an aura of grace and benevolence, wielded the mystic arts of healing. Her magic enveloped Sophie, knitting wounds and restoring vitality. Sophie, her strength gradually returning, she questioned Princess Chloe's presence in this perilous moment. Princess Chloe replied with a promise to explain all in due course. She underscored the urgency of their shared mission to thwart the malevolent Duke Brehilga's nefarious plans and prevent the capital from descending into chaos. Sophie, her unwavering commitment as a knight unwavering, affirmed her dedication to this noble cause. Her pledge of allegiance was imbued with the unwavering determination to stand against the Duke's treachery, regardless of the odds stacked against them. Simultaneously, in a chamber shrouded in shadows and secrecy, Sidi bore witness to a scene of unfolding intrigue. Matteo, veiled in enigma and emboldened by a newfound sense of power, revealed the clandestine workings of his machinations. Eleanor emerged as a crucial instrument in Matteo's intricate plans. Her contribution, it seemed, had been instrumental in their quest to locate the source of the looming threat. Their journey through the shadowy labyrinth led them to a cryptic discovery, a sword embedded within a stone, a symbol of sealing and restraint. The presence of this ancient artifact served as a chilling reminder of the formidable entity imprisoned within. Matteo extended his hand toward the sword, his anticipation palpable, yet his attempt to make contact with it proved futile. The impenetrable barrier surrounding the weapon remained steadfast, a stark reminder that the formidable seal of the dragon was still firmly in place. Matteo stood poised to commence the ceremony that would ultimately unlock this ancient restraint. Yet despite their proximity to the precipice of releasing the dragon, Sophie and Princess Chloe materialized as unexpected obstacles. Matteo, his composure undisturbed by their sudden arrival, directed Sidi and Eleanor to intercept and neutralize the intruders. Sidi, burdened by his loyalty and a sense of duty, extended apologies to the ladies who had inadvertently crossed their path. With a heavy heart and grim resolve, he declared that their presence would culminate in a dire consequence, their demise. Sophie, despite acknowledging the immense strength of her adversaries, clung tenaciously to her identity as a knight. 
the prospect of retreat or surrender remained anathema to her steadfast character as she braced herself for the confrontation that lay ahead. Eleanor, with her silver hair flowing like a banner of determination, launched herself towards Sophie. In the blink of an eye, she vanished from Sophie's view, leaving her disoriented and bewildered. Sophie could only watch as her adversary reappeared behind her, a blur of motion and intent. With breathtaking swiftness, Eleanor struck at Sophie. Yet Sophie's instincts and training kicked in just in time. With a desperate, last-ditch effort, she managed to block Eleanor's attack, but the impact sent shockwaves through her body. Seedy, the ever-watchful observer, couldn't help but be impressed by Sophie's tenacity and skill. As he prepared to make his move against her, a fireball ignited the air. It soared towards Seedy with intent, conjured by none other than Princess Chloe. But Seedy was not one to be deterred. With a casual yet deadly grace, he cleaved through the fireball with a blade of water and continued his relentless charge toward the princess. Sophie, who had been holding her ground against Eleanor, now faced an impossible dilemma. She deflected Eleanor's knife and, in an instant, rushed to intercept Seedy's merciless assault on Princess Chloe. Sophie's movements were swift and her defense valiant. However, she was barely able to block Seedy's attack. Amid the chaos of this fierce battle, Sophie's voice rose above the din. With unwavering determination, she urged Princess Chloe to leave Eleanor and Seedy to her. Her gaze locked onto the princess, she implored her to hurry to the sealed dragon, the linchpin of their impending crisis. Princess Chloe, her heart filled with gratitude, nodded in agreement. She pledged to give her all to stop the resurrection of the dragon and thank Sophie for her valor. The princess's slender form darted away, racing towards the chamber where the ancient beast's power lay dormant. Seedy, now standing opposite Sophie, allowed a sly smile to play on his lips. He believed it to be an insurmountable challenge for Sophie to battle both him and Eleanor simultaneously. But Sophie, fueled by her unyielding loyalty to her cause, was undeterred. She stated her unwavering resolve, promising to do everything in her power to thwart their intentions. Eleanor and Seedy, despite being on opposing sides of this conflict, found themselves admiring Sophie's fierce determination. In a synchronized motion, they charged forward, closing in on her. Sophie, sensing the imminent threat, closed her eyes for a brief moment. She focused her inner energy, allowing her mana to surge. With newfound strength coursing through her veins, she moved with a swiftness and grace that surprised her adversaries. Eleanor and Seedy, their attacks honed to perfection, lunged at Sophie simultaneously. But to their astonishment, she deftly evaded their strikes, her movements fluid and precise. The two of them exchanged incredulous glances, silently acknowledging Sophie's newfound strength. As Sophie continued to battle both Eleanor and Seedy, she couldn't help but reflect on the pivotal role Wayne had played in her growth. His sparing sessions had pushed her beyond her limits, enhancing her combat abilities to unforeseen heights. With his guidance, she was now capable of standing her ground against formidable opponents. With her newfound confidence, Sophie charged headlong at Eleanor and Seedy, her resolve unshakable. Meanwhile, Princess Chloe reached the chamber where Matteo was in the midst of the dragon's resurrection ceremony. Her voice, filled with urgency, demanded that he halt the ritual immediately. Matteo, an enigmatic smile on his face, regarded the princess's demand with amusement. He questioned whether she truly believed that he would heed her plea after coming this far in his nefarious plan. She asserted that if Matteo wouldn't stop the ceremony, she would have to force him to do so. Matteo, his eyes filled with a sinister gleam, urged Sophie to hasten her efforts. The dragon's resurrection hung in the balance, and time was running out. Princess Chloe, her determination unwavering, prepared herself to confront Matteo directly. She was ready to do whatever it took to put an end to his malevolent plan. Back on the battlefield, Sophie was holding her own against both Eleanor and Seedy. She knew she had to find a way to break Seedy's advantage. He had a tricky tactic in his arsenal. He swapped with a clone every time his real body was hit. Hitting all of them at once would be the most effective way to gain the upper hand. Sophie focused her energy and summoned a fireball, aiming it at Seedy. However, Seedy effortlessly dispelled the fiery projectile with his water magic, leaving Sophie bewildered. Her elemental disadvantage was glaring, as fire was a poor match against water. As Sophie concentrated on Seedy, Eleanor vanished from her sight. Sophie's senses tingled with unease as she scanned her surroundings. In a flash, Eleanor reappeared, launching a ferocious attack at Princess Chloe, who had returned to the fray. The blow was aimed with lethal precision, but before it could land, Wayne swooped in to the rescue. Wayne, his voice filled with concern, inquired about the princess's well-being. 
She assured him she was unharmed, and her eyes reflected gratitude for his timely intervention. Matteo, observing this unexpected turn of events, was taken aback by Wayne's sudden appearance. His plan had taken an unexpected twist, and Wayne's presence spelled trouble. Wayne, his temper ignited, directed his attention toward Matteo. In a voice filled with determination, he declared that he had come to settle their score. His eyes blazed with fury as he vowed to make Matteo pay for endangering his friends and orchestrating the dire events that had unfolded. In the unfolding narrative of this fantastical realm, we find our characters at a critical juncture. Sidi, a vigilant and intuitive warrior, detected the unmistakable presence of Wayne, a formidable figure whose motives remained shrouded in uncertainty. Sidi, ever the astute tactician, recognized that the time for confrontation was not opportune. Instead, he sought to employ a stratagem to divert Wayne's attention, allowing him to approach the enigmatic figure cautiously. With a swift and calculated move, Sidi created a perfect replica of himself, a clone imbued with his combat prowess, and dispatched it to engage the enigmatic Sophie, leaving him free to proceed towards Wayne. This tactical maneuver was driven by Sidi's instinctual understanding that the clock was ticking, and he needed every fleeting moment to ensure the revival of the dormant dragon, a crucial endeavor that held the key to the nation's fate. Meanwhile, Matteo, a steadfast ally whose unwavering dedication to their mission mirrored Sidi's determination, shared the conviction that time was of the essence. He believed that a slight delay could mean the difference between victory and calamity. In a hushed, hurried exchange with Eleanor and Sidi, Matteo conveyed his belief that just a little more time was needed for the dragon's reawakening. Urged Matteo to entreat Eleanor and Sidi to join the battle against Wayne and Sophie. Their shared mission was clear, to protect and preserve the ceremony that would revive the dormant dragon, thereby safeguarding the realm from impending doom. Eleanor and Sidi, fueled by the urgency of their task, heeded Matteo's call without hesitation. With unwavering determination and a shared understanding of the cataclysmic consequences of failure, they rallied together and set their sights on Wayne, the enigmatic adversary whose powers seemed boundless. As Eleanor and Sidi surged forward, their intent was clear to thwart Wayne's intentions to protect the sacred ceremony and to ensure the dragon's revival. But Wayne, a master of the arcane arts, had no intention of yielding to their resolve. With a flourish of his potent magic, he wove a spell of incapacitation that sent both Eleanor and Sidi sprawling to the ground, their consciousness slipping into the embrace of a deep slumber. Matteo, from his vantage point, watched with growing trepidation as Wayne's powers unfolded. It became increasingly apparent that Wayne's abilities were far beyond what they had anticipated. In the midst of their desperate struggle, Wayne seemed almost disinterested, a testament to the extent of his might. Princess Chloe, a figure of regal grace and profound concern for her realm, was a cast at the unfolding chaos. She realized that the fate of her kingdom hung in the balance, and the ceremony, once set in motion, was a force too formidable to be halted. Desperation gnawed at her heart as she implored Matteo to cease the ceremony, to salvage what remained of their world. Matteo's laughter, tinged with a hint of madness, echoed through the tumultuous scene. He dismissed Princess Chloe's plea with a smirk claiming that the ceremony had reached a point of no return long before their confrontation with Wayne. As the ceremony's conductor, he reveled in the irreversible course it had taken, a course that seemingly spelled doom for the kingdom. Princess Chloe, now standing at the precipice of despair, could only wonder about the uncertain future that lay ahead, a creature of legendary dread, be resurrected from its slumber. In this moment of uncertainty, a pivotal revelation emerged from the lips of Wayne, a figure known for his unyielding resolve. With a composed demeanor that concealed his true intentions, his proclamation was as astonishing as it was unexpected. He divulged that he had no intention of thwarting the impending resurrection ceremony. The words hung in the air, leaving Princess Sophie and her trusted confidant, Matteo, utterly aghast. For Matteo, his disbelief palpable, confronted Wayne with a pointed question, questioning the very sanity of his decision. He spoke of the suffering endured by the innocent denizens of this land, the anguish borne by spirits entangled in an ancient curse. He argued that the dragon, the very heart of their misfortune, should be eradicated, a bold and audacious plan that would tie the threads of destiny in an unexpected manner. Princess Chloe, her heart heavy with the weight of responsibility, dared to point out the dire consequences of such an audacious endeavor. She knew that, despite Wayne's formidable powers, the dragon was an entity beyond reckoning. Its resurrection, left unchecked, would bring devastation upon their beloved land. 
Wayne, however, offered reassurance in the face of impending catastrophe. With unwavering confidence, he declared that he would not permit the dragon to wreak havoc upon their realm under any circumstances. He hinted at a carefully crafted plan, one that would not only subdue the dragon but also ensure the kingdom's safety. Princess Chloe, torn between trust and skepticism, decided to place her faith in Wayne's enigmatic plan. Her resolve to safeguard her kingdom compelled her to accept Wayne's unconventional proposition. With newfound determination, Matteo issued an enthusiastic proclamation. He urged Wayne and his allies to prove their mettle by confronting the looming threat, the giant dragon that was on the cusp of resurrection. As the dispelling ceremony reached its culmination, Matteo beckoned the colossal entity to emerge. A burst of radiant purple light pierced the sky, casting an eerie glow upon the town's bewildered inhabitants. The sudden spectacle left them in a state of shock and incomprehension. Their collective confusion mirrored the tumultuous events unfolding before them. In the midst of this surreal display, the colossal form of the dragon ascended, encased in an ominous shroud of purple aura. Fear gripped the hearts of onlookers as they bore witness to this awe-inspiring and terrifying manifestation. The king, in his desperation, commanded his knights and magicians to assemble, knowing that the hour of reckoning had arrived. As the immense power of the dragon surged, Matteo, poised on the precipice of destiny, held a crimson orb in his hand, a key to his dominion over the ancient beast. His triumphant laughter echoed through the chamber as he gloated over his newfound mastery, confident in his ability to command the mightiest being in existence. Wayne, undaunted by Matteo's bravado, resolved to face the colossal dragon head-on. With a determination born of unwavering conviction, he assured Sophie, Princess Chloe, and all those who placed their faith in him that he would not falter in this decisive moment. He extended his gratitude to Sophie for her unwavering trust, even as he offered a heartfelt apology to the princess for manipulating the events that had led to this precipice. The princess, her resolve unwavering, questioned Wayne about the true nature of his plan. She sought assurance that he could save their country from impending catastrophe. Wayne's response was unequivocal. He affirmed his commitment to safeguarding the realm and its people, offering his word as a solemn promise. The princess, her heart aflutter with hope, extended her hand in a gesture of trust, sealing their pact. With a final plea for Wayne's survival, the princess beseeched him to overcome the insurmountable odds they faced. Wayne, with unwavering determination, accepted her request and pledged to emerge victorious. With a flash of his teleportation spell, he vanished from their midst, re-emerging at the city gates, where the ominous presence of the colossal dragon awaited. Matteo, emboldened by his dominion over the dragon, sneered at Wayne from his vantage point, convinced that victory was within his grasp. As the colossal dragon unleashed a torrent of smaller draconic entities, Wayne's mastery over ancient Onyujutsu came to the fore. With a commanding presence, he summoned the Shikigami, twelve heavenly generals of unparalleled power. To these celestial guardians, Wayne issued a single resolute command to strike back against the draconic onslaught with unwavering resolve. With solemn expressions, the twelve heavenly generals prepared to meet the challenge, their determination mirroring the gravity of the task at hand. In the climactic showdown between Wayne and the colossal dragon, the fate of the kingdom hung in the balance. With allies divided and powers unleashed, the stage was set for a battle of epic proportions, one that would determine not only the destiny of these valiant heroes, but also the future of their cherished land. In the midst of the cataclysmic confrontation, Rollo seized the dragon from his office, whose unconventional perspective painted the unfolding drama in a different light. As Rollo laid eyes upon the awe-inspiring visage of the dragon, its indomitable strength evident as Wayne had warned, he couldn't help but be drawn to the impending spectacle. While the fate of the kingdom teetered on the precipice of destruction, Rollo found an irreverent glint of amusement in the dire circumstances. He couldn't suppress a careless remark that escaped his lips, a testament to his character's penchant for audacity even in the gravest of situations. He mused, albeit somewhat thoughtlessly, that perhaps it was time for him to get serious, a rare occurrence, given his propensity for a carefree demeanor. As the colossal dragon took to the skies, Matteo, the orchestrator of the looming chaos, exhibited an uncharacteristic restraint. He didn't linger to savor his apparent victory, recognizing the looming threat that he himself had unleashed. The dragon, an embodiment of unparalleled power, prepared to unleash its destructive fury in the form of a malevolent purple beam of mana. This single devastating attack held the potential to obliterate the entire capital city, leaving it in ruins. Wayne, astute and ever vigilant, grasped the dire implications of the impending onslaught.
he couldn't help but acknowledge the catastrophic scale of the dragon's impending assault, a force that could lay waste to the heart of their kingdom with chilling efficiency. In the face of such overwhelming power, Wayne knew that there was no room for hesitation. With a swift invocation of his teleportation spell, Wayne ascended into the heavens, his eyes locking onto a surprising companion in this pivotal moment. Rollo, with his distinctive laughter ringing out, appeared by Wayne's side in a show of unexpected solidarity. Their convergence was marked by an unspoken understanding, an acknowledgement that they were both driven by a common purpose. In a moment of shared determination, Wayne and Rollo steeled themselves for the formidable challenge that lay before them. The sight of the colossal dragon, an embodiment of terror and might, spurred them into action. With unwavering resolve, they vowed to confront this seemingly insurmountable adversary together. Wayne, who had borne the weight of responsibility for safeguarding the kingdom, found solace in Rollo's presence. Their unity and purpose promised a reservoir of strength that would prove invaluable in the battle ahead. Yet, as they braced themselves for the impending clash, Matteo, still defiant and deluded by his perceived superiority, taunted them from the shadows. Matteo, with a malevolent gleam in his eye, dismissed Wayne and Rollo's resolve with scorn. He reveled in the belief that even in unity, they were powerless before the might of the colossal dragon. He mocked them, promising to send them on a one-way journey to the underworld, as the colossal dragon prepared to unleash its devastating attack, a fearsome purple beam of mana surged from its gaping maw. The intensity of the assault was beyond comprehension, a force capable of erasing the city and all within it from existence. Yet Wayne, the master of arcane arts, and Rollo, his newfound ally, refused to yield. With a synchronized display of their formidable abilities, Wayne conjured a protective shield of potent magic, while Rollo, with his own unique powers, erected a barrier of equal resilience. Together, they defied the dragon's wrath, their shields absorbing the brunt of the cataclysmic assault. In that moment, Wayne couldn't help but marvel at the sheer potency of Rolla's barrier magic, an impressive display of mana that surpassed any he had encountered before. Matteo, witnessing his carefully orchestrated plan foiled by the indomitable duo, seethed with frustration. His expectations of an effortless victory had crumbled before his eyes. He raged against Wayne and Rollo, declaring that their triumph over this single attack did not equate to victory over the dragon itself. He pointed to a looming threat, a brood of lesser dragons spawned by the colossal beast. The knights and magicians, resolute in their duty to protect their kingdom, unleashed their formidable spells and weaponry upon these lesser dragons. Yet their efforts proved futile, for the creatures possessed an inherent magic resistance that rendered conventional attacks impotent. It was a grim realization that threatened to tip the scales in favor of chaos. Amidst the despair, a ray of hope emerged. Kijin, a mysterious figure endowed with remarkable abilities, unleashed her cherry blossom flash technique, dispatching one of the lesser dragons with astonishing ease. The magicians and knights, their astonishment evident, watched as this formidable warrior dismantled the creatures in a single, graceful strike. The enigmatic Tenku, with his spirit eyes of truth, possessed an ability that defied conventional explanation. He employed this otherworldly power to devastating effect, rendering several of the lesser dragons powerless in an instant. Their demise was swift and unforgiving, leaving a trail of defeated adversaries in their wake. Siryu, a master of aquatic magic, harnessed the very essence of water with her Mizuru compression, a whirlpool of elemental force. Her spell surged forth, engulfing and extinguishing a multitude of lesser dragons in a torrent of watery might. The efficiency of her technique left an indelible impression on those who witnessed it. Tenku, acknowledging Siryu's formidable prowess, praised her for her unwavering dedication to their mission. Her modest response was marked by a smile, a testament to her belief in Wayne's directive, to administer a resounding defeat to their draconic foes. Suzako, Dane, Toda, Biaku, Kouchin, and Tamo, each possessed their unique abilities and strengths. United in purpose, they methodically dismantled the lesser dragons, one by one, with unwavering determination. Their coordinated efforts left Mattia reeling, as the once formidable creatures fell before their relentless onslaught. Amidst the chaos, Rolo couldn't help but comment on the unexpected prowess of these unheralded fighters. His observation hinted at a greater tapestry of talent that lay hidden beneath the surface, individuals whose formidable abilities had yet to be fully revealed. Wayne, ever the perceptive strategist, couldn't shake a lingering sense of unease. The ease with which they had dispatched the lesser dragons seemed at odds with the grand scheme of their adversary. He pondered the implications of this apparent disparity, 
realizing that the colossal dragon held secrets yet unrevealed, even if they had momentarily gained the upper hand. In the midst of chaos, with the colossal dragon looming ominously overhead, Rollo stepped into the forefront of the unfolding battle. His voice, filled with determination and a touch of audacity, cut through the tension that hung heavy in the air. Let's see what a giant dragon can do, Rollo declared, directing his words toward Wayne. He had made a strategic decision. He would be the one to launch the attack, leaving Wayne to assume the pivotal role of defense. Wayne, ever the tactician, responded with a simple okay, accepting the division of responsibilities. The partnership between Rollo and Wayne was marked by a profound sense of trust and camaraderie. Wayne's presence, steadfast and reliable, offered Rollo a source of reassurance amid the turmoil that surrounded them. As they prepared to face the colossal dragon, their roles clear, Rollo as the aggressor and Wayne as the guardian. Their synchronized movements and unspoken understanding painted a portrait of unity in the face of adversity. Rollo, emboldened by the weight of his chosen role, positioned himself squarely before the awe-inspiring beast. In a moment of reflection amidst the impending clash, he addressed Matteo, the mastermind behind this grand upheaval. Rollo's thoughts meandered through the labyrinthine passages of time, tracing the contours of Matteo's ambitions. Matteo, Rollo reflected, had always been driven by ambition, a trait that had marked him even in his formative years. But Rollo had never imagined that Matteo's aspirations would take such a dark and perilous turn, leading him down the treacherous path of rebellion against the kingdom he had once vowed to protect. With a sense of responsibility that weighed heavily on his shoulders, Rollo acknowledged his own complicity in the unfolding tragedy. He admitted that he had failed to discern the growing darkness that festered within Matteo's heart. And now, as the kingdom teetered on the brink of ruin, Rollo took upon himself the mantle of responsibility, vowing to vanquish the colossal dragon and, in doing so, shoulder the burden of his own shortcomings. In response to Rollo's earnest declaration, Matteo, his voice tinged with arrogance and defiance, dismissed Rollo's sense of responsibility with a scoff. He belittled Rollo's lofty intentions, reminding him that he was not the prophesied awakened one destined to confront the encroaching darkness. In Matteo's eyes, Rollo's efforts were futile, a feeble struggle against the inexorable tide of destiny. As the confrontation continued to unfold, the colossal dragon ascended higher into the sky, its movements growing ever more pronounced. Wayne, ever the vigilant observer, discerned the subtle nuances in the dragon's actions. He recognized that the beast had not yet unleashed its full power, and this realization only heightened his sense of caution. Amidst the turmoil, Matteo revealed a glimpse of his malevolent intent. He hinted at a sinister plan, explaining the significance of their chosen location for the confrontation. It was a site carefully chosen to serve as a focal point, a magnet for the corrupting and malevolent energy known as miasma that had plagued the kingdom. Matteo's diabolical scheme was to harness this dark force, using it to amplify his own power and further his nefarious designs. He spoke of a gathering of miasma, a malevolent tide that threatened to engulf all in its path. The implications of Matteo's plan were dire, and it was clear that he intended to unleash unimaginable destruction upon Alcera. However, before the colossal dragon could complete its sinister plan, Rollo unveiled a spell of unprecedented potency, a spell known as Annihilate. With unwavering resolve, he directed this formidable incantation toward both the colossal dragon and Matteo. As the mana waves surged forth from Rollo's spell, the consequences were staggering. The colossal dragon, the embodiment of terror, and Matteo, the orchestrator of chaos, began to disintegrate before their very eyes. Rollo explained the true nature of his unique spell, an unforgiving force that erased anything it touched, leaving no trace of existence in its wake. Matteo, caught off guard by the sheer magnitude of Rollo's power, could hardly believe the severity of his predicament. He muttered in disbelief, unable to escape the impending fate that had befallen him. In a matter of moments, he vanished from their midst, leaving behind only the echoes of his malevolence. With Matteo's disappearance, Rollo might have been tempted to believe that the battle had reached its conclusion. Yet Wayne, the ever-discerning strategist, remained vigilant. He couldn't help but question the incongruity of the situation. If Rollo could single-handedly deal with the colossal dragon and its malevolent master, what did it mean for the dire vision that Princess Chloe had foreseen? Wayne sensed that there was more to this enigmatic dragon than met the eye. To their astonishment, the colossal dragon reappeared before them, defying the notion of its demise. Rollo, momentarily taken aback, questioned whether his age had finally caught up with him. It was apparent that the colossal dragon's mana had surged, signifying the emergence of its true form, 
a revelation that left them with an even more formidable adversary to contend with. Rollo, undeterred by the dragon's resurgence, resolved to continue his relentless assault. His strategy was clear, he would erase the dragon as many times as necessary, preventing it from returning to the fray. Rollo launched his Annihilate spell once more, but this time, the colossal dragon had a countermeasure, a powerful barrier. The barrier infused with the dragon's potent magic, repelled Rollo's mana waves, sending them hurling back toward him. It was a startling turn of events that left Rollo momentarily vulnerable. Yet Wayne, the resourceful defender, intervened. He summoned his own formidable spell, Erase Magic, effortlessly dispelling the returning attack and shielding Rollo from its devastating effects. Rollo, taken aback by Wayne's prowess, could hardly fathom the depths of his capabilities. Wayne's timely intervention saved Rollo from the full brunt of his own spell, a testament to their synchronized teamwork. As the realization of Wayne's strength settled in, Rollo acknowledged the crucial role Wayne had played in their defense. With a sense of camaraderie and mutual respect, Rollo and Wayne exchanged roles. Rollo declared that he would assume the mantle of defense, entrusting Wayne with the responsibility of leading the attack. Wayne, accepting the challenge, affirmed his commitment to the task at hand. Rollo, drawing upon his formidable magical abilities, erected a protective barrier known as the Absolute Area. Within this impenetrable field, both the Colossal Dragon and themselves were enclosed, creating a battleground isolated from the outside world. The barrier served as a containment field, preventing attacks from escaping and endangering the kingdom, a testament to Rollo's formidable abilities and his unwavering dedication to their mission. Wayne, now positioned for the attack, unsheathed his sword with purpose and determination. He knew that the fate of Alcera and its people hung in the balance, resting on the outcome of this climactic battle. With Rollo's assurance that he would safeguard the kingdom, Wayne was free to unleash his full power without reservation. As he steeled himself for the battle ahead, the echoes of their shared resolve reverberated through the battlefield, a battlefield where destiny and determination would collide in a final cataclysmic showdown of unimaginable proportions. In the midst of turmoil and chaos, a wounded soldier, battered and bruised from the relentless battle, finds salvation in the form of Jembu. As the soldier's pained eyes meet hers, he can't help but wonder if she is a saintess, a divine presence sent to aid those in need. Jembu, her memory stirred by the soldier's question, reflects on the times when she was hailed as a saintess. With a quiet conviction, she affirms her role as a saintess. The soldier, overwhelmed with gratitude, utters heartfelt thanks, a simple yet profound acknowledgement of the solace she has brought him. But amidst this fleeting moment of respite, a shadow emerges from behind, casting a grim reminder of the ongoing battle. Tamo, with urgency etched across his face, implores Jenbu to hasten her healing efforts. The foes they face are unlike any other, undead dragons that defy death itself. These creatures, with their relentless resurrection, threaten to plunge the capital into despair. Wayne, their leader, has entrusted them with a solemn duty, to keep casualties at a minimum. Jenbu, understanding the weight of her responsibility, assents with a solemn nod. She acknowledges the urgency of the situation and pledges to do her utmost to mend the broken bodies that continued to pour in. Elsewhere on the battlefield, Kijin finds herself entangled in a relentless dance of death with the immortal dragons. Frustration courses through her veins as her attacks fail to bring an end to these resilient foes. The soldiers, observing this seemingly futile struggle, are struck with disbelief. Kijin's presence, along with the other brave warriors, is all that stands between the capital and its inevitable descent into ruin. Their leader, a stalwart figure amidst the chaos, rallies his troops. He exhorts them to stand firm, to embrace the impending danger with unwavering resolve. The knights are given a crucial task, to fortify their defenses and keep the dragons in check. Meanwhile, Wayne's loyal subordinates and skilled magicians prepare to weave fusion spells, unleashing potent magic that could turn the tide of this dire battle. Dane and Shizako, their hearts aflame with determination, relish the prospect of newfound allies joining their ranks. In this new world, Wayne and his companions find themselves thrust into the limelight, their identities no longer veiled in secrecy. The people here, aware of Wayne's significance, rally behind him and his cause. The support they receive is both heartening and humbling, a testament to the impact Wayne has had on this world. Kijin shares a vital piece of information. These immortal dragons owe their unnerving resilience to a malevolent miasma that binds them to the colossal dragon. Their mission, therefore, is not to slay the unslayable but to endure until Wayne confronts and defeats the colossal dragon. 
With unwavering determination, they steel themselves for the challenges that lie ahead. Promising to give their all, they prepare to face the relentless onslaught of the immortal dragons. In another corner of this sprawling battlefield, Tota finds himself strangely exhilarated by the chaos. To him, these dragons are nothing more than glorified sandbags, providing him with a twisted sense of satisfaction. Tenku, however, observes Tota's reckless abandon with concern. He fears that Tota's wild fervor will eventually lead to his exhaustion. Amidst this battle of wills, Byaku steps forward with a plan. His confidence unwavering, he declares that defeating the immortal dragons is well within their grasp. His solution? Freezing them. With the incantation of his purple frost spell, he attempts to immobilize the dragons in ice, yet in a cruel twist of fate, Tota finds himself ensnared in the icy prison alongside the creatures. Dane, witnessing this unexpected turn of events, can't help but burst into laughter. In the heat of the moment, Ringuko observed with satisfaction how the strategy of freezing the formidable dragons was proving to be highly effective. Tauta, a fiery spirit in his own right, shattered through the frozen barrier and approached Byaku, confronting him about his actions. The burning question on Tota's mind was, why did you do that? Tensions ran high. Tota, with his eyes locked onto Byaku, contemplated whether he should administer a well-deserved reprimand before the dragons. In response, Byaku, his anger evident, goaded Tuta further. He challenged him with a smirk, daring Tuta to take action if he believed he could. The others regard Tota with a mixture of amusement and exasperation. He is, undoubtedly, a problem child in their midst. As the battlefield unfolds, Kijin reaches out to Wayne, her voice carrying a sense of urgency. She implores him to expedite his battle against the colossal dragon, for she fears that their current struggle may prove unsustainable. Wayne, ever composed, acknowledges her concern. However, he recognizes that the colossal dragon is no ordinary foe. In a daring display of its might, the colossal dragon unleashes a devastating purple beam toward Wayne, prompting Rolo to issue a cautionary warning. Wayne, quick on his feet, employed his spirit mirror's spell to reflect the dragon's attack back at it. Wayne found the dragon's abilities intriguing. It could not only reflect magic attacks but also absorb physical ones. Curiosity peaked. Wayne decided to test his Anyu Jutsu against the formidable foe. With determination in his eyes, he cast his spirit flame spell, conjuring azure flames that surged toward the dragon. To Wayne's surprise, the dragon defended itself against the azure flames. It was becoming apparent that only the Anyu Jutsu seemed to have any effect on the colossal dragon. Wayne, undaunted, continued his assault, using a combination of spells. He cast Void World, followed by Powder Deer, and then fused the power of black flame with the blue flames, unleashing the devastating combination against the giant dragon. Polo, one of Wayne's companions, watched in astonishment as Wayne seamlessly combined multiple techniques. Yet to their collective shock, the colossal dragon remained unscathed. Its resilience was awe-inspiring, and Polo couldn't help but marvel at the creature's incredible toughness. Wayne, however, had expected this outcome. His earlier shots were not intended to harm the dragon, but rather to locate its weak spot. Using his spirit sight, Wayne honed in on the dragon's vulnerability, pinpointing its stomach as the area with the most damage. The colossal dragon, undeterred, prepared to unleash three beams of energy at Wayne, each one charged with deadly intent. Wayne swiftly raised his shield, locking the oncoming barrage, and then maneuvered to evade the dragon's lunging bite. However, the colossal dragon created multiple clones of itself, launching a relentless series of attacks against Wayne. Paulo watched with a sinking feeling, believing that Wayne could only defend against the dragon's overwhelming strength. The situation seemed dire, and the fate of the capital hung in the balance. Meanwhile, in a different part of the battlefield, Byaku and Tota were locked in combat. Tota unleashed a fiery spell against Byaku, who deftly dodged the attack, causing it to strike one of the immortal dragons. Byaku seized the opportunity, using the conflict with Tota to his advantage. He continued to bait Tota into launching attacks, all while strategically directing those spells toward the immortal dragons. Suzuku and Dane, observing this masterful maneuver, were astonished by Byaku's tactical prowess. It appeared that, thanks to Byaku's ingenuity, they might just gain the upper hand against the immortal dragons. Kijin and her fellow warriors, who had been battling tirelessly alongside her, found renewed hope in the midst of the chaos. They began to believe that they could weather the storm and protect the capital from impending doom. Ringoku, however, couldn't shake his concern for Wayne. He knew that Wayne, despite his considerable abilities, was still not as powerful as he had been in his previous life. 
He worried about the possibility of Wayne losing to the colossal dragon in an unfortunate twist of fate. Keijin, ever the optimist, reassured Ringoku. Don't worry, she said with confidence. We know just how strong Wayne is. All we need to do is follow his orders. After all, Wayne is history's most potent exorcist, having mastered all five elements of yin and yang. Back at the heart of the conflict, Wayne had grown accustomed to the colossal dragon's relentless attacks. He knew that it was time to transition from defense to offense. As the dragon launched yet another assault, Wayne braced himself for what lay ahead, prepared to unleash his mightiest spell, Kagutsuchi of Fire. With a resounding incantation, Wayne released the blazing inferno toward the giant dragon. Flames danced in the air, forming a searing vortex of destruction. As Sophie and Princess gazed skyward, their eyes locked onto an immense, swirling purple cloud that dominated the horizon. They couldn't help but wonder if the colossal clash between Wayne and the colossal dragon was unfolding amidst that celestial battleground. Sophie's heart swelled with a mixture of worry and faith. She couldn't fathom the notion of Wayne succumbing to defeat. Princess, always astute, probed deeper. She sought to understand if Sophie's faith in Wayne extended even when pitted against a formidable adversary like the dragon. Sophie's reply was resolute. Her trust in Wayne remained unshaken. Amidst their conversation, Princess continued to fix her gaze upon the heavens. With a voice infused with conviction, she declared that Wayne was destined to be the savior of their nation. In the skies above, Rollo's protective barrier had shattered under the tremendous force of the explosion. Wayne, however, was quick to acknowledge the role Rollo's barrier had played in avoiding casualties during their intense confrontation. As the dragon poised for a new attack on Wayne, Rollo cautioned that their barrier might not hold against this impending assault. Wayne, his voice calm yet resolute, spoke into the magical communication link. Kijin, can you hear me? Kijin, his loyal ally, responded promptly, Yes, Wayne, what can I do for you? Wayne's thoughts drifted back to the battle and the unique challenge that the colossal dragon presented. I find this world truly fascinating, he began. I never would have imagined encountering a being of such formidable strength here. Kijin, who knew Wayne's exceptional abilities, understood the significance of his praise. It must be a formidable opponent indeed if you speak of it in such terms, she remarked. Wayne nodded, his voice filled with resolve. I believe it's time for me to go all out, he declared. Kijin accepted the weight of Wayne's decision. Very well, we've already dealt with all the dragons on the ground. You can cancel their summoning at any time. Wayne expressed his gratitude before admitting to himself that he had never expected to push himself to such limits again. He braced himself for the task ahead. In a spectacular display of power, Wayne unleashed a spell of immense magnitude, invoking the spirit summoning. A brilliant blue aura of mana enveloped him, signaling the release of an extraordinary surge of energy. Rollo, who observed from the skies above, was left utterly stunned by the magnitude of Wayne's power. The increase in Wayne's strength was on a scale they had never seen before. It was as if Wayne had become a dozen times more formidable than he had been mere moments ago. In a climactic moment, Wayne unsheathed his sword, enveloping it in a brilliant blue mana. The dragon retaliated with a fierce purple mana beam, but Wayne countered with a swift, precise slash of his empowered sword. The blue mana cut through the dragon's beam, cleating the colossal creature in twain. Princess, awestruck, witnessed Wayne's triumphant victory. Standing amidst the aftermath, Wayne turned to her, a smile gracing his face, and calmly reassured her that he had kept his promise. Meanwhile, Kane, watching from the confines of his palace, could scarcely believe the astonishing turn of events. The people below were equally astounded, witnessing the once darkened skies transform into a clear azure expanse. They rejoiced in their newfound safety and speculated about who had vanquished the monstrous dragon. Many assumed that Rollo's magic barrier had thwarted the beast, and thus Rollo must have been the hero responsible. In the sky, Rollo remained awestruck by Wayne's incomprehensible power. Wayne, ever humble, explained that he had not sought to conceal his abilities, but had exercised restraint to avoid becoming a pariah for such abnormal strength could lead to fear and ostracism. However, this time, he had no choice but to unleash his full potential to safeguard the land. Rollo, deeply moved by Wayne's sacrifice and heroism, halted Wayne as he was about to take his leave. He expressed his profound gratitude as a patriot who cherished his homeland, recognizing that Wayne's actions had saved their country. Wayne, his usual affable demeanor intact, accepted Rollo's appreciation before teleporting away. As Wayne descended to the ground, Sophie, concerned for his well-being, approached him with genuine care. Wayne assured her that he was unharmed. 
the princess too, extended her gratitude to Wayne for protecting her beloved nation. Wayne, in his typically modest manner, replied with a warm, you're welcome. Salamander, the fiery spirit, materialized and voiced his admiration for Wayne's triumph over the dragon. Sophie questioned how Salamander could be so energetic after previously appearing unconscious. The other spirits gathered around Wayne, expressing their gratitude for his role in defeating the dragon and releasing their seals. Wayne downplayed his actions, claiming that he had merely taken responsibility for releasing the seals. Salamander, overcome with excitement, pledged his unwavering loyalty to Wayne for the remainder of his existence, prompting hearty laughter from Wayne. C.D. entered the conversation, finding it hard to believe that Wayne had indeed defeated the colossal dragon. Wayne, with an air of nonchalance, affirmed his victory and shared that he had to exert his utmost effort to emerge triumphant. C.D. chuckled in response. In the aftermath of the battle, reconstruction efforts in the capital commenced promptly. While some buildings had suffered damage, the intervention of the twelve heavenly generals had minimized the destruction. The capital's populace erupted in jubilation, celebrating their newfound safety and the heroism that had preserved their land. Back at Wayne's abode, Kijin arrived with news of a visitor. Wayne, intrigued, inquired about the identity of the guest. Upon inspection, he discovered that it was Princess Coley herself. Baffled by her presence, Wayne asked her why she had come. The princess revealed that it had been decided that Wayne would receive a medal in recognition of his heroic feat, and she had personally come to extend the invitation. Wayne, ever modest, considered the prospect of a medal to be excessive recognition. He inquired if it was truly necessary, to which the princess responded that Wayne was the hero who had saved their nation, and thus declining the honor would be problematic. Gratefully, Wayne accepted the invitation, realizing the importance of such recognition. The princess, however, had one more gift in mind, a personal one from her to Wayne. Wayne hesitated, asserting that he had not sought any rewards when he had aided her. The princess, undeterred, playfully insisted, her voice tinged with a hint of mischief. With a sudden rush of boldness, she leaned forward and kissed Wayne. As quickly as it had happened, she pulled back, leaving Wayne bewildered. She bid him good night and departed, leaving Wayne to contemplate the unusual gift she had bestowed upon him. The following day, Wayne found himself at the royal palace where he was formally awarded the medal for his heroic defeat of the dragon. Despite the honor, he appeared visibly fatigued upon returning to his office. Kijin, concerned for his well-being, gently broached the subject of declining the medal. Wayne, however, understood that this duty came with being a noble, and that the medal would bring solace and assurance to the people. Kijin admired Wayne's considerate nature and deep commitment to his country and its citizens. Wayne stood in awe as he gazed upon the magnificent medal. It was the Medal of the Dragon Lord, the highest honor in the country, reserved only for those who had performed extraordinary feats for the greater good of the people. In fact, Wayne was the first recipient of this prestigious medal in nearly a century, and he held the distinction of being the youngest recipient ever. Kijin, his trusted companion, couldn't help but smile with pride, telling Wayne that it was only fitting for someone as great as him to receive such an honor. She added that the Granado family would no longer be labeled as second-rate nobles, their status forever elevated by Wayne's heroic actions. A knock at the door interrupted their conversation. The door swung open to reveal none other than the princess herself, Wayne and Kijin, wondering what had brought her to their doorstep on this particular day. With a warm smile, the princess explained that she had forgotten to mention an additional prize that accompanied the Medal of the Dragon Lord, unsure if the reward would be considered sufficient before revealing that Wayne would receive a thousand platinum coins as an extra prize. Wayne was taken aback by the generosity of the reward. While he considered the amount to be rather exorbitant, he couldn't deny that such a windfall would work wonders for the development of the Granado territory. However, the princess had more surprises in store. The Brayhilga family of Mateo, one of the seven great noble families, would no longer retain their esteemed status. Instead, that seat was now offered to the Granado family. Wayne's family had ascended to become one of the seven great noble families, a feat previously thought unattainable. With a furrowed brow, Wayne voiced his concerns, questioning whether the other noble families would vehemently oppose such a change. The princess chuckled heartily at his skepticism and reassured him, saying, Who could be more suited to fill that seat than the hero who saved our country? Wayne still found it difficult to grow accustomed to being hailed as a great hero, a grand parade was organized to inform the people about Wayne's extraordinary achievements. The response from the populace was overwhelmingly passionate as they cheered and waved in gratitude for their hero. 
Amidst the jubilation, the four spirits that had aided Wayne in his battle against the dragon returned to their original abodes. Salamander, in particular, remained as a guardian spirit for the Colbot. Their bond strengthened through their shared triumph. As Wayne made his way to school for the first time since the dragon incident, he could feel the weight of the stairs directed at him. It was only natural, considering he was now recognized as the hero of the country. Henry, his close friend, congratulated him on his newfound fame, remarking that people couldn't help but be captivated by Wayne's presence. Wayne responded with a knowing nod, acknowledging the unavoidable attention that came with his newfound status. Suddenly, a crowd of students, particularly girls, swarmed around Wayne, eager to hear the tale of how he had defeated the dragon and to learn about Anyu Jutsu. Sophie, Wayne's friend, couldn't hide her jealousy as she struggled to get close to him amidst the throng of admirers. Keijin, ever protective, contemplated dispersing the crowd, but Wayne gestured for her to hold back. The school's principal, Rollo, entered the classroom, his eyes twinkling with amusement. He remarked on Wayne's newfound popularity and confessed that he was almost envious of the number of admirers Wayne had garnered. Wayne, eager to get to the point, asked Rollo what he wished to discuss. Rollo leaned in and presented Wayne with a proposal that left him intrigued. He asked if Wayne would consider becoming a scholarship student. Wayne's eyes widened at the unexpected offer. The proposition of becoming a scholarship student had taken him by surprise. Wayne sought clarification from Principal Rollo regarding the role of a scholarship student. Rollo explained that it entailed becoming a temporary lecturer who would travel to other nations and magic academies. Wayne, initially perplexed by this unfamiliar system, pressed for further details. Rollo elucidated, emphasizing that the academy had exhausted its capacity to instruct Wayne as a student, and this opportunity would enable him to propagate the knowledge of Anyu Jutsu worldwide. Wayne, recognizing the wisdom in Rollo's words, began to see the potential in this proposition. The principal expressed confidence in Wayne's ability to command respect and awe among students due to his exceptional achievements. Wayne had excelled as a top student, defeated the formidable giant dragon, received the prestigious medal of the Dragon Lord, and held the esteemed title of one of the seven great nobles. This glowing track record made Wayne more than qualified for the role of a scholarship student. Understanding the underlying message, Wayne assured Rollo that he would contemplate the offer. Rollo expressed his satisfaction with Wayne's response, emphasizing the importance of considering what was best for Wayne's own future. With a nod of gratitude, Wayne took his leave from the principal's office, his thoughts consumed by the possibilities that lay ahead. As he walked through the corridors of Alcera Magic Academy, he couldn't help but reflect on Rollo's words about doing what was best for himself. Wayne entered the library, a place he often sought solace and knowledge. He perused through the documents and books, his mind racing with ideas and possibilities. His gaze landed on a particular passage that piqued his interest, prompting him to summon Kijin, his trusted spirit companion. Kijin, Wayne said, his tone filled with a sense of purpose, I need to speak with Siryu. Can you summon him for me? Kijin nodded and closed her eyes in concentration. A moment later, a majestic azure dragon materialized before Wayne, its presence imposing yet serene. Siryu inclined his head respectfully. How may I assist you, Wayne? Wayne wasted no time in getting to the heart of the matter. I've been looking at the sales reports for potions in our territory, and it appears that their sales are quite high. Can you tell me more about it? Siryu's eyes gleamed with enthusiasm. Of course, Wayne. Potions have seen a surge in sales, primarily driven by adventurers who use them to heal wounds sustained in battles with monsters. However, the quality of these potions leaves much to be desired. It seems the demand has risen due to the increased frequency of monster attacks. Wayne nodded thoughtfully, absorbing the information. Can you prepare one for me? I'd like to see for myself. Siryu informed him that there were potions stored in the mansion's storehouse, and they promptly made their way there. Wayne retrieved one of the potions, examining it closely. It had no discernible odor, and when he took a cautious sip, he found it to be sour but not undrinkable. However, it was nowhere near as effective as the spirit medicines he was accustomed to using. Wayne contemplated the potion's shortcomings. Do you think there's something we can do to improve the quality of these potions? With the skills we have, I believe we can make a significant difference. Siri relayed that Rikugu had been diligently working to enhance the quality of potions, but his expertise in the matter was limited. Wayne couldn't help but smile as an idea formed in his mind. I think I have the perfect candidate in mind for this endeavor, Wayne declared, his determination growing. Siri shared in his excitement, understanding the potential impact of their efforts. Together, they discussed their vision for improving potion quality and expanding their production. 
Wayne expressed his desire to share the recipe with others rather than monopolizing it in order to benefit his people and lessen the burden of monster attacks. Siryu admired Wayne's noble sentiment and pledged to give his utmost to their collaborative endeavor. With their plan in motion, Wayne left the storehouse with a renewed sense of purpose. He was determined to make a positive impact not just as a mage, but as a lord, prioritizing the well-being of his people over immediate profit. The day took another turn as Wayne headed to Al Sarah prison, where a familiar name awaited him, Nelson Hayward, the scientist who had once kidnapped Sophie. Wayne had a specific question in mind, and he was eager to hear Nelson's perspective. Wayne wasted no time in presenting the common potion he had acquired earlier. Take a look at this, Nelson. It's a potion sold widely in this country. I'd like to hear your opinion on it. Nelson's lips curled into a sardonic smile. Why should I answer your questions? Wayne met Nelson's challenging gaze with unwavering resolve. Because you're the one who created Makia, the mana-enhancing drug. If anyone knows how to improve the efficiency of magic medicine, it's you. Nelson's initial defiance gave way to irritation. He scoffed. Do you think you can just summon me and expect me to cooperate? Wayne leaned in, his voice laced with a hint of authority. Nelson, it's in your best interest to help me. If you can provide valuable insights into improving this potion, it could lead to a reduction in the suffering caused by monster attacks. Nelson's expression shifted, torn between his pride and a begrudging acknowledgement of the potential impact of his knowledge. Finally, he relented. Fine, I'll entertain your question. There are essentially two ways to enhance the efficiency of magic medicine. The first involves using higher quality raw ingredients for the potion. The second centers on reducing the waste products extracted from the raw materials, thus maximizing the active ingredients. Wayne leaned forward, his eyes locked on Nelson Hayward. You're the perfect candidate to help us improve the quality of these potions. Nelson's eyebrows arched in skepticism. Improving potion quality isn't a task that can be accomplished overnight. I spent a decade researching to create Makia. Wayne nodded, acknowledging the gravity of Nelson's achievement. But these potions are currently being monopolized by one of the seven great noble families, the McCullers. If a small, weak noble family like the Granatos were to step into this arena, we might just be crushed by force. Wayne couldn't help but smile at Nelson's uncertainty. You don't know it yet, but the Granados have joined the ranks of the seven great noble families. Nelson's eyes widened in disbelief. What? When did this happen? It happened when I accepted the Medal of the Dragon Lord. Nelson's world seemed to tilt on its axis as he absorbed this shocking revelation. He struggled to come to terms with the implications of Wayne's words. Wayne extended a hand toward Nelson, his voice steady and unwavering. So Nelson, would you like to come work for me? Nelson hesitated for a moment before he spoke. Before I agree, I have one question. What are your future plans? What is the grand ambition you're aiming for? Wayne's expression softened as he considered his response. My goal is to create a country where its people can live in peace and prosperity. When I was first reincarnated, my aim was to rule in broad daylight to avoid betrayal. I aspired to be a supreme ruler. But as time passed, I formed connections with people and came to know their kindness and warmth. Before I realized it, I had grown to care deeply for these people. I no longer seek mere rulership. I want to make them happy. That's become my true goal. The two men extended their hands, sealing their newfound partnership with a firm handshake. With the promise of a new collaboration in the air, Nelson journeyed to the Granado territory. There he was greeted by Rikugu and Wayne, both eager to begin their research. As they exchanged greetings, Wayne sensed the potential in this alliance and looked forward to what they could accomplish together. Shall we go to the laboratory? Wayne suggested with an enthusiastic smile. Nelson couldn't help but feel a sense of nostalgia as they walked through the quaint village surrounding the laboratory. The idyllic surroundings and warm greetings from the villagers left a favorable impression on him. Your village is quite charming, Nelson commented as they strolled along. Wayne nodded in agreement. Yes, it's spacious, surrounded by nature, and perfect for conducting research. Plus, we have a hot spring that's perfect for unwinding when we're feeling exhausted. Finally, they arrived at the laboratory, and its pristine, organized interior stirred memories of Nelson's own days of intense research. As Nelson settled in, he couldn't help but ask, Wayne, why do I not sense any monsters nearby? Wayne chuckled and explained, that's because my subordinates have a habit of exterminating monsters with great enthusiasm. As a result, the monsters have become wary of approaching this area. Inside the laboratory, Nelson couldn't contain his curiosity any longer. 
I'm here to help you with your research, but I'd like to know the specifics. What are your concrete goals and to what extent do you want to improve these potions? Wayne's response was clear and decisive. I want you to make them as effective as the current ones we have here. Nelson raised an eyebrow, intrigued by the challenge. And what do you intend to do with these potions? Wayne's eyes gleamed with a sense of purpose. I plan to circulate high-quality potions at a low cost. By doing so, we can ensure that more people have access to these potions. It's all part of our research on how to make them. Nelson's doubts and hesitations vanished as he realized the significance of their work. This is what makes this job worth doing. Rikago, who had been observing the conversation, chimed in. Wayne has already created a potion called the Spirit Medicine using Anyu Jutsu. It fulfills those requirements, but it can't be produced on a large scale. That's why we want to focus on improving the quality of potions. Nelson was genuinely surprised by this revelation. His curiosity peaked. Spirit Medicine? I hadn't heard of it. Rikugo elaborated, it uses the same ingredients as regular potions, healing herbs and magic grass. With a deeper understanding of their mission, Nelson felt a renewed sense of purpose. I promise you, Wayne, I shall achieve this goal. Wayne's gratitude was evident as he clasped Nelson's hand firmly. I'm expecting great things from you. Rikugo, sharing in the optimism, added, let's do our best together. As the research team embarked on their journey to improve potion quality, Wayne left the laboratory with a sense of fulfillment. His thoughts turned to the Adventurer's Guild, a place he was both curious and apprehensive about visiting. The following day, Wayne embarked on a clandestine mission to the Adventurer's Guild. His motive was simple, to keep his true identity as one of the illustrious seven great nobles hidden. Wayne understood all too well that if the Guild were to uncover his noble lineage, he would undoubtedly be treated with a level of deference and privilege that he wished to avoid. As he stealthily stepped into the bustling Guild, he couldn't help but notice that it was more vibrant than he had initially expected. The air buzzed with anticipation and adventurers of all sorts congregated, their excitement palpable. Approaching the reception desk, Wayne donned the guise of a commoner and confidently declared his intention to register as an adventurer. The receptionist, an astute woman who had seen her fair share of adventurers, handed him a registration form. Wayne, now adopting the pseudonym Wen and classifying his occupation as a swordsman bereft of magical aptitude, believed this alias would suffice to maintain his anonymity. For the sake of clarity, however, we will continue to refer to him as Wayne. Submitting the form, Wayne watched intently as the attendant meticulously reviewed every detail. After a thorough examination, she assured him that everything was in order. With a warm smile, she inquired if Wayne planned to undertake the rank certification examination, an essential step on an adventurer's journey. She explained that by participating in this examination, Wayne could secure a rank that best suited his abilities. Intrigued by the prospect, Wayne probed further, asking what rank he would be assigned if he chose to forego the examination. With an unwavering demeanor, the attendant informed him that he would be assigned the lowest rank, an F rank. Wayne's mind weird with contemplation. He envisioned most adventurers boasting D or C ranks, and he aspired to align himself with peers of that caliber. The examination, he concluded, would be a more efficient route to that end. Resolutely, Wayne announced his decision to partake in the examination. The attendant, however, levied a substantial fee, a hefty three gold coins, for this privilege. Wayne couldn't help but wince at the exorbitant cost, but he reluctantly handed over the required sum. The attendant offered no concessions, reiterating that the examination was scheduled to take place in three days at the Alcera Arena. She emphasized the importance of bringing all necessary certifications along. Wayne exited the guild, pondering the periodicity of these examinations and the significant expense involved. Three days later, the Alcera Arena stood as the hallowed ground for the examination. Wayne, now among a select group of only five examinees, would face an A-rank adventurer named Leona, who had been assigned the role of examiner. As the candidates gathered, Leona assumed control of the proceedings. She began by meticulously elucidating the examination rules. The examination would comprise one-on-one -on -one duels, and the outcome, she emphasized, would bear no significance. Instead, she would evaluate the examinee's individual combat abilities. Wayne seized the opportunity to pose a question to Leona, seeking clarity on the fairness of a system that segregated mages from vanguards. He opined that such an arrangement might hinder individuals from showcasing their complete skill set. Leona, her response measured and decisive, explained that the examination was exclusive to vanguards and swordsmen. Although some examinees possessed magical aptitude, 
they would be assessed primarily on their combat prowess. This meant that the examination's nature would adapt to suit each examinee's strengths. Wayne, satisfied with the response, mentally acknowledged the fairness of this approach. Eager to delve deeper, another adventurer ventured another query. She inquired whether emerging victorious against Leona would secure them a rank. Leona, her confidence unshaken, affirmed that such an outcome was indeed possible. She, however, cast doubt upon the likelihood of anyone defeating her in combat. She, fueled by a surge of excitement, took her challenge head-ons. Leona, with a firm yet encouraging tone, implored all the examinees to give their best. With that, the examination commenced. Wayne found himself pitted against Leona in the opening round. Wayne resolved not to repeat the errors of the past when he had lost control of his powers during the entrance exam. Leona, sensing his determination, urged Wayne to unleash the full extent of his abilities. In Wayne's mind, however, a different strategy took shape. He believed that discretion was the better part of valor, opting to withhold his true strength. With caution, he advanced toward Leona. She skillfully parried his initial attack, but Wayne revealed a series of techniques, demonstrating his undeniable talent. Leona, recognizing Wayne's potential, couldn't help but admire his prowess. She entertained the thought that under the tutelage of a skilled mentor, Wayne could evolve into a formidable combatant. In Wayne's estimation, however, Leona, despite her a rank HR status, fell short of the strength exhibited by Sophie, who he believed to be several times more powerful. With that in mind, Wayne realized that it was time to accept defeat gracefully. Leona, as if choreographing the outcome, gracefully disarmed Wayne, bringing their duel to an orchestrated conclusion. She acknowledged his potential and encouraged him to continue honing his skills, affirming that he had the makings of a great adventurer. The next candidate to face Leona was a determined young woman named Tina. With unwavering confidence, Tina boldly declared her intent to defeat Leona without delay. Leona, however, found herself irked by Tina's audacious assertion. As the duel unfolded, Leona observed that Tina possessed an extraordinary reservoir of mana, unlike anything she had witnessed before. It became evident that Tina's words were not mere bravado. She was a formidable contender. Leona, intrigued and somewhat challenged, urged Tina to reveal the extent of her abilities. In a swift, synchronized flurry of motion, both combatants charged toward each other, their swords clashing in a dazzling display of skill. Leona, astounded by Tina's remarkable prowess, struggled to believe her own eyes. Tina, unrelenting and confident, mocked Leona, asserting her superiority based on her understanding of Leona's swordplay. Leona, her frustration mounting, vehemently disputed Tina's claims, insisting that a rookie like her could never defeat an experienced A-rank adventurer. Yet before Leona could react, Tina's blade found its way to her throat, securing Tina's victory in an unexpected twist of fate. Leona, her pride momentarily subdued, acquiesced to Tina's triumph. In that pivotal moment, Tina ascended to the esteemed rank of a rank adventurer, an accomplishment that resonated deeply within the guild's hallowed halls. Wayne, now observing Tina's abilities, couldn't help but be impressed. Her mastery of magic was nothing short of exceptional, and her swordsmanship held its own against the formidable Sophie. With the examination finally concluding, Leona gathered the examinees to convey that the results would be delivered to the guild the following day for review. As Wayne awaited the verdict, he held aspirations of securing a C or D rank, eager to begin his adventure in earnest. Tina, meanwhile, approached Wayne, her demeanor brimming with enthusiasm. She offered him genuine praise for his swordsmanship, recognizing his skills as exceptional. Wayne, however, remained humble and acknowledged Tina's compliments. He reminded her of his failure to defeat Leona, to which Tina astutely pointed out that Wayne had deliberately held back. She highlighted his remarkable attributes, commending his keen eyes, swift reactions, and the graceful precision with which he wielded his sword. In her eyes, Wayne resembled a promising cocoon poised to unfurl into a magnificent butterfly. Wayne, feeling somewhat exposed by Tina's keen insights, attempted to deflect her observations. Yet Tina, perceptive beyond measure, refused to be deceived. She extended an invitation, proposing that they form a party together. Wayne, however, hesitated, recognizing that Tina's A-rank status would cast a shadow over his pursuit of gathering information about adventurers. With regret, he declined Tina's offer, prompting a hint of disappointment in her eyes. Tina, though momentarily disheartened, accepted Wayne's decision gracefully, bidding him farewell before departing. In the solitude of her room, Tina lay on her bed, reflecting on the day's events, 
Wayne, she mused, possessed qualities that were undeniably appealing, handsome and gifted in equal measure. Tina marveled at the notion of becoming so formidable without the aid of mana, further fueling her admiration for Wayne. However, her ultimate goal remained to locate Wayne Granato, a task she deemed challenging at best. To accomplish this seemingly impossible feat, Tina realized that she would need to ascend to the exalted ranks of an S-rank adventurer. With unwavering determination, she held on to the hope that her quest would lead her to her Prince Charming. The following day marked a significant milestone in Wayne's adventurous journey. He had achieved his goal of becoming a certified D-rank adventurer, precisely as he had intended. Meanwhile, Tina had ascended to the coveted rank of A-rank adventurer, fulfilling the promise she had made. Her excitement was palpable, a testament to the thrill of embarking on a new adventure. Wayne stood at a crossroads, ready to immerse himself in the life of an adventurer while discreetly conducting his investigation. His first task was to form a party, a crucial step in navigating the world of adventurers. However, before delving into that endeavor, he perused the notice boards in the guild, each displaying two distinct types of notices, one for party recruitment and the other for quests. As Wayne contemplated his next move, Tina made her entrance. Wayne couldn't help but perceive her as a potential complication in his plans. She inquired about his intentions, and he responded by stating his intent to seek a party interested in undertaking quests of D or C rank. Tina, ever resourceful, pointed out a quest that she believed would suit Wayne's current status, a D rank quest involving the extermination of wild boars. The notice indicated that they were seeking a party of four, but they currently lacked two members. Tina suggested that Wayne and herself join forces to complete the party. Wayne was taken aback by Tina's persistence, questioning her eagerness to form a party with him. She candidly expressed her desire to study Wayne's swordsmanship more closely, assuring him that their difference in rank wouldn't be an impediment. Despite his reservations, Wayne couldn't bring himself to reject Tina, recognizing her straightforward and sincere nature. Reluctantly, Wayne agreed to partner with Tina for the quest. He cautioned her to exercise restraint, aware that her A-rank status might overshadow the other members. Later, they ventured into the Alcera forest to meet the remaining two members of their party, Elio and Leica, both D-rank adventurers. Upon Tina's introduction, Elio and Leica expressed concern about forming a party with an A-rank adventurer like her, fearing that equitable sharing of rewards wouldn't be in their favor. Tina, however, reassured them, emphasizing her desire to learn from fellow adventurers and integrate into the community. Elio and Leica quickly recognized the value Tina brought to their party. They acknowledged her as a valuable asset and expressed gratitude for her willingness to share her knowledge. Wayne, concealed behind his one persona, silently observed the interactions, relieved that he had managed to blend in seamlessly. The party set forth, with Elio cautioning everyone to remain vigilant. The Alcera Forest was known for its unpredictable monster activity, and they couldn't afford to let their guard down. Leica took charge of the rear, assuring the others that she had it under control. Tina, exhilarated by the prospect of her first adventure with the party, shared her excitement. Elia provided valuable guidance, directing the party toward the habitat of wild boars located near the forest center. As they ventured deeper, Wayne marveled at Elio's extensive knowledge and swift decision-making a testament to his experience as an adventurer. Wayne conveyed his determination to give his best during their expedition. Elio, recognizing the gravity of their profession, encouraged Wayne to do just that. The conversation, however, took a lighthearted turn when Elio and Leica engaged in a spirited exchange, their camaraderie evident. Tina, sensing a strong bond between the two, playfully suggested that they seemed like a couple. Elio and Leica blushed, vehemently denying any romantic involvement. Wayne, perceiving the emergence of danger, urged them to silence as he detected approaching footsteps. A group of monsters was heading their way. Elio initially couldn't hear anything, but Tina corroborated Wayne's warning, confirming the presence of approaching creatures. Leica, looking visibly alarmed, pointed toward a nearby tree. The party's eyes widened as they witnessed a herd of wild boars advancing toward them. Ilio's shock was palpable, and Tina's anticipation surged. Tina thinks Wayne can sense these things from further away than she can and wonders just who is exactly Wayne, as the skills and strength he has he can't be a drank adventurer. Wayne took notice of a heightened presence of mana among the boars. Sensing danger, he deduced that they might be fleeing from a more formidable entity lurking in the forest. Ilio, grasping the perilous situation, implored the party to withdraw and report their findings to the guild. However, Tina, her excitement undiminished, 
defy Elio's plea and rushed ahead, propelled by a desire to confront whatever lay deeper within the forest. Ilio's apprehensions swelled as he explained that a more formidable adversary awaited, cautioning Tina against advancing alone. Wayne, recognizing the urgency of the situation, offered to accompany Tina. However, Ilio pointed out that if Wayne left with Tina, he would be acting alone, leaving Ilio and Leica to contend with the wild boars. Wayne's hands were tied, and he reluctantly disclosed his true identity. Wayne Granato, the hero of Alcera, Ilio and Leica were rendered speechless, their timidity evident as they stood in the presence of the renowned hero. Wayne clarified that his disguise as Wen had served a specific purpose related to his investigation, making it imperative for him to act independently now. The truth left Elio and Leica with no choice but to acquiesce to Wayne's decision. Wayne reassured them that they had made the right choice under the circumstances, praising Elio for his knowledge and swift judgment. In a show of gratitude, Elio thanked Wayne for his understanding and guidance. With Wayne's assistance, the party embarked on their journey to exit the forest. Wayne, employing his teleportation abilities, whisked the entire party out of the forest in an instant. Their astonishment was palpable, and Wayne proceeded to instruct them on how to return safely to the guild, advising them to warn fellow adventurers against entering the Alcera forest due to its current perilous state. Meanwhile, Kitchen reached out to Wayne, bearing a message from Salamander. Wayne eagerly inquired about the message's contents, and Kijin revealed that the rampant monster activity was likely linked to the immense miasma emitted by a colossal dragon. Wayne readily volunteered to confront and subdue this formidable threat, sparking Kijin's admiration and excitement. As Wayne prepared to confront the dragon, a sense of unease gnawed at him regarding Tina's fate. In the depths of the forest, Tina confronted a formidable adversary, an imposing griffin. Its presence had caught her off guard, as she had not anticipated encountering such a formidable creature within the forest. Unfazed, she regarded the griffin as a potential stepping stone toward her cherished goal of reaching S rank. Their battle commenced, with Tina and the griffin engaging in a high-speed duel. To her surprise, the griffin matched her every move, thwarting her attempts to restrict its movements by herding it into an area enclosed by massive rocks. The griffin's overwhelming power shattered her makeshift barrier, leaving Tina vulnerable to its deadly claw strike. As Tina lay incapacitated on the forest floor, the griffin's menacing claw loomed over her, poised for a potentially fatal attack. In her moment of despair, Wayne appeared on the scene, arriving just in the nick of time to intervene and rescue her. Wayne's timely arrival saved Tina from the griffin's lethal strike. With concern etched across his face, he inquired about her well-being, to which Tana responded that she was unharmed. Grateful for his intervention, Tina extended her hand to Wayne, using it to regain her footing. However, before Tina could catch her breath, she seized the moment to express her feelings to Wayne. With unreserved honesty, she confessed her love for him, her voice trembling with emotion. She implored Wayne to become her boyfriend, leaving him taken aback by the sudden confession. Wayne, still grappling with the whirlwind of emotions, attempted to navigate the situation delicately. He conveyed his reluctance to immediately embrace Tina's proposal, prompting her to thank him for saving her life. Tina then proceeded to make yet another request, asking Wayne to date her, followed by a proposal for marriage. Wayne, clearly uncomfortable with the rapid progression of events, sought to clarify his intentions. He pointed out the need for a deeper understanding between them, emphasizing that they were relative strangers to each other. He questioned the sincerity of Tina's feelings, given their limited interactions. Undeterred, Tina insisted that she knew everything about Wayne, citing his status as the hero of Alcera, Wayne Granado. Wayne recognized that his identity was not as concealed as he had thought, given that both Elio and Leica had recognized him. Despite the awkwardness of the situation, Wayne acquiesced to Tina's request to meet again. He suggested that she visit the Granado territory, where they could engage in more meaningful conversation. Tina's face lit up with joy, and she expressed her gratitude before departing. Later, guild members arrived to handle the griffin's aftermath, and they were astounded to witness Wayne's single-strike takedown of the formidable creature. Tana took a moment to apologize to Elio and Leica for her impulsive actions earlier in the day. She recognized that her actions had placed her comrades in a precarious situation, and she expressed remorse for her thoughtlessness. Elio and Leica, in turn, expressed their gratitude to Wayne for his guidance and assistance. Wayne commended their abilities and acknowledged the positive impact of their collaboration. Tina observed Wayne's demeanor with curiosity, 
finding him to be an enigmatic figure who interacted with ordinary individuals with remarkable ease. Having resolved to meet Wayne at the Granado Territory, Tina embarked on her journey. She marveled at the city's size and the vibrancy of its inhabitants. The city's rapid expansion was a testament to its status as one of the territories governed by the seven great nobles. Tina's eagerness to reunite with Wayne filled her with anticipation as she ventured toward his mansion. In the midst of her journey, Tina encountered Siriu, who had been informed about her by Wayne. Siriu, fueled by jealousy upon seeing another woman, promptly reported Tina's presence to Kijin. Upon her arrival at Wayne's mansion, Tina conveyed her desire to meet him to Kijin. However, Kijin, ever vigilant, sought to verify Tina's status as an A-rank adventurer. Tina presented her A-rank guild card as proof, but Kijin remained unsatisfied. She proposed a more rigorous test, an arena battle to determine Tina's worthiness to meet Wayne. The prospect of a showdown in the arena now lay before Tina, with Kijin harboring a serious intent to assess Tina's abilities and ascertain whether she was deserving of an audience with Wayne Granato. The scene transitioned to an arena where Couchin was diligently training soldiers. Amidst the intense training, Kijin approached him with a request. She expressed her desire to spar with a woman named Tina, whom Wayne had informed them about, a promising rookie adventurer. Couchin, recognizing Tina's name from Wayne's briefing, granted permission for them to use the arena for their duel. He ordered a brief five-minute break for his students, clearing the way for Kijin and Tina to engage in their sparing match. As they stood on the arena's grounds, Kijin assured Tina that she would exercise restraint during their bout. Tina, grateful for the consideration, acknowledged Kijin's strength but maintained her own confidence. She was determined to prove her worth after feeling inadequate during her recent battle with a griffin. Kijin urged Tina to attack with all her might, assuring her that she would hold back. Tina, brimming with motivation, asserted that she would demonstrate her strength. Tina readied herself, determined to prove her capabilities. She unleashed a magical attack without incantation, astonishing everyone, including Couchin. However, Kijin swiftly responded, cutting the magic projectiles in half. Tina was taken aback by Kijin's ability to slice through her spells. With composure in her eyes, Kijin explained that cutting magic was a matter of matching mana with an equal amount of spiritual power. Tina found this concept intriguing, as it reminded her of the spiritual power used in Anyu Jutsu, the same power Wayne utilized. Kijin inquired if Tina had more to reveal, to which Tina responded with a small test. Kijin, wearing a displeased expression, indicated that she was ready to take the offense of this time. In a fraction of a second, Kijin closed the gap between them, leaving Tina surprised and barely able to defend against her attacks. Kijin's incredible speed impressed Tina, but she was determined not to be outdone so easily. Kijin continued her assault with a barrage of strikes, yet Tina managed to defend against them, displaying her resilience. While Tina acknowledged Kijin's strength, she refused to back down and retaliated with her mana projectiles. Kijin effortlessly evaded Tina's magical attacks and commented on the uniqueness of her spells. Tina explained that she had developed these spells herself, earning Kijin's admiration. Meanwhile, Wayne found himself in the library, deep in conversation with Tenku. She had gathered information about Tina, revealing her as the daughter of the Duke of Hazeldane, a prominent family in the magical country of Krunal. Wayne recognized Tina's high status, considering her noble lineage. Tenku further informed Wayne that Tina had even discovered a new magic formula, a testament to her genius. Wayne smiled, intrigued by Tina's reputation as a tomboy who had ventured to Alcera to escape her family's arranged marriage. Back in the arena, the duel between Tina and Kijin raged on, leaving bystanders in awe of their prowess. Wayne, concerned about Tina, reached out to Kijin, inquiring if Tina had arrived. Kijin confirmed Tina's presence and shared her progress in the ongoing duel. Wayne, however, urged Kijin to cease the sparing and invite Tina inside. He pondered Tina's reasons for running away from home, hopeful that he might be able to assist her. Tina and expressed their gratitude for Wayne's hospitality. Wayne broached the subject he had in mind, an inquiry into Tina's background. Tina blushed, assuming that Wayne's intentions revolved around marriage. However, Wayne's line of questioning pertained to her sudden departure from Krunal. Wayne, now fully understanding Tina's situation, questioned her motives for visiting Alcera. She admitted to fleeing her home due to her parents arranging a marriage for their own gain. Tina admitted that she initially sought Wayne's help to annul her engagement, but her feelings had since taken a different turn. She had fallen in love with him at first sight, deepening her desires. 
Kijin, who did not share Wayne's enthusiasm, struggled to contain her frustration. Wayne clarified that he could not accept Tina as his fiancé, but offered assistance in resolving her engagement. Tina was taken aback by Wayne's offer, grateful for his willingness to help. Wayne revealed his plan to serve as a temporary lecturer at the Colonel Magic Academy, where he would work behind the scenes to nullify Tina's engagement. He emphasized the importance of discretion, recognizing the potential diplomatic implications of his actions. Tina, flustered by the proposal, inquired if Wayne could genuinely achieve such a feat. Wayne explained that the Al Sarah Magic Academy's scholarship system provided a means for him to influence events, though success was not guaranteed. Tina, overcome with emotion, questioned why Wayne would go to such lengths to assist her when she had nothing to offer in return. She wondered if he saw her as selfish for rebelling against her family. Wayne and Kijin assured Tina that her self-awareness was commendable. Wayne explained that her desperation had inspired him to help her. Tina, touched by their kindness, teared up and Wayne and Kijin were elated to see her emotions. Tina expressed her gratitude and accepted Wayne's offer. She confessed her inexperience but placed her trust in him. Wayne reiterated that he had no intention of marrying her, but Tina seemed content with the path forward. Suddenly, a red magic circle appeared behind them, signaling the arrival of a yellow-haired magician. He identified himself as Gerard, the magician in service of the Vandert family, Tina's fiance's family. Gerard possessed unique skills and was renowned for being the only magician in Krunel to wield ancient magic. He was considered the strongest among them. Tina was shocked by Gerard's unexpected appearance and questioned how he had found her. Gerard cryptically replied that locating her had been an easy task when he set his mind to it. He declared his intention to take Tina back with him, leaving Wayne and Tina surprised by this unexpected turn of events. Wayne, intrigued by the concept of ancient magic, sought to learn more, but the situation was rapidly escalating. He delivered a chilling ultimatum. Either she accompanied him willingly, or he would exterminate everyone here for her kidnapping. Wayne observed Gerard's unwavering confidence, especially in his mastery of ancient magic. It was clear that Gerard held a high opinion of his own abilities. Tina, overwhelmed by fear, implored Gerard to stop. He coldly responded that the decision was hers to make, leaving her torn and uncertain about the right course of action. At that moment, Tenku entered the scene, his expression reflecting his disapproval of Gerard's behavior. He had overheard their conversation and couldn't contain his anger. Kijin turned to Wayne for guidance, seeking his input on how to handle this tense situation. Wayne, however, decided to entrust the situation to Tenku, recognizing that his trusted subordinate was better equipped to handle the matter. Gerard, realizing the gravity of his actions, offered an apology for his abrupt and forceful approach. He cited his reasons for taking such drastic measures, explaining that he had heard rumors that one of the seven great nobles of Alcera had kidnapped Tina to leverage political demands. His actions were driven by these unverified claims. Tenku's frustration mounted as he addressed Tina, asking if she wished to return home. Tina, shaking her head, firmly declined. Determined to protect Tina's right to choose, Tenku insisted that Gerard leave. However, Gerard remained steadfast in his determination, asserting that his orders were absolute, and that he would not hesitate to use force to achieve his goals. Tina, caught in the middle of the conflict, was torn and unsure of how to proceed. Tenku initiated an attack against Gerard, but the magician effortlessly blocked the assault. He expressed his astonishment at Tenku's considerable power, even comparing him to the likes of Rolla Vistav, the strongest wizard in Alcera, and Wayne Granato, the hero who had defeated the ancient dragon. Gerard's confidence stemmed from his belief in the superiority of his ancient magic. Tenku, growing increasingly annoyed by Gerard's arrogance, unleashed his heavenly chains, divine restraints imbued with the power of the ruler of heaven, Amaterasu. These chains, composed of divine and spiritual energy, were typically inescapable. Wayne recognized the significance of Tenku resorting to such a powerful technique, signifying Gerard's formidable strength. However, Gerard, using his undue spell, easily shattered the divine chains, leaving Tenku in disbelief. The magician then deployed his nebula spell with lightning speed, striking Tenku and sending him crashing into a wall. Kijin and Tina watched in shock as the powerful attack unfolded before their eyes. Gerard, having subdued Tenku, shifted his attention to Wayne, prepared to engage him as his next opponent. Before the confrontation escalated further, Tina stepped forward and made a difficult decision. She agreed to go home with Gerard, prompting a sigh of relief from Wayne, who was concerned for her safety. 
As Tana prepared to depart, she turned to Wayne with a heartful apology for the trouble she had caused. Gerard also extended an apology to Wayne, accompanied by a request for Wayne to keep Tina's visit to his territory a secret. Wayne agreed to the request, and in an instant Gerard and Tina vanished from sight, leaving behind a somber atmosphere. Once Gerard and Tina were gone, Tenku managed to rise, albeit with significant injuries. Wayne inquired about Tenku's well-being, and though he admitted to taking a severe hit, he assured Wayne that he would recover. Kajin, aware of Tenku's limited combat abilities, expressed disappointment that Tina had been taken away. Wayne, however, was not only concerned about Tina's welfare, but also intrigued by Gerard's ancient magic. He pondered the possibilities and recognized the need for further investigation into this mysterious and powerful magic. Wayne proposed a plan to Kajin. They would utilize his scholarship to journey to Krunal, the land where ancient magic thrived, in search of answers. In this enchanting episode, we find ourselves transported to the mystical realm of Krunal, the land where the illustrious Vandert family resides. Gerard, a loyal servant, stands before his master, the esteemed Fernando, and delivers the news that Tina, who had fled her home, has returned safely with him. Turning his gaze towards Tina, Fernando inquires about the pain her departure has caused and probes the depths of her disdain for him. He implores her to reveal the source of her intense aversion. In response, Tana doesn't hold back, accusing him of being devoid of even the slightest ounce of affection. Fernando, with a bemused grin, can't help but laugh in response. He dismisses Tina's claims as absurd, asserting with sincerity that he loves her. However, Tina remains resolute, convinced that Fernando's affections are driven solely by his ambition to unite the Hazelfane family under his banner, thus ascending the social ladder among the aristocracy of magical nobles. In a moment of candor, Fernando acknowledges the partial truth in Tina's assertion, but steadfastly maintains that love is at the core of his feelings for her. He recollects the overwhelming joy he felt when he learned of her voluntary return to the Vander estate in the company of Gerard. Unmoved, Tina resists, declaring that Fernando should feel no shame in admitting that her return was a consequence of Gerard's coercion. Recognizing the exhaustion etched across Tina's face from her arduous journey, Fernando gracefully intervenes. He suggests that Tina must be in need of rest and promptly directs Gerard to accompany her to the opulent mansion where she can find solace. As the two exit the room, leaving Fernando to ponder the complexities of their relationship, he realizes that Tina has astutely discerned his true intentions. She is a shrewd young woman, and although she has identified his hidden agenda, her options for escape appear severely limited. Meanwhile, in a wholly different narrative thread, Wayne meets with Rollo. He yearns to be granted a scholarship that would facilitate his journey to the illustrious Kruno, renowned for its unparalleled advancements in magical research. Rollo, captivated by Wayne's aspirations and the promise of what Kruno holds, smiles and assures Wayne of his support and dedication to making this dream a reality. Grateful for Rollo's unwavering backing, Wayne expresses his heartfelt thanks. Two weeks later, Wayne finds himself en route to Kruno, though he can hardly believe that he's accompanied by not one, but two loyal companions, Sophie and Henry. Sophie reveals her fascination with the cultural exchange aspect and confesses her lifelong curiosity about the enigmatic magic of Krunal. On the other hand, Henry's intrigue is piqued by the mysterious workings and appearance of magic tools from this extraordinary land. Kajin, the ever-supportive figure, subtly points out the audacity of their shared enthusiasm. Sophie inquires of Kijin, may I ask why you accompany Wayne as well? To which Kijin promptly responds, Sophie, it's a distinct role, as I serve Wayne. Wayne intervenes gracefully, diffusing any tension that may have arisen, assuring them, there's no need for concern. Your presence, all of you accompanying me, provides a great deal of reassurance. This statement elicits a bashful response from both Sophie and Henry. Arriving at the border of Krunal, they must navigate a thorough inspection before they're granted a coveted stamp of entry. With their passports stamped and the borders open before them, they finally step foot onto the hallowed grounds of Krunal. Wayne contemplates the significant journey that still lies ahead, pondering the long road to the capital. It is then that Sophie, with an air of excitement, introduces an intriguing notion, a unique mode of transportation found only in Krunal, Wyverns. Her proposal catches Wayne by surprise, and he leans in, eager to understand more. Sophie elaborates on the uniqueness of Wyverns as a mode of transportation in Krunal, and is convinced that they will find a place in a nearby village where these magnificent creatures are available for riders. The mere idea of riding wyverns fills Wayne and Henry with exhilaration, and they promptly prepare for the adventure. 
The group heads to a Wyvern farm, eager to embark on this thrilling leg of their journey. Upon arrival at the Wyvern farm, Wayne approaches the owner, expressing their desire to rent Wyverns for their journey to the capital. The owner provides the details, including the cost of 30,000 nil per Wyvern. Wayne inquires about the number of passengers each Wyvern can accommodate and learns that it can carry a maximum of two riders. Without hesitation, Wayne agrees to the terms and pays the required fee. With the formalities settled, the owner proceeds to provide a tutorial on riding these majestic creatures. Wayne and Henry listen intently, absorbing the intricacies of mounting the rider's saddle and manipulating the wyvern's wings through a lever affixed to their backs. Eager to begin their wyvern journey, Wayne and Henry mount their respective wyverns with excitement coursing through their veins. As they prepare for takeoff, Henry struggles to calm his wyvern while Sophie, though visibly nervous, bravely mounts another wyvern. In stark contrast, Wayne and Kijin display remarkable ease in mastering their wyvern's controls. Their seamless adaptation to this magical mode of transportation astounds Sophie and Henry, as well as the impressed owner. With his newfound mastery of wyvern riding, Wayne stands ready to lead the way to the capital. He decides to accompany Henry, providing reassurance to his anxious friend. Sophie, on the other hand, joins Kijin on another wyvern, her heart heavy with the unspoken wish that she could be riding alongside Wayne. With their position solidified and their wyverns poised for flight, they bid farewell to the farm and take to the skies, soaring toward the fabled capital of Krunal. High above the landscape of Krunal, Kijin and Sophie revel in the exhilaration of soaring through the boundless sky on their wyverns. The wind whistles past them, and the sprawling vistas unfold in all their majesty. However, their friend Henry, perched on his own wyvern, is gripped by an overwhelming sense of fear. Unable to even cast a glance downward, Wayne, with a reassuring tone, urges him to endure this harrowing journey just a bit longer, promising that their landing in the capital, Alder Lane, is only minutes away. As the wyverns gently descend and the trio safely alights on solid ground, relief washes over Henry. They park their majestic steeds at a local wyvern farm, bidding farewell to their aerial companions. Eager to explore the enchanting capital, they begin to meander through the bustling streets of Alder Lane. Wayne takes the opportunity to inform them about their upcoming orientation, scheduled for the next day. Intrigued, Henry inquires about the purpose of this orientation, prompting Wayne to explain that it will serve as their introduction to the Academy. During the orientation, they will receive information about the Academy itself and partake in tests to determine their respective skill levels. Sophie quickly realizes that this means they will be sorted into classes based on their abilities, a notion that sparks a hint of worry in Henry. He envisions himself relegated to the lowest tier, and his apprehension is palpable. Sophie and Wayne, however, rally to uplift Henry's spirits, encouraging him to embrace a more optimistic outlook and reminding him of his considerable talents. They assure him that he needn't fear and should instead focus on giving his best effort. Emboldened, Henry expresses his determination to rise to the occasion. Suddenly, a distant clamor punctuates the air, alerting the group to an unfolding crisis. Wayne, equipped with clairvoyance, peers into the source of commotion. His extrasensory vision reveals a building ablaze with flames, and within it, numerous people trapped in dire peril. Sophie gasps at the dire situation, prompting Wayne to take charge. Without hesitation, he announces his intention to rescue the endangered citizens, urging Sophie and Henry to continue onward to the academy. Unwilling to let Wayne shoulder this burden alone, Kijin offers to accompany him, while Sophie fervently insists on contributing to the rescue effort. Wayne, however, firmly but gently, rebuffs Sophie's offer, citing the danger and the need to ensure her safety. Their expressions filled with anxiety, they watch as Wayne swiftly departs to save those in peril. Reluctantly, Sophie acquiesces, her anger simmering beneath the surface. She and Henry decide to follow Wayne and Kijin from a safe distance. Wayne and Kijin arrive at the scene, the fire's raging inferno leaving them with no choice but to create a protective barrier to safeguard themselves from the scorching heat and choking smoke. Once inside, Wayne quickly formulates a plan, instructing Kijin to split up and rescue the trapped individuals as swiftly as possible. Racing against time, Wayne plunges into the conflagration, locating his first victim amidst the flames. Utilizing his teleportation spell, he extracts the person from the fiery peril and then courageously re-enters the inferno to save more lives. Kijin mirrors Wayne's dedication, tirelessly calming through the fiery maze to locate and evacuate those in need. Working in tandem, they eventually manage to rescue all the trapped individuals who are left awestruck and profoundly grateful for their timely rescue. 
Wayne, despite the praise, remains modest, humbly stating that he merely fulfilled what was expected of him. Yet the raging fire remains unquelled, its flames stubbornly resisting all attempts to extinguish them. A trio of mages has fought valiantly to no avail. Wayne steps forward, his eyes locked on the inferno. With a rush of determination, he ascends into the air, harnessing his magic to cast a spell known as Grand Extinguishment. In a brilliant flash of light, the incendiary fury is immediately quelled, leaving bystanders gaping in awe at Wayne's astonishing display of power. The flames that had once menaced the building are extinguished with a single stroke, and the capital's inhabitants are left marveling at the awe-inspiring feat of magic they'd just witnessed. Wayne's swift response to extinguishing the fire drew heartfelt gratitude from those he had just saved. In his usual modest demeanor, Wayne downplayed the significance of his actions, assuring them that it was a task of little difficulty for him. However, he couldn't help but be taken aback by the realization that fire posed no real challenge to his abilities. This left Wayne pondering the astonishment he sensed in those around him. Amid the gratitude and amazement, someone in the group couldn't resist the urge to inquire further. Speculation ran rampant, and they dared to ask if Wayne had employed some form of powerful, perhaps ancient, magic to accomplish the feat. Wayne, ever the humble and forthcoming soul, took a moment to correct this assumption. It wasn't ancient magic that he wielded but something equally unfamiliar to his companions, a mystical practice known as Anyujutsu. This revelation left those gathered quite bewildered. Anyujutsu was a term they had never encountered before. By the time they had reached the scene, Wayne's Anyujutsu had already quelled the flames, leaving little for them to do. The group couldn't help but notice the uniform of a young woman among them, clearly indicating her affiliation with the prestigious Krunal Magic Academy. One of the individuals in the group, seemingly familiar with Wayne, was quick to give credit where it was due. He declared that Wayne was the one who had been instrumental in resolving the crisis. The young woman from the Krunal Magic Academy recognized Wayne's attire from the Alcera Magic Academy, sparking her interest further. Wayne stepped in to provide context, explaining that he had taken on a temporary role as an instructor to propagate the practice of Anyu Jutsu. The young woman, who had heard of Wayne as a national hero, was taken aback to find herself standing before him. She had envisioned the hero as a towering figure, but here was Wayne, the same age as her. Wayne, in his own thoughts, couldn't help but ponder the idea of being considered a giant. With introductions underway, the young woman introduced herself as Leah, a third-year student at the Krunal Magic Academy, also holding the esteemed position of student council president. The gentleman in the group went on to reveal Leah's status as the most skilled mage among all Krunal students, the go-to expert during fire emergencies when the mage corps were summoned. Just as their conversation was gaining momentum, Kijin interrupted, heralding the arrival of Sophie and Henry. Sophie's countenance appeared far from pleasant, and her discontent was palpable. Wayne quickly extended an apology, explaining that he had been compelled to act alone. Sophie, while understanding the situation, couldn't mask her frustration. Wayne inquired about the source of her vexation, to which Sophie confessed that she realized she could never have resolved the crisis as swiftly as Wayne had. She couldn't help but feel powerless in comparison to his abilities. Wayne, with a reassuring tone, sought to console her, reminding her that everyone possessed their unique strengths and weaknesses. The attempt to comfort Sophie, however, seemed to heighten her irritation. Leah then interjected with an air of excitement, drawing their attention to the fact that Wayne and his two companions were exchange students from All Sarah. She looked forward to getting to know them, despite Sophie's less than ideal first impression. Sophie, despite her earlier frustration, greeted Leah, feeling a tinge of embarrassment about her initial reception. Lee eagerly extended an offer to be their guide through Krunal, an invitation that they graciously accepted. Their tour included a visit to the Academy's Magic Research Lab, where Lee mentioned the recent surge in the popularity of ancient magic research in Krunal. This revelation caught Henry's attention, and he expressed his desire to explore ancient magic someday. However, Lee swiftly advised against it, explaining that ancient magic consumed the body as fuel. She later apologized to Henry for her initial comment, alluding to some deeper thoughts. Sophie, curious about the enigmatic flame Leah had mentioned, inquired further. Leah, with a cryptic tone, suggested they pretend not to have heard her mention it, hinting that they might get to experience it themselves as exchange students. Wayne couldn't help but sense an underlying implication in Leah's words. As they proceeded to the dormitories, everyone was taken aback by the spacious accommodations designated for a few exchange students. Lee explained that the academy used to host a multitude of cultural exchanges in the past but had shifted its focus over the years. 
They were now a unique exception to this practice, a privilege granted solely because Wayne, the nation's revered hero, had applied. Henry couldn't resist teasing Wayne at this point, but Wayne, in his unflappable demeanor, refused to take the bait. Leah, anticipating the events of the next day, suggested they take it easy for the evening. The impending schedule included an orientation and a class placement test. Crunel students were to undergo a practical examination, while exchange students like them were expected to complete a written test. Henry found solace in this arrangement, confident in his ability to excel in a written examination. After escorting them to their respective rooms, Leah once more extended her gratitude to Wayne for his role in dealing with the artifact fire. With that, she took her leave. The narrative now shifted to the Vander household, where Gerard was in conversation with Fernando. Gerard shared the news of Wayne's acceptance as an exchange student at the Colonel Magic Academy. Fernando speculated that Wayne's choice might be tied to his engagement with Tina. He believed that Wayne breaking off the engagement could make Tina more amenable to their plans. Fernando, secure in Gerard's loyalty, expressed confidence in their alliance. Fernando went a step further, asserting that they would continue to consolidate their power. He believed that his grand design was nearing realization, with only the issue of Wayne's engagement to Tina standing in the way. To him, it was a relatively insignificant concern in the grander scheme of their ambitions. Unbeknownst to them, someone had overheard their conversation from outside the palace. Tenkyu, upon hearing your plans, felt a shiver of apprehension. As Tenkyu departed from the vicinity, Gerard, seemingly attuned to his presence, sensed his departure. Tenkyu promptly relayed the details of the conversation to Wayne, who was now privy to the Duke's intentions. Wayne couldn't help but feel that the Duke was underestimating him. He urged Tenkyu to continue investigating the Duke's activities, emphasizing the importance of uncovering his true agenda. Wayne was now convinced that his engagement to Tina was merely a small component of the Duke's grand scheme. He couldn't help but suspect that this revelation might be the very reason Tina had fled her home upon learning of the impending engagement. A deep sense of determination etched itself onto Wayne's face. He had made up his mind to take matters into his own hands and ensure the dissolution of Fernando's engagement with Tina. The following day arrived with an air of anticipation and curiosity as the group, now comprising Wayne, Sophie, Henry, Kijan, and their gracious host Leah, gathered to receive the results of the written test. Leah beamed with positivity as she congratulated all of them on their performance in the examination. She returned their answer sheets, her words carrying an undercurrent of pride and encouragement. Leah began by acknowledging the achievements of each student. Henry's face lit up with a mix of relief and elation as Lee announced that he had achieved a perfect score on the test. Sophie, on the other hand, struggled to process the fact that she had only made two mistakes. A sense of disbelief enveloped her as she contemplated the near-flawless result. Cajun, however, had a different experience. Her paper bore more mistakes than she had hoped for, a reality that Lee didn't shy away from addressing. Still, Lee's supportive tone reassured Cajun that her efforts had not gone to waste. Wayne, ever the mentor, seized the moment to encourage Kijin, suggesting that she should invest more time in deepening her understanding of magic. Kijin's response was resolute, echoing her determination to strive for improvement. Leah, satisfied with the interactions, delivered her verdict, assigning Wayne, Sophie, Henry, and Kijin to Class A for their practical training. She deemed it appropriate to recognize Kijin's contributions to resolving the explosion accident, despite her lower score. The dynamics of their education began to take shape, with Wayne stepping into his role as a temporary lecturer. He would oversee Class E, a group known for their underwhelming magical capabilities and questionable conduct. The idea of having a peer as their instructor did not sit well with them. Wayne sensed the undercurrent of disapproval among his students, who were all of the same age as him. In stark contrast, their counterparts in Class A, a cater of accomplished and academically exceptional students, welcomed their mentors with open arms. Among their ranks, a familiar face appeared, none other than Tina. Her presence took Sophie by surprise, and a sense of intrigue and concern welled up within her. As Wayne contemplated his new role as a temporary lecturer, he couldn't help but feel that the situation was far more intricate than it appeared. He sensed that the students in his class had a reservoir of spiritual power, surpassing conventional mana, a promising sign that they could excel in the art of onyujutsu. Though their power did not intimidate Wayne, he was convinced that under his guidance they could evolve into formidable practitioners. The initial interaction in Class E was marked by a student named Darius. Approaching Wayne with an air of casual familiarity, he inquired if they could engage in informal conversation due to their shared age. 
Wayne, maintaining his cool and collected demeanor, delivered a subtle but pointed response. He acknowledged their shared age but emphasized the distinction in their statuses. Darius, however, responded with a touch of mockery. He claimed to have heard of Wayne's heroic feat in saving a nation from a colossal dragon, challenging Wayne to demonstrate his true strength. The idea appealed to Wayne, who saw it as an opportunity to showcase what he would be teaching the students. The two groups ventured to the Krunal Magic Academy training ground, where Wayne and Darius squared off. Darius, eager to witness the potency of Wayne's Anyu Jutsu, inquired about his plans to demonstrate it. Wayne, radiating confidence, assured Darius that he would not engage in anything that could harm him. Instead, he welcomed Darius to launch attacks at full strength while Wayne focused on defense. Darius enthusiastically accepted this challenge, wasting no time. The match began with Darius charging headlong at Wayne. The young instructor effortlessly created a protective shield before him, a manifestation of Anyu Jutsu. To the amazement of those watching, Wayne clarified that this was not a display of traditional magic, but a manifestation of the mysterious art of Anyu Jutsu. Darius, while impressed, couldn't help but express his view that all magic users were the same. Wayne remained unfazed and decided to add an element of swordsmanship to the bout. He drew his spirit sword, much to Darius' astonishment, as he had earlier promised not to engage in any action that could harm him. Intrigued by the shift in tactics, Darius watched Wayne closely as their duel continued. Wayne was aware of Darius' proficiency with a sword, which allowed him to utilize a small amount of mana to enhance his physical prowess. Darius's unique blend of limited mana and abundant spiritual power set him apart from other students. Wayne believed that Darius had the potential to excel in Anyu Jutsu, which would be a more suitable path for him than conventional magic. As the duel unfolded, Darius, despite his skill, found himself unable to move Wayne's sword even an inch. He began to acknowledge Wayne's unparalleled combat prowess as the young instructor handled him with ease. However, Darius was not one to back down. He summoned a green aura around him, signaling a change in his approach. Wayne, now in defensive stance, carefully blocked Darius's attacks. What impressed him most was Darius's ability to convert his spiritual power into mana, a feat Wayne hadn't anticipated. Darius's newfound strength manifested as he launched a ferocious attack, but Wayne, with finesse, intercepted it. In the heat of the moment, Darius lost his grip on his sword, but he refused to concede defeat and attempted to strike Wayne with his fist. Wayne, however, effortlessly caught Darius a punch. In his composed manner, Wayne declared the match over, prompting Darius's confusion. Wayne explained that he admired Darius's fighting spirit and identified a familiar quality in him. His final piece of advice was a warning against using the potentially dangerous closing technique Darius had employed. Wayne then extended an offer, suggesting that he could teach Darius the art of Anyu Jutsu, an opportunity that could enable Darius to unlock his full potential and become even stronger. In the unfolding narrative, the story picks up with Wayne effortlessly overcoming a student named Darius in a surprising display of his exceptional skills. The other students in the class are left stunned, their disbelief evident as Wayne swiftly dispatches his opponent. Darius, clearly defeated, confronts Wayne with a sense of frustration, expressing his lack of interest in adopting Wayne's peculiar techniques. Unfazed by Darius's resistance, Wayne calmly informs him that he foresaw such reluctance. Wayne asserts that he won't permit Darius to disrupt the flow of his lessons, firmly establishing his authority in the classroom. Despite Darius reluctantly agreeing not to interfere again, he can't help but view Wayne as a troublesome figure. Shifting scenes, we find ourselves in Kijin's classroom, where Tina is overjoyed to discover that Wayne has joined Krunal alongside Kijin. Kijin, the bearer of this news, discloses that Wayne has taken on the role of a temporary lecturer. Tina, excited at the prospect of attending Wayne's lectures, shares her enthusiasm with Kijin. However, Kijin, ever the realist, warns Tina that seeking Wayne's help to break off her engagement might pose a challenge. Undeterred, Tina reassures Kijin, emphasizing her sheer joy at being reunited with him. The scene takes an unexpected turn as Sophie enters the room, her curiosity piqued by the evident camaraderie between Kijin and Tina. She inquires about their relationship, prompting Kijin to explain that Tina had visited the Granado territory before, and he had taken good care of her during her stay. Tina corroborates the account, expressing gratitude toward Kijin, and inquires about the well-being of Tenkyu after a recent attack. Kijin, with a confident demeanor, assures Tina that Tenkyu is far from easily harmed by trivial matters, adding an air of mystery to the character. As the conversation unfolds, Tina shares a light-hearted incident involving Tenku, 
recounting how he was sent flying during the attack. The revelation elicits a mix of curiosity and amusement from those present in the room, including Henry, who can't help but be intrigued by the intriguing tale. Tina, embracing the levity of the moment, laughs off the incident, acknowledging that it was a bit intimidating but ultimately amusing. Leah, the president of the student council, interjects at this point, announcing that it's time for lunch and suggesting that they all head to the cafeteria together. It becomes apparent that Lee is in charge of guiding the exchange students, a role she seems to enjoy despite its responsibilities. Tina, ever perceptive, notes Leah's dual role as both a guide and a friend to Wayne. This realization prompts Tina to jest about their connection to Wayne, underscoring their friendship with him. Sophie, still intrigued by the unfolding dynamics, seizes the opportunity to inquire about Tina and Wayne's relationship. Tina, in a candid manner, recounts how Wayne had come to her rescue during a challenging situation, an act that led her to propose marriage to him. However, the twist in the tale lies in Wayne's refusal of Tina's proposal. Sophie's surprise is palpable as Tina casually weaves her story into the conversation. Henry, in a reflective moment, admires Tina's assertiveness, recognizing a strength that seems to define her character. Tina, with a touch of lightheartedness, attributes her boldness to the nature of maidens in love, injecting a sense of humor into the exchange. Leah, the pragmatic student council president, interjects at this point, suggesting they wrap up the conversation and head to the cafeteria together. As the group makes their way to the cafeteria, Tina serendipitously encounters Wayne. Wayne, ever perceptive, notes that Tina is in the same class as Kijin and the others. Tina, undeterred and exuding confidence, proudly affirms that, of course, she's in the same class, considering herself nothing short of a genius. Wayne, amused by Tina's self-assured nature, can't help but appreciate the boldness she brings to the table. Upon Leah's guidance, the group settles around a table where they are introduced to Krunel's culinary masterpiece, the fork roast. Excitement permeates the air as the group eagerly anticipates savoring this renowned dish. As the first bites are taken, a unanimous consensus emerges, fork roast is an exquisite delight. Wayne and Henry, known for their discerning palates, express genuine appreciation, further solidifying the dish's reputation. Sophie, seizing the moment, takes a brief pause to extol the uniqueness of Krunel's magical cooking. She explains that the exceptional taste is a result of special techniques mastered only by professionals. Leah, adding weight to Sophie's words, encourages everyone to relish the culinary experience while in Krunel, emphasizing that these dishes are a rare treat not easily replicated elsewhere. Transitioning from gastronomic delights to magical studies, Wayne turns his attention to Sophie, inquiring about her day of learning. Sophie shares that the morning was dedicated to delving into modern magic, emphasizing a notable difference from Hall Sarah, where spells are regimented by ranks. Tana, ever the engaging conversationalist, adds her own perspective, recalling her surprise when she first attended Al Sarah. In this shared experience, Tina and Sophie find common ground, bridging the gap between their magical education. Henry, ever curious about the magical curriculum, expresses anticipation for the afternoon's class on ancient magic. This seemingly innocent curiosity piques Wayne's interest, evoking memories of Gerard's use of the same magic. The mention of ancient magic sets a subtle tone of intrigue and foreshadows potential developments in the narrative. Leah, sensing an opportune moment to provide crucial information, begins to unveil the complexities of ancient magic. She reveals that, unfortunately, the allure of ancient magic comes with a hefty price. It is inherently dangerous. This revelation draws surprise from Henry, prompting Leah to share a personal connection to the risks involved. Her father, in pursuit of unraveling the secrets of ancient magic, tragically lost his life. Despite the personal sacrifice, Krunel proudly carries the moniker of the great magic country due to its mastery of ancient magic. Lee's disclosure adds a sobering layer to the conversation, underscoring the profound risks and uncertainties embedded in the world of magic at Krunel. As the group absorbs the weight of Lee's revelation, the atmosphere momentarily shifts from the lively banter to a more contemplative mood. Henry pieces together the puzzle, turning to Leah with a revelation. He suspects that the accident from the previous day was a result of ancient magic. Tina confirms his suspicion, sharing that such incidents have become a troubling trend. Both Lee and Tina have redirected their research efforts toward modern magic in response to the unpredictable nature of ancient magic. Leah, sensing a shift in the mood of the group, apologizes for potentially dampening the atmosphere. She explains that, observing Henry's apparent interest in ancient magic, she believed it essential for him to understand the inherent risks involved. 
Wayne, absorbing this information, begins to recognize that the challenges facing the country may run deeper than he initially thought, hinting at a potential struggle against the enigmatic forces of ancient magic. The narrative then takes a dramatic turn, transporting us to Krunel's National Magic Research Center. Gerard and Fernando, two central figures in the unfolding mystery, open a secured door, proceeding through yet another layer of security. Gerard places his hand on the door, granting access to a room bathed in an eerie red light. Inside, a plethora of large tubes reveals prototypes of unknown creations. Fernando, fueled by curiosity and excitement, touches one of the tubes, revealing that they can now see a glimpse of the faces within. Fernando shares his ambitious vision with Gerard. He imagines a future where over a hundred clones, each as potent as Gerard himself, stand ready to execute Fernando's commands. His excitement is palpable, and he envisions the dominance that this unprecedented power could afford him. Gerard, acknowledging Fernando's aspirations, concedes that once these clones are complete, the country will fall under Fernando's control. However, Fernando, with a conviction that borders on authority, rejects the idea of being a mere conqueror. Instead, he envisions himself as a ruler, emphasizing the importance of maintaining order while exercising power. Gerard, recognizing the wisdom in Fernando's perspective, humbly apologizes and aligns himself with Fernando's vision. Yet Fernando adds a twist to the agreement. While Gerard's initial statement holds partial truth, the ultimate ruler of Krunel, according to Fernando, will be none other than Fernando himself. The scene shifts outside offering a glimpse into Tenku's reaction. He is visibly surprised by the unfolding events, grappling with the gravity of Fernando's plans. To him, the situation seems unbelievable, raising concerns about the potential consequences for Krunel. Tenku, recognizing the urgency of the situation, resolves to inform Wayne about this unsettling development as soon as possible. As the scene transitions to the outdoors, Wayne engages Henry in a conversation about the recent ancient magic lesson. Henry, despite a twinge of guilt lingering from Leah's cautionary words, shares his genuine excitement about the subject. To him, ancient magic holds a unique allure with its liberating mindset and seemingly vast potential for development, especially when compared to the more rigid structures of modern magic. Henry emphasizes that, despite only being a recent addition to the curriculum, with a mere 20 years of research, the promise he sees in ancient magic justifies its inclusion. Sophie, ever the cautious friend, expresses her concerns to Henry. She urges him not to venture into any reckless experimentation that might lead to accidents or unforeseen consequences. Henry, with a reassuring smile, assures her that he harbors no intention of delving into ancient magic experiments. His interest lies purely in the fascination of understanding the intricacies of this mysterious field. Sophie, trusting Henry's judgment, nods in acceptance. Amused by the exchange, Wayne chuckles and playfully comments that Henry's unwavering enthusiasm is a trademark characteristic. Shifting gears, Sophie redirects the conversation to Wayne's role as a temporary lecturer. Wayne, still adjusting to the peculiarity of the situation, shares his happiness at having the opportunity to showcase the wonders of Anyu Jutsu. However, he notes with mild surprise that only a handful of his students seem interested in this ancient art. Reflecting on the reality that the majority of students at a magic academy naturally gravitate towards magic itself, Wayne decides to bridge the gap. Wayne plans to demonstrate how magic incorporates practical elements of Anyu Jutsu, aiming to enlighten his students about the shared aspects of these magical disciplines. The intention is not only to showcase the richness of Anyu Jutsu, but also to foster a deeper appreciation for its practical applications within the broader realm of magic. Henry, resonating with Wayne's idea, expresses his approval. Drawing from personal experience, he attests to the significant improvement in his own magic skills after benefiting from Wayne's teachings. Sophie, equally intrigued, joins the conversation, expressing her eagerness to attend such a lesson herself. Her enthusiasm adds a touch of warmth to the discussion. Wayne, touched by the support from Henry and Sophie, expresses his gratitude. The encouragement fuels his sense of purpose as he prepares to merge the worlds of Anyu Jutsu and magic in his teaching approach. Sophie, however, brings up a poignant observation. It seems Wayne's students haven't fully embraced him yet. Wayne, with a hint of defensiveness, asserts that he showcased his abilities by surpassing the top student in their class. He believes that his students should have acknowledged his prowess based on this demonstration of skill. Sophie, displaying evident skepticism, directs her inquiry at Wayne, seeking an explanation for the peculiar situation. Henry, jumping into the conversation, remarks on Wayne's seemingly perpetual involvement in unusual circumstances. Wayne, in his characteristic nonchalant manner, 
defends the individuals at the center of the intrigue. Insisting that they aren't necessarily bad, he admits to a strange inability to harbor any resentment toward them. The scene then shifts to Kijin, who discreetly observes the girl surveilling Tina. From her hidden vantage point, Kijin discerns that the girl is engaged in a clandestine meeting. The narrative smoothly transitions to this covert rendezvous, where a girl questions the man about the purpose of their meeting. The man, revealing his intent, expresses a desire to gather information about the recent addition to their class, the temporary lecturer. Sensing that Wayne might be the focus of this secretive discussion, Kijin's instincts prove insightful. Darius, a participant in the meeting, shares his perspective on Wayne's unconventional teaching methods. He recounts Wayne's introduction of Anyu Jutsu, a peculiar technique that has failed to capture the interest of most students. Darius conveys that few are willing to entertain Wayne's unconventional ideas. The girl, displaying a depth of knowledge, casually mentions Darius's recent defeat at the hands of Wayne. Darius, taken aback, questions the source of her information. The girl, exuding confidence, reveals the extent of her information network, portraying herself as a well-connected figure within the academy. Acknowledging his frustration over the defeat, Darius, with determination, asserts his unwillingness to delve into Anyu Jutsu. He remains steadfast in his pursuit of becoming the strongest mage through mastery of modern magic. The girl, undeterred by his resolve, suggests an alternative path, exploring ancient magic. Darius, dismissive of the idea, emphasizes his inability to use ancient magic, citing the prerequisite of mastering modern magic first. The girl, with a knowing smile, challenges this conventional notion, hinting at the possibility of an unconventional route. She suggests that with the right connection, Darius could potentially unlock magical abilities he previously deemed inaccessible. Her enigmatic statement extends beyond the realm of modern magic, encompassing the mysteries of ancient magic as well. Intrigued Darius, though initially skeptical, expresses interest in exploring this suspicious yet alluring proposition. Darius, intrigued by the prospect of making the mysterious guy use ancient magic, asks the girl to introduce him. The girl, unfazed, agrees and instructs Darius to follow her. Observing this interaction, Kijin senses a connection to the same ancient magic and decides to tail them discreetly. As they leave the academy grounds, Kijin deduces that their destination is beyond school premises. Following them closely, Kijin notices that they arrive at the Vandert mansion. The girl's mention of a person confirms Kijin's suspicion that they are referring to Gerard. As Kijin contemplates this revelation, a massive red sphere materializes behind her. To her surprise, Gerard, seemingly perceptive to her invisibility, appears and identifies her as someone affiliated with Wayne Granato. He questions her presence at the mansion, demanding an explanation. Kijin, quick on her feet, informs Gerard that she overheard a suspicious conversation between two individuals and followed them to the mansion. Gerard probes further, asking what was particularly suspicious about the students. Kijin reveals that these students, despite their inability to use modern magic, possess the ability to wield ancient magic, a revelation that catches Gerard's attention. In response, Gerard, not one to entertain loose ends, decides to silence Kijin. He launches an attack, but Kijin skillfully evades it. Undeterred, she confronts Gerard with a steely resolve, acknowledging that the situation has escalated to a point where retaliation is inevitable. With a serious expression, she vows to make Gerard pay for his actions against Tenku. Kijin, determined to retaliate, draws her sword and attacks Gerard. However, Gerard effortlessly blocks her strike with his hand, taunting her about the capabilities of Wayne Granado's subordinate. Unfazed, Kijin remains confident, urging Gerard not to underestimate her based on a single block strike. To Gerard's surprise, Kijin astutely severs Gerard's mana, disrupting the magical energy surrounding him. Confident in her recovered spiritual power, which matches that of her previous life as Wayne's ally, Kijin believes victory in this duel is assured. As she strikes at Gerard, he unexpectedly appears behind her. Gerard attempts to restrain Kijin, but she skillfully employs her moment return spell, swiftly evading his grasp. Gerard, bewildered by her evasion, questions how Kijin managed to dodge his attack. Kijin attributes her success to sheer speed. In response, Gerard decides to test her speed by unleashing a beam of mana. Unfazed, Kijin dismisses the feeble attack, confidently asserting that such weak maneuvers won't affect her. As Gerard intensifies his assault with a mana beam, Kijin adeptly dodges each strike. However, Gerard surprises her by appearing in front of her while she's momentarily unguarded. To Gerard's amazement, Kijin managed to counter his attack. 
He starts to wonder if she can somehow anticipate his moves. Perhaps she can see the future or manipulate time. Regardless, he realizes he needs to put a halt to this. Gerard resorts to using his time lock spell, attempting to freeze the moment. However, in a surprising turn, Kijin simultaneously strikes back. As she attempts to block Gerard's attack, to her astonishment, Gerard's strike lands, forcing her to take a knee. Gerard, triumphant, approaches Kijin, expressing certainty in his victory. Employing his shadowbind spell, he ensnares Kijin with mana ropes, restricting her movements. Kijin thinks that she needs to tell this to Wayne, but before she could do anything, Gerard comes to her and uses a spell named Contract Break and puts Kijin to sleep. Afterward, she regains consciousness in a dimly lit room, grappling with the disbelief of having lost to a human and being captured. Attempting to establish a telepathic connection with Wayne proves futile, leaving her with no option but to wait for Wayne to summon her again. In her solitude, she hears someone on the other side of a nearby curtain and investigates, discovering it's Gerard. The narrative then shifts to Gerard's conversation with Darius. Gerard reveals his presence as someone driven by a desire for power. Darius, intrigued, listens as Gerard describes his ability to grant him access to ancient magic. Gerard commends Darius for his intense training, expressing willingness to assist someone who has dedicated themselves as much as Darius has. Eager to acquire new magical abilities, Darius urges Gerard to proceed. Gerard considers Darius and believes that, in comparison to Kate, this individual might be capable of hosting an even more powerful demon. Following this realization, Gerard employs his demon control spell on Darius. As Gerard enacted his demon control spell on Darius, a crimson aura enveloped Darius's form, leaving him bewildered by the sudden surge of power coursing through him. With furrowed brows, Darius glanced around, struggling to comprehend the unfolding transformation. Stepping forward, Gerard explained to Darius the newfound strength pulsating within him, emphasizing how much more potent he now appeared. Meanwhile, the young woman who had escorted Darius to Gerard's abode watched in astonishment, her own encounter with ancient magic paling in comparison to Darius's dramatic reaction. Unbeknownst to them, Kijin observed from behind a concealed curtain, her thoughts spiraling into concern as she realized the potential consequences of Darius absorbing such otherworldly energies. Yet, amidst the apprehension, Darius reveled in the overwhelming sensations coursing through him, likening it to a torrent of power surging unchecked. As Darius's eyes shimmered with a newfound hue, the young woman gasped in surprise, prompting Gerard to reassure her that Darius merely needed time to master his burgeoning abilities. Determinately, Darius pledged to Gerard his commitment to mastering this newfound power, envisioning himself as an unstoppable force once he gained full control. Encouraged by Darius's resolve, Gerard nodded approvingly, expressing his high expectations for Darius as a wielder of ancient magic. Just then, Fernando's arrival interrupted their conversation. As the girl's surprise registered at Lord Fernando's unexpected presence, Fernando's keen gaze locked onto Darius, swiftly discerning Gerard's current endeavor to harness yet another ancient magic user. With a decisive tone, Fernando instructed the students to vacate the room, signaling an urgent need for a private discussion with Gerard. Responding to Fernando's directive, the girl swiftly ushered Gerard out of the room, leaving Fernando and Gerard alone. With the students now absent, Fernando wasted no time in probing Gerard about whether he had apprehended one of Wayne Granado's underlings. Gerard, with a flick of his hand, drew back the curtain, revealing the girl as indeed belonging to Wayne's faction. Seizing the moment, Kijin interjected, pressing Gerard for an explanation regarding his actions towards the student. Unperturbed, Gerard calmly asserted that he had merely granted the student's deepest desire, the ability to wield ancient magic. However, Kijin countered, warning Gerard of the perilous fate awaiting the student, foretelling the destructive consequences of the power bestowed upon them. Undeterred, Gerard affirmed that everything was a calculated component of his grand design. Intrigued by Kijin's resilience, Fernando acknowledged the strength of her will, proposing that Gerard cooperate with their plan to ensure Kijin's allegiance. Yet, Kijin remained resolute, affirming her unwavering loyalty to Wayne alone. Gerard's words hung in the air, emphasizing Kijin's suitability for the task at hand. With a calculated gesture, Gerard unleashed his mental domination spell, ensnaring Kijin within their control. 
Under Fernando's command, Kijin was ordered to resume her guise as one of Wayne's devoted followers, all the while clandestinely feeding information to Fernando about Wayne's activities. Reluctantly, Kijin acquiesced to Fernando's directive. The scene shifted to Wayne's inner sanctum, where Kijin announced her belated arrival. Wayne, nonchalant yet subtly reproachful, remarked on Kijin's tardiness. Promptly, Kijin tendered her apologies, absorbing Wayne's lenient response as she explained the delay. Wayne, preoccupied with Tinka's report, assured Kijin that her lateness was inconsequential. However, Tenku recounted witnessing an unsettling display. Multiple clones of Gerard, hinting at Fernando's clandestine machinations aimed at seizing power. Kijin's astonishment mirrored Wayne's own concern, prompting Tenku to elaborate on the ominous developments unfolding within their midst. Wayne's measured response resonated through the room as he expressed his desire to observe the unfolding events before taking decisive action, yet the existence of Gerard's clones couldn't be dismissed lightly. Meanwhile, the narrative transitioned to Fernando's office, where Kijin transmitted his report telepathically to Fernando, detailing Wayne's cautious stance. Upon receiving this intel, Fernando's mind churned with anticipation, sensing that Wayne was on the brink of making his move. However, Fernando harbored no intentions of allowing Wayne to impede his own ambitions. The scene shifts to the grandeur of Crunil Castle's ceremonial chamber, where a resplendent purple-haired girl graciously extends her gratitude to the esteemed guests gathered for the magic ceremony. This magical conference serves as a pivotal convergence of the most influential figures from across Crunil, convened to deliberate upon matters concerning the realm of magic. With eloquence, the purple-haired girl declares that the primary focus of today's discourse is centered on the imperative need for education reform within magical academia. As anticipation mounts, the Minister of Magic, Lord Raymond, steps forth to address the assembly. Meanwhile, outside the regal confines of the castle, Tina and Leah find themselves seated on a tranquil bench, contemplating the imminent commencement of the conference. Tina, burdened by the weight of her father's pivotal role in shaping the future, expresses her apprehensions to Leah. Despite Leah's concerns about the potential consequences of Tina's father's decisions on humanity's fate, Tina resigns herself to the inevitable, acknowledging her own powerlessness in altering the course of events. Suddenly, an oppressive aura envelopes them both, signaling imminent danger. As tension mounts, a monstrous serpent, known as SP, emerges menacingly from beneath the Earth's surface. Tina, taken aback by the enormity of the threat, finds reassurance in Leah's steadfast resolve as they brace themselves to confront the formidable ASP together. Leah channeled her fire magic, the burning wind, directing a fierce blaze towards the ASP. However, their astonishment mounted as the monstrous serpent displayed an unexpected resilience against Leah's fiery assault. With a menacing lunge, the ASP aimed its attack towards Leah, who narrowly evaded the strike. Perplexed by the creature's resistance to fire, Leah voiced her confusion. Tina, observing the unfolding confrontation, discerned the uniqueness of the situation. She noted the asp's unusually high magical resistance, explaining the unexpected challenge they faced. Just then, Darius arrived on the scene, his presence heralding a swift resolution to the conflict. With a single decisive strike, Darius dispatched the formidable ASP, leaving Tina and Leah in awe of his newfound strength. Leah, eager for answers, queried Darius about the source of his newfound power. However, Darius remained cryptic, hinting at a transformation that had imbued him with strength surpassing both Tina and Leah. As the group processed the encounter, Wayne made his entrance, drawn by the presence of the monster. Darius, with a hint of playful banter, teased Wayne for his tardiness, proudly declaring his swift resolution of the threat. Wayne's curiosity piqued, he turned to Darius, probing for an explanation regarding the source of his newfound power. Darius, however, remained tight-lipped, steadfast in his resolve not to divulge the origins of his strength. He asserted that his newfound abilities had blossomed independently of Wayne's esteemed Anmu Jutsu. Wayne's realization dawned as he connected the dots. It was Darius whose presence he had sensed, a revelation that seemed to elude Darius's understanding. Perplexed, Darius questioned Wayne's cryptic remarks. Wayne, 
undeterred, pressed Darius for clarity regarding the source of his enhanced abilities. In response, Darius issued a challenge, declaring that if Wayne desired answers, he would have to earn them through combat. Echoing the rules of their previous sparring matches in Wayne's class, Darius set the terms for their exchange. Meanwhile, the scene shifted back to the grandeur of the Magic Conference, where Lord Raymond proposed a controversial measure, the discontinuation of modern magic education. His suggestion elicited a ripple of reactions among the gathered members. One attendee voiced concern, acknowledging the significance of modern magic and its pivotal role in the practices of many crunel mages. Undeterred, Lord Raymond elaborated on his proposal, attributing the recent decline in mana to the excessive reliance on modern magical practices. However, Lord Raymond addressed the assembly, proposing a strategic shift back to ancient magic as a solution to the dwindling mana reserves. He argued that by re-embracing ancient magic, the longevity of mana's utility could be ensured for future generations. Acknowledging Raymond's perspective, other members of the conference expressed their understanding, but raised concerns about potential panic among mages. Raymond reassured them, suggesting a gradual implementation of the proposal to mitigate immediate chaos. He emphasized the importance of education and research into ancient magic to support mages in adapting to this paradigm shift. Among the attendees, Fernando voiced his agreement with Raymond's proposal, asserting the necessity of returning to ancient magic for Krunel's future prosperity. He pledged full support to Raymond's vision. Encouraged by Fernando's endorsement, the remaining members concurred, agreeing to champion the promotion of ancient magic. Grateful for the collective support, Raymond extended his thanks to the assembly. With unanimous agreement reached, the Magic Conference concluded on a note of determination and unity, marking the beginning of a new era for magical practices in Krunil. Fernando contemplated the implications of Lord Raymond's proposal, foreseeing a gradual phase out of modern magic in favor of ancient practices. Gerard expressed gratitude to Fernando for the comprehensive report, acknowledging the significance of the impending changes. With a calculated maneuver, Gerard cast his spell on Fernando, laying the groundwork for their next steps. As the magical energy enveloped Fernando, Gerard's mind raced with determination. The time had come to address the looming presence of Wayne Granado, signaling the beginning of a decisive confrontation. The scene transitions to the exterior, where Darius, brimming with confidence, confronts Wayne, sensing Wayne's reluctance to engage in combat. Wayne affirms his disinterest in confrontation, but Darius, undeterred, begins to channel his spell with determined resolve. Leah interjects, urging Darius to cease his unauthorized use of magic on Academy grounds, but Darius disregards her warning, unleashing his spell towards Wayne. However, Wayne effortlessly sidesteps Darius's attack, leaving Darius bewildered by his failure. Wayne admonishes Darius, emphasizing the futility of borrowed power. Ignoring Wayne's counsel, Darius attempts to amplify his abilities, only to undergo a startling transformation. Leah and Tina watch in shock as Darius's visage morphs into that of a demon. In a swift motion, Darius lunges at Wayne, intent on striking him from behind. Yet, with effortless precision, Wayne swiftly incapacitates Darius with a single blow, leaving Leah marveling at Wayne's prowess. Wayne then employs his purification spell, restoring Darius to his original form, bringing an end to the tense confrontation. Wayne's sharp intuition led him to uncover Gerard's nefarious involvement in the unfolding events. As a demonic entity emerged from Darius, Wayne swiftly drew his spirit sword, dispatching the creature with ease. Tina and Leah rushed to Wayne's side, expressing concern for his well-being. Assuring them of his safety, Wayne explained his knowledge of Gerard's machinations. Leah, still reeling from the encounter, questioned Wayne about the nature of the creature they had just faced. Wayne admitted uncertainty regarding its identity, but affirmed his conviction that Gerard was the mastermind behind the chaos. Tina, unsurprised by the revelation, Tina advised Wayne to watch out for Gerard, even though Gerard is said to be loyal to Fernando. Tina said she doesn't feel any loyalty from Gerard. Wayne reassured Tina, dismissing her concerns with a determined resolve. Suddenly, through a series of intricate magical circles, Colonel's elite mage unit arrived on the scene. 
Leah speculated that their presence might be related to the earlier encounter with the ASP, but the sheer number of mages present raised doubts about their true intentions. An officer from the elite unit approached Wayne, informing him of his arrest on suspicion of spying. Upon hearing the officer's accusation, Tina swiftly interjected, protesting that there must be some misunderstanding. The officer remained adamant, citing Wayne's alleged mistreatment of an academy student while posing as a temporary lecturer. Tina argued that Wayne had only acted in self-defense after Darius initiated the confrontation. Despite Tina's plea, the officer insisted that Wayne's arrest was unavoidable. Leah observed the situation unfolding, realizing the formidable challenge Wayne faced against the elite mage unit, all of whom were skilled in ancient magic. Undeterred, Wayne posed a question to the officer regarding the safety of the transfer students. Learning that they had been apprehended, Wayne swiftly enacted his teleportation spell, disappearing before the officer's eyes. In response, the officer issued a directive to locate Wayne. As Wayne contemplated the dire situation, he resolved to prioritize the rescue of Sophie and Henry, recognizing the urgency of their predicament amidst the escalating crisis.